the recording in progress. Having arrived. The Santa Cruz City Council is called to order, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins is absent. Bruner? Is absent. Uh, Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Present. I think she just stepped in the back for a second. She's here. Yeah, but she's not here for roll call. Um, and Mayor Keely? Here. A quorum having been established, uh, let me move to any disqualifications uh, that uh, that a member may have on any of the items. Seeing, hearing none, uh, we will move on. This is the opportunity for anyone who wishes to do so to comment on the closed session items we will be taking up. Those are items one, two, and three on our agenda today. Uh, if you wish to comment on those items, this would be the opportunity to do so. Is there anyone with us in chambers who wishes to make comments? Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, is there anyone online who wishes to make comments? No, there's not. Very good. The uh, City Council is going to adjourn to closed session. Uh, we will take up those three items that are noted on the Council's agenda. Uh, we will return following our closed session at approximately 1 o'clock. We now stand adjourned into closed session. Recording stopped. The hour of 11, excuse me, the hour of 1 o'clock having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council is back in session. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will move to oral communications. This is the opportunity for anyone to address the council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda for a period of time up to two minutes. Uh, we will alternate. Do we have anyone online? We will alternate back and forth. We will begin. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. Um, I won't be here to comment on number 23, which has to do with the city of Santa Cruz Water Company taking a, upwards of a $25 million loan from Wells Fargo. Can you guys already take up to a $127 million loan from uh, the Environmental Protection Agency Bank? So I was at the uh, county meeting earlier today, and there was something going on about uh, public health, emotional health, uh, me mental well-being in our school system, and it was an opportunity to address Mr. Ferris Sabah face-to-face -face for a minute. Um, the last time I addressed, well, I would have liked to have addressed, but I wasn't able to, was across the street about nine months ago, where there were about 90 people in the room. There were six or seven people speaking. At one point, if I had my eight pages of notes from that, I'd know who said it, but I just said, that's not accurate at all. And it was a really interesting experience. It was like I was looking at a scene from the film, that The Exorcist, when all 90 people turned around very unnaturally to stare at me. But when it came to make questions, uh, I wasn't able to ask questions. So what I directly said to Mr. Ferris Sabah, and I would love public comment even from him later, I had to go which was a group of parents got together about going after people's bonds four, three, two, one year ago, and nothing really happened. Because it's really unfortunate, because the amount of harm that I could go into great deal about that Mr. Ferris Sabah has done to the children in this county, which affects the city, is tremendous. So I didn't get a talk about AB, what, 1185, because I had to do something else. But there were two gentlemen, probably one of them is going to be the next person running for sheriff. And we had a very nice short conversation in the room and they thanked me for being there. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will, uh, do we have a person online? 
we'll, since we have some folks online, as we'll toggle back and forth. We'll take next person online, and then you'll be a person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Santa Cruz City Council meeting. Hi, uh, yes, this is Garrett. Hey, going back to last meeting's item on the sale of surplus Sky Park land, most everybody was taken off guard by the last minute disclosed change of taking the land sale proceeds from going into the public trust fund and instead going into the library mixed use project. I think I did correctly note the city needs stronger fiscal policies in general and as to the sometimes rated public trust fund and an asset sale of land, which is a non depreciable public asset, should be a special matter of well considered fiscal policy. This is because essentially surplus land is similar to gold bars held in a vault and should not be spent on limited special interests or transitory purposes, but its value preserved for the benefit of all. The mayor's comments describing the sale as the taking of one capital asset and transferring it into another does not really apply to the affordable housing library subcomponent unless the city owned the housing, which even then that would be full on socialism, which uh, isn't the case and shouldn't be. The question is, do you have a limit to how much subsidy is appropriate and what is that limit? Otherwise, it's full on socialism. The original affordable housing city subsidy comes from the enormous virtual land gift of the airspace above the library, which is and should be a sufficiently valuable subsidy to attract development. Details are sparse of what portion of tens of millions in other grants goes to that very woke developer but any of that, plus the virtual land, should already be generous enough to develop for subsidy. To top that off, by applying any proceeds of an actual land sale to the affordable housing component is effectively gifting public land itself on top of all the rest, including some of the public's new parking spaces. That approach is being a kind of corrupt windfall and a lousy deal making. I know that subsidized affordable housing itself only benefits the few. We even pay taxes. Uh, the library portion, by contrast, benefits the entire public as a valuable full community education, store of knowledge, collaborative space resource, and it will last long enough that that is a justified capital investment. So I would take another look at the policy restrictions on the use of land sale proceeds and the public trust fund. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Thank you. My name is Rob Darrow. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm here as the chair of Santa Cruz Pride. First, I want to thank all of you for your ongoing support of our Santa Cruz Pride Parade and Festival. Your Parks and Recreation Department is just incredible and has been very supportive over the last 50 years. Next year will be our 50th anniversary of Santa Cruz Pride. Second, I'd like to invite all of you to join us in the parade, which is June 2nd, um, coming up here. Our theme this year is Beacon of Pride. And we really believe that all the people of Santa Cruz and in the county are a beacon of pride for all of us and have been for many years. And then finally, I brought you some current buttons and stickers for our pride event. Hopefully you can join us um, this coming weekend in June. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another person online, Ms. Bush. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jane Prieto, and um, as a member of the National Community Action Board, as well as the county's uh, designated community action agency since um, 1965, CAP strives to eliminate poverty and create social change through advocacy and essential services. Um, annually, we provide support to over 12,000, mostly Latinx community individuals including indigenous language speakers. Our services include community building, emergency preparedness, response and recovery, employment services, and mentoring. <coughs> Homelessness prevention and intervention and immigration legal and advocacy services. All are rooted in the principles of equity and inclusion. Our services also guide, are guided by um, the community action plan which brings together the voices of hundreds of low-income community members, leaders, and service providers to gather data on local poverty needs and assets. We are proud to share CAP's 2023 impact that helps support greater equity and um, stability in community, including helping over 1,300 individuals avoid homelessness or rehousing, 
providing over 250 youth and adults with job readiness and placement assistance. Over 900 people with food assistance, financial assistance, over 4,000 um, immigrants impacted by winter storms and impacted over 6,000 people with legal immigration services, including DACA, citizenship services, to learn more about the Community Action Month activities. CAB, um, CAB in our upcoming 60th um, anniversary this year. And um, thank you so much for your support. Good afternoon. Welcome to council meeting. So here, I'm Kate Hinnenkamp. I'm also from the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, and we're here celebrating Community Action Month this month. As I think most of you know, CAP does now have a site in the city of Santa Cruz where we have the day worker center, we have rental assistance, we have, uh, we're continuing to do some storm assistance and case management, and then I'm the program director at the, the immigration project. And we have, in the last year, at 501 Soquel Avenue, we have served, let me find my number, uh, 142 residents of the city of Santa Cruz with professional confidential immigration legal services. And we're very excited about that. We continue to see those, those numbers grow. Um, I have a little success story to share with you. Uh, this is from one of our attorneys working at that site. She says, my client, a lawful permanent resident, is an illiterate uh, monolingual Spanish speaker. He has been trying to immigrate his wife and three children to this country since 2005. It has taken so long to finalize the process that his two older children have not been eligible to come for several years. His youngest will turn 21 in September, at which point he will also not be eligible to come. I've been helping them since November 2023. I learned today that my hard work has paid off and that the case of his, the wife and the youngest child is ready to be scheduled for an interview. Today, I sent a request to the agency in charge to schedule the case for interview before the youngest turns 21. I'm hopeful that they will do so. My client earns less than 100% of the federal poverty level and will benefit greatly from the presence of his family in this country. And this is just one of many Recording stories in like progress. this. And I uh, wanted to share with you that we are, as well, um, partnering with a lot of different institutions in the city, including Santa Cruz City Schools, Branza Forty Library, Santa Cruz Adult School for our citizenship services. And we're just really, really grateful to the city for your support and partnership. And please celebrate. Thank you so much for being here. Next person. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hi, my name is Jesse Sandman, and my comment is directed towards Mayor Fred Keeley. So about uh, six months ago, we came to you saying that um, the St. George residents were going to have our rent increased, and now we have six more months, and then it goes into effect. So I'm on Social Security, and I'm getting about... 1,182 a month. And so my rent is going to more than double, and there is absolutely no way that I can pay that. So I'm asking for your help in any way that you can to keep us from getting evicted. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hi. Uh, greetings, council. I'm sure you know my name. Um, I, uh, I had a thought, and I, you know, a lot of things I put forth in front of the council that I think are really, uh, you know, kind of gold standard, uh, you know, well-crafted ideas. Uh, you've done, you've instituted, and then, and then I got no credit, but, um, but welcome to my, my world. Um, I was thinking that it's possible to make Morrissey and Soquel and, uh, and Water a circular intersection. Why that would benefit the city. I talked about it uh, when you were talking about egress at... Um, uh, further up on Soquel, uh, towards uh, uh, towards uh, the harbor um, high area, that you know that direction, mm -hmm. um, and a circular intersection doesn't seem possible unless in the middle of the night you pace the intersection at its diagonal, and you, you know the exact diameter, which I do, <clears throat> and you know uh, the diameter of the other circular intersections that the city's put in. One thing it would benefit is the 
travel rate of all of the um, the motorists. And uh, another thing it would benefit is egress to the uh, grocery super uh, grocery stores. Uh, there's two there's two on the corner, and, um, and 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 so people coming out of that intersection would be going at a reasonable rate of speed. Okay, that's that's the beauty of those uh, what you've done over here at. Um, uh, at uh, Pacific and Pacific and Pacific, whatever, you know, you're getting down to Beach Street, et cetera, the two, the two. Um, okay, what else did I have? Oh, uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Okay, 30 minutes, 30 seconds. Keep recording. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing this. Uh, it's to honor um, Douglas Adams, the author. Uh, the law enforcement, uh, you know, one thing, I think that's great to honor the law enforcement. I know that's on the agenda and, you know, might get to speak to it later, but I just want to say that's awesome. And, um, you know, um, they're kind of stretching things when they say 10 law enforcement, I mean, four canines and, you know, some, some personnel died, like, in vehicles and stuff. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, do we have anyone online? Anyone else wish to address us under oral communication? Seeing and hearing none, we will move on to mayoral proclamations, I would like to recognize uh, Council Member Kantar Johnson for this presentation. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I have the honor of presenting the um, Public Works mayoral proclamation. So I will read portions of this and I'll invite uh, Mr. Nguyen to come up and receive it and say some words. So whereas the year 2024 marks the 64th annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association and is themed advancing quality of life for all, illustrating how public works professionals contribute to and enhance the quality of life in all of the communities that they proudly serve. And whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Santa Cruz. And whereas it is the public, excuse me, and whereas these infrastructure facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public work professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector, and who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas the City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department continues to be recognized as a regional leader in innovative and forward-thinking services and projects that include active transportation, infrastructure, wastewater treatment, refuse and solid waste, and energy efficiency and sustainability. Now, therefore, I, Shebra Kalantari Johnson, on behalf of our mayor, do hereby proclaim the week of May 19th to the 25th as National Public Works Week in the city of Santa Cruz and urge all citizens to join me and the representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees, and to recognize the substantial contributions that they make to protecting our national health and safety and advancing quality of life for all. And I just want to say a couple of words. I mean, you are why our city runs, literally. Um, it said it in here, but you know, we're able to walk on our sidewalks and drive our cars and ride our bikes because of the hard work that you do. And much of it, even though we experience it every day, goes unseen. So thank you so much for all your hard work. And if you wish to have... Mr. Nguyen, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, members of the public, Nathan Nguyen, Director of Public Works. I want to thank you for the proclamation and recognizing uh, my staff and the Department of Public Works. As uh, you can see behind me, many of the staff members who are able to attend uh, are also proud to work for the city. Uh, we are proud to be a full-service city. Uh, we offer refuse, wastewater, uh, street sweeping, fleet, uh, all those things that are behind the scenes that keep our city operating on a daily basis. Uh, I know that my team is very proud to serve the city and work for the city, so appreciate you recognizing our efforts. Uh, if members of my team would like to come up and take a photo while we're all here, it'd be a good time to do that.
go, 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 go. All of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing the uh, photo op while we're here at council. You can tell me exactly what was <laughs> If I may, one other thing I'd wanted to point out too is that National Public Works Week starts next week and we will be holding a public event uh, downtown right in front of the Civic. So next Wednesday from 12 to 2, we have a touch a truck event right in front of the Civic where members of the public are allowed to see our city fleet vehicles, sit in them, uh, touch them, uh, and as well as see a skills competition. We'll have a backhoe and forklift competition with members of the city. So please come out and enjoy and cheer them on. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you're also well behaved. This is your moment. You don't have to stay for any more. There you go. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> they were all sitting there so dutifully. I know. Get out of here while you can. <laughs> yeah. On items five. And six, uh, what we will do is we will proceed apace here, come back to those two items uh, when the students are out of school and can join us for these presentations. So what we will do at this point is move on to the consent agenda. I'm sorry, we'll move on to presiding officer announcements. Uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, offer the opportunity to the vice mayor to make an announcement. So I have a proclamation also for um, police officer um, Memorial Day on the 15th of May. And so I'm going to read parts of the proclamation. I don't know if you want to come, come down to receive it. We only have one officer here, so you're going to have to come on down. <laughs> so this one... Um, is the police officers of Santa Cruz have worked unselfishly and with commitment on behalf of the citizens of the people in this community, including intentionally de-escalating violent incidents in spite of personal harm or hazard to themselves. And whereas these officers have safeguarded the lives and property of all in Santa Cruz throughout the community, whereas the Santa Cruz police officers have consequently worked towards inclusivity and advancements in racial equity by purposefully seeking community engagement and updating policing. And whereas in 1962, President John F. Kennedy was authorized by Congress to proclaim May 15th of each year to be National Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of all peace officers who have been killed or disabled in the line of duty. I, Mayor Renee Golder, on behalf of Mayor Fred Keeley, um, proclaimed the week of May 12th to the 18th as National Police Week in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to observe the week with law enforcement officers past and present. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. We are on statements of disqualification. Any member have a disqualifying situation? Ms. Kalantari Johnson. May I say a few words on the presiding officer? Please, we'll go back. We're on presiding officer announcements, please. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity, Mayor. Um, you heard from the CAB members, and I just wanted to say a few more words since it's Community Action Month. And mm -hmm. I am a proud CABista, and um, <laughs> I serve on their, their board and have had the honor and privilege of working with the organization for the last couple of decades just as a community grant writer. Um, so you heard about the great work that they do. I just want to bring to light some of the real challenges in our community that they address mm -hmm. in their community assessment um, a uh, survey that they did, they found that 50% of those surveyed made less than 20000 a year last year, and that 20% of low-income respondents made less than 5000 mm. That's That's, you know, pretty intense and pretty low. Um, they found disparities among indigenous language speakers. Uh, they found that 88% of community members who reported mental health challenges also reported housing and, and food insecurity. Um, so it's not surprising that the top five community needs that came forward were employment income insecurity, COVID-related health issues, food insecurity, lack of information available um, about community programs and housing insecurity. So again, you heard about the great work that they do. Um, what, what has always drawn me to CAB as a community member and a public health advocate and, and now as a council member is their commitment to their core values of equity and inclusion. That is their guiding star and they do all their work with that in mind. So um, thank you to CAB. Thank you to all the hard work that you do in the community and for addressing some of these um, very real challenges. Thank you, council member. We are on <coughs> statement of disqualifications. Any member have a disqualification they need to announce at this point? Seeing here none additions and deletions to the agenda. Ms. Bush, additions? I do have one. Um, item 10, the California Energy Commission um, roadmap item will yes. is removed and will not be discussed. Has been, as I say, at the very last part again. I it won't be discussed. We're removing there, it? No, it's being removed. There's no need for council approval on that particular topic. Okay, thank you. Any other additions or deletions? Thank you. City Attorney report on closed session. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. Council uh, met this afternoon in closed session at noon in the courtyard conference room. There were three items uh, of closed session business uh, this afternoon. The first was a liability claim a conference with legal counsel concerning the claim of Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company. Uh, that item is also listed this afternoon on your consent agenda as item number 13. There were also uh, three real property negotiations matters, uh, properties owned by the city of Santa Cruz, uh, property at 49A Municipal Wharf. Uh, owner, um, or the negotiating parties are the city and Peter Drobak, DBA Mackay. Uh, 37 Municipal Wharf, um, Negotiating parties are the city and Charles Meyer, uh, DBA Gildas, and the property at 744 and 808 River Street, uh, city and um, Reed and Rusty Santee were the negotiating parties. Lastly, there was one item of discussion of a significant exposure to litigation. Uh, council received a report from the city attorney's office on that item, and there was no reportable action. Thank you, sir. Council meeting calendar. Ms. Bush, any item you'd like to draw to our attention? No updates, no. Very good. Thank you. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with it, we will be taking up items 8 through 19, inclusive on one vote. Uh, what I will do is give an opportunity for council members to either pull, comment, or raise a question on any one or more of those items. We will then give the opportunity to the public to make comment. You may make comment on any or all of these items, but you have one opportunity to do so. Let me start with council members. I will start on my left with council member Brunner. Council member Brunner on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question on item 15. Please proceed. Item 15 is a public works item, intersection improvements at Coral Street and Lime Kilm Street. 
Um, there was, hello, thank you. Um, there was an email this morning that I didn't see in order to ask ahead of time. So um, the email is from Granite Rock and they are requesting a postponement of the approval of this item until after a field test with public work staff has been conducted to ensure the intersection remains accessible for large industrial and commercial vehicles operated by Granite Rock and Harvey West business neighbors. Can you speak to that? Yeah, yes, happy to. Um, uh, Granite Rock submitted a, a letter to request postponing the approval of a three-way stop at the intersection of Coral and Lime Kiln. Um, we have since staff, myself, has reached out to Granite Rock Construction to inform them that there is plenty of time to work with them to make minor modifications to the proposed traffic calming improvements at that three-way stop intersection uh, prior to construction and is requesting that we still move forward with the approval of today's uh, item uh, while we still work with them on making those minor modifications. Thank you. I'm glad you connected with them. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Kalantari Johnson on the consent agenda. Madam Vice Mayor on the consent agenda. Council Member Watkins on the consent agenda. Council Member Brown on the consent agenda. Can't help myself. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to make a, a comment on item 11, and I'll, I'll just quickly follow up on item 15 um, to appreciate. So, so I'll start with 11. This is the uh, a proposal to um, submit an application for a uh, micro grid feasibility study uh, project for the city. And I, um, I just wanted to highlight it because this is an emerging technology. It's been emerging for a while now. And in our community and in our region, we have uh, invested a considerable amount of time and, and energy into uh, developing more sustainable um, energy sources and wanting to work on opportunities for um, distributed energy, being able to store and distribute energy when the grid is overloaded or there are issues um, for emergencies. And I've talked with countless uh, people, from representatives in the solar industry and others here in our community who really are ready to move forward with these kinds of projects. And so, and we have so many regulatory hurdles in California. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there. But I just wanted to appreciate that the city is making efforts to uh, develop programs so we can hit the ground running and we can make that, those energy sources available. Um, I was glad to see that uh, my district may be a site for, for this. Um, as, but I also think that there are lots of places in the city um, where we could um, really benefit from distributed energy. So just wanted to um, highlight that. We have these wonderful uh, items on our consent agenda, and they don't get a lot of attention. Um, this one, I think, is worth sharing with the, the public that um, we, are, we are moving forward. And I also just want to, on 15, thank you for working with this intersection. It, it is sorely in need of improvements, and I recognize the concerns that Granite Rock has and, and others, um, our emergency services as well, trying to get in and out of those very tight intersections with a lot going on, to say the least. Um, so I appreciate that you're willing to work with Granite at Rock and, um, and others in the neighborhood and and move forward with some some safety improvements there thank you thank you council member council member newsom on the consent agenda anyone with us who wishes to comment on an item on the consent agenda this would be the opportunity to do so good afternoon again sir yes thank you um three minutes on each one two minutes total that's what i recall so uh, number. I appreciate uh, your effort each week to. Try oh, to hey, you know what? <laughs> Everything. If, if you can't laugh, let's not. Uh, you should laugh more. So, um, what was it? Number nine, ten, and eleven. Ten has been pulled off. That's just fine. They all kind of connect together. Um, nine is award contract to local hazard mitigation. Um, number eleven has to do with incentives for Pacific Gas and Electric for these microgrid stuffs. Believe me, if I got my stuff done, I wouldn't be in Santa Cruz anymore. I, I 
And I figure my fabrication time for what I do is about $278 a second. How much is that an hour? I'm making progress. So as far as kind of, you know, I just, I really wanted to kind of talk on 10 because it's like what is actually going on with here? You know, people talk about different types of energies and stuff. There's not really much being produced that's mainstream that's not being rubber stamped and produced by China that's really sustainable. And I'm referring to solar apparatuses, um, and the lithium ion batteries, and the wind stuff, the amount of damage that that's doing, it's, it's exactly the opposite of sustainable. But it just seems like there's so many agendas that the carbon that's being reduced are human beings and all life, uh, not much else. Anyway, I got to get back to work. Nice to see all of you. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you for being here. Anyone else who's with us wish to comment on the consent agenda? Anyone online? Matters back before the body. A motion to approve would be in order. So moved. Council Member Watkins moves. Council Member Brunner Second. seconds. Approval of the consent agenda. For the debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are on item number 20. This is a consent agenda public hearing item. The item relates to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development Annual Action Report and Amendment to the Citizen Participation Plan. Let me ask uh, if there is uh, uh, any question or comment by members of the council. This is the public hearing opportunity. Anyone who is with us who wishes to comment on this item under the public hearing, this is your opportunity to do so on item 20. Does anyone online wish to make comments on this item? Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the body. A motion to approve would be in order. I'll move. Mr. Newsom moves. Madam Vice Mayor seconds. Approval of the item as submitted. Is there debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Carries aye. so ordered. Ms. Bush, did I miss the opportunity there for something? Were you going to comment? No, I was getting ready to take the roll call vote. Oh, okay. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, the, uh, let's go ahead and do the roll call vote. Um, no, I'm throwing it. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes, carries, and so ordered. We are on item 21. This is the City Council Cannabis Subcommittee Report on Safety Taxes and Separations from Other Uses. Uh, Council Member Gontar Johnson and myself, uh, Council Member uh, Watkins uh, was appointed, but given certain scheduling conflict, wasn't able to regularly participate. So the report will be without objection from Council Member Kalantar Johnson and myself. Council Member Kalantar Johnson, if you would like to open. Sure, thank you. Um, um, as we know, we have an item coming before us later this afternoon, and this um, had us uh, give us the opportunity to um, revisit our cannabis policies and ordinances um, uh, in its entirety. So we looked at a, a few different pieces and, and the mayor and I will toggle back and forth and, and touch on them, but I'll just give an overview of the, the different components that we looked at. We looked at taxation, we looked at licensee reporting, we looked at transfer of licenses, um, we looked at safety, which had four subcomponents to it, and um, we looked at separation requirements. So those were the various pieces. Um, you want me to kick it off with, with some of those components, Mayor? Or? Okay. So, um, so I'll, touch on, um, I'll touch on safety to begin with. So we, let me actually back up. Um, during this process, we worked with city staff. Um, we did some research. We looked at best practices. We looked at what other communities are doing. We also had the opportunity to um, meet with members of the cannabis industry, um, members of the education community, and members of um, the, the county prevention partners. 
Um, so that helped shape where we are right now with these recommendations. Uh, this report came out and we had more meetings. So there's, there's some more that the mayor and I may um, add to what we're recommending. And that's because we were able to dive in a little more after the report came out. So I'm going to touch on um, safety, which is broken up again to four components. Um, so one of the safety recommendations that we're making is that um, if a cannabis retail establishment is less than 1,000 feet from an educational institution um, that's providing instructions to K through 12, that we update our local code that would require the retail location to uh, prohibit selling products to anyone under the age of 21 years of age during school hours, including the hour immediately, uh, just before school starts and the hour um, after school ends. So that's one of the recommendations we're making. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to separation, but um, the Public Health Institute that uh, is, is, a, is a, you know, has a public health lens, has a project called Getting It Right from the Start. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a lot of recommendations in there, including um, best practice policies around buffers. They also have a scorecard for every community, and they have a scorecard for our community. So um, um, we did OK in comparison to other communities, but there are areas that we didn't do as great. So as, as part of this safety around youth access and availability, one other piece that the mayor and I would like to um, have this committee and the, and the staff and the council to consider is to dive in further around safeguards for youth. And I'll just give one example. We got a zero, I think it's out of five. We got a zero out of five on our local ordinance for policies that limit marketing to youth. So that's not good enough. So let's look at that and let's look at other areas that are specific to youth safeguards where we scored low, zero or low on um, and see what we can integrate into um, our ordinance. Um, closely related to this, the other component around safety is the use of fake IDs. Uh, we are rec recommending that um, in the cannabis industry record fake IDs, any attempts of fake IDs, and report that in a timely manner. Uh, when this comes back to council, we would like for there to be a little bit more specificity around what a timely manner means. So we can, we can determine that, maybe it's quarterly, um, and include disincentives if those, if those reports are not provi provided in a timely manner. The other thing that we need to look at here around fake IDs is um, just a comprehensive decoy operation with um, our Santa Cruz Police Department in partnership with, with county and CBO prevention partners. Um, we used to have a pretty robust decoy operation, so we'd like to see that again, again in partnership. There's grants out there that can help us with this. Um, uh, but not just cannabis, let's look at alcohol, let's look at tobacco, let's look at all substances that impact young people um, and create a comprehensive prevention plan that um, really prioritizes decoy sting operations. The other component of safety is psychohemp to, psychoactive hemp availability. This came to our attention as we were doing our research. Without getting into the weeds, no pun intended, <laughs> um, uh, the 2018 Farm Bill essentially made um, industrial hemp, hemp an agricultural commodity. Um, and so what that means is that there's psychoactive potent hemp available at your corner store that's in the form of candies and snacks and cereals and there's no regulation currently around that so the governor and some state legislators are working on this so we're recommending that um, our, we direct our mayor to write a letter in support of those efforts and that our city explore a local ordinance that provides regulations again the Public Health Institute has best practices and model ordinances that we can look at and and, and shape to fit our community so the fourth component under um, safety is warehouse and manufacturing uh, manufacturing safety issues. Um, this was, there's more, we didn't have enough time to dive into this, so there's a general direction to uh, further explore how we can increase safety around warehouses manufacturing. Want me to pause and you take one piece, or you want me to keep going, Mayor? Well, I'd be glad to do a couple of pieces. All right, let's do yeah. it. So with regard to taxation, let me, uh, actually I want to start at a different place. Um, I want to start with an apology to my colleagues and an apology to the community. It was completely unnecessary to get this work done to propose a moratorium. 
That was unnecessary. That's on me, 100% on me. The council did the right thing by not adopting that. And I want to thank you for that, but I want to apologize for creating a lot of kerfuffle uh, in front of that. Uh, the idea was to be able to have time to be able to look at these issues separate and apart from an issue we're going to take up tonight. So. Uh, the work of the subcommittee or the ad hoc committee has been able to get the critical amount of work we wanted to get done, done, and yet what we would like to do, what you'll hear us asking for is keep this together so we can continue looking at these issues and then bring back to you recommendations for specific actions in specific areas. With regard to taxation, uh, this is an issue that fits well into that model of looking at this, uh, spending a bit more time on this before we make a specific recommendation. We've kind of got two things going on. We've got uh, a revenue source which continues to go down. And the question is, uh, what is that? that? That's a result of what? The industry makes arguments that when you look at total business inputs, including taxes, that's getting them very close to the point in terms of their customers, where their customers are, in some cases, choosing other ways to acquire the product rather than the legal way to acquire the product. So how is it uh, that can be brought into balance so that our revenue source continues or turns around from the trend it's on now, which is a declining revenue source, to one which is either steady or actually increases over time. A couple of concepts. One is, if you reduce the rate, would that increase the volume? We want to examine that. We don't know the answer to that about what would happen if you do that. If you maintain the rate, is there a relationship between the rates of taxation, especially at the retail level, and declining sales? Is that a contributing factor? We don't know the answer to that yet. We're in conversations with the industry in consultation, in conversations with others. So we would like a bit more time to come back and answer that question. Because as a revenue source into the Children's Fund, we would like to be able to see that be a robust source. How do we accomplish that? So on taxation, uh, we would ask if we could continue to engage in conversations, discussions, and exploration on that question. I'll take the license transfer and then uh, give the, the uh, floor back to my colleague. The issue around licenses uh, it goes somewhat like this. The, city, the, the state created a marketplace. The city chose to further create a marketplace for legal uh, cannabis. In so doing, it created a license mechanism, which is very, very limited. There are only a handful, literally a handful of licenses. So we created a market and then limited entry into that market. Uh, you don't have to be the chair of the Federal Reserve to understand that when you do that, uh, the value of that license is going to go up. And so what we know over the course of the last couple of years as licenses have transferred, which is permittable under our ordinance, the price of that transferred license, the value of that transferred license is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it does seem to the subcommittee at this stage that it makes good sense to examine whether the city, as the creator of that market, with limited entry into that market, which causes the value of that license to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, if the city of Santa Cruz and the Children's Fund in particular should benefit from that by getting, in effect, some percentage of that increased value of those limited numbers of licenses. Uh, we think the answer to that is probably yes, but we need, as we have in these other areas, to continue to examine that to find where is that price point that makes sense? Where is that tax that we may or fee that we may charge? What does that look like and why? Rather than simply throwing a number out there and saying we'd like a piece of that what is the justification for that? 
what makes good sense. So again, this is an area where we would ask for your forbearance and ask you to give us continued ability to examine this issue. Ms. Kalantar Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so the next component that we looked at is um, separation requirements. That's a big one. Um, we did quite a bit of digging on this, looked at what other communities that are similar size are doing, um, what best practices show. So best practice, Public Health Institute, again, getting it right from the start, uh, recommends 1,000 feet from any schools or facilities that serve young people. Uh, the state's health and safety code prohibits smoking of cannabis within 1,000 feet of schools. That's a little separate, but again, part of, the, part of the research. Now, if we were to do that, we would have pretty much an outright prohibition, which we have already decided as a community we did not want to do. Um, so what we are proposing is to explore increasing the buffer from 600 feet to 800 feet, um, moratorium on existing uh, businesses, but moving forward, increasing that to 800 feet because that is what the best practice says. Um, and I should add that um, in our research, we did not find substantial data that showed in our local community sales to minors from a cannabis um, establishment. However, there is a lot of public health data that shows that there is a correlation and a connection between proximity and density and access availability and ultimately use. So, um, so this is, um, I think, you know, our, our middle ground of both following best practice in terms of youth safeguards as well as not having an outright prohibition in our community. If I might, on that point, uh, I suspect we will hear this again when we examine an, an individual case this evening. But as to the more general case, I, I want to thank the County of Santa Cruz folks who participate uh, in our conversation last week, uh, as well as the city schools, uh, I believe either deputy superintendent or assistant superintendent uh, who participated. Uh, they have provided us with additional information that's free to share with the council. Uh, when uh, a, uh, a slide survey research firm uh, repeatedly on an annual basis test the question of top ways that youth are told that they and their peers are most likely to get marijuana. The data is interesting on that, uh, but by a very large number, friends are the most frequent way uh, from parties, uh, from friends at home without the parents' knowledge growing it uh, from relatives uh, other than their parents and siblings uh, home without the knowledge of their parents. There's a long list of how youth access. Uh, one of the very infrequent ways is through dispensaries, uh, as it turns out. The reason we raise this is that as we look at this question of distances, uh, we want to make sure that we get that that right. Uh, that uh, the the distance issue is one uh, uh, which raises a lot of questions. You know, if if you're at 800 feet, is 801 feet uh, safer? Is 799 feet not safe enough? So when you establish one of these distance questions, it seems like it needs to have some basis in data and fact uh, with regard to if there is a dispensary or retail outlet, whatever distance it is, what is the evidence about the correlation between that and accessing for uh, people who are underage? And that's one we want to be very careful about. Ms. You, you just made me remember another, I think, piece of relevant data. Um, this is where things get complicated and murky because there is also data that shows that there is a decrease in perception of harm um, when there are alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. So we're talking about all substances now. Decrease in perception of harm when um, youth are exposed in proximity to establishments. So again, it's the 
another data point to add to the layer. Thank you. Uh, I am finished on my side. If you would like to complete on yours, then we'd be glad to take questions. We'll hear from the public and so on. There was one other piece. Uh, did, you, did you touch on this that I missed it, the licensing reporting? Mayor? No. Okay. Yeah, so there's one other piece is that um, we do have in our code uh, a requirement for um, cannabis businesses to do an annual, I believe it's an annual report mm -hmm. uh, to our planning department. Um, it, it seems that this hasn't been consistent, so um, we are making this explicit. And um, I'd like to further propose that we look at penalties or fines for annual reports that are not received within 30 days of whatever the deadline is for that establishment. So I'd like us to get a little bit more specific about that requirement. So let me first turn to the council, see if you have questions on the work that we've done so far. Ms. Watkins, certainly. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the work and time that you both put into this. I uh, wish I could have joined you, but it was at a time I could not make. Um, but I think you've got a great uh, foundation here for us to explore moving forward. I think um, Lee can remember from our days, trying to, and Sandy as well, or Councilmember Brown, trying to figure this all out. And it's definitely iterative. And we want to do better and continue to do better. So having this you know, deep dive and look into how we can continue to improve our policies is really important. And um, we've made different tweaks along the way, and so it's just sort of par for the course, if you will. One thing I would say is when thinking about the license component, I think having a set number of licenses available uh, does create an arbitrary kind of cap and market, uh, mm -hmm. similar to what you would see probably with the New York City taxi medallion, and sure. that it becomes just really inflated uh, commodity. And and when thinking about the transfer, I'm certainly interested in seeing how we can um, get a portion of those dollars when the transfer is appropriate, and when there are limited licenses available, it's hard for new entry for business. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what we did at a certain point is shift our policy so that we lose control over how we can get the licensing criteria of who is our ideal business operators into the market and instead create it so that it's more of a capitalism kind of approach with the highest bidder essentially getting the sale of that license, right, in many, in many circumstances. So I think just thinking about the license and the license transfer and the cap of licenses and what that means for potentially a minority or woman-owned business, right, if that isn't necessarily open to them. I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's something worth exploring further. Um, certainly, I'm supportive of the uh, transfer money going to the Children's Fund. We'll be having an item coming before the full council soon to see those dollars going right back out to kids, which is very exciting and unique to our community. Um, I think that's all I have at this point. I appreciate the comments made in terms of the data. I think yeah, we don't want to kind of keep our eye off the ball on that. And I, you know, I understand people get busy and things happen, but having those ongoing conversations and data summaries and analyses are important to know that we're following kind of a data approach. So thank you for your work. And if it works for me to continue to work with you guys, I will if I can. Thank, thank you so much. Further questions or comments? Ms. Brown. I do. Um, I have some questions and comments. Um, I first want to, um, and, and I, I'll, first, I'll start out by saying thank you for uh, the deep dive you're taking. A lot of these issues that came up in the report, the written report, and what you've shared really resonate with the conversations I've been having in the community with people uh, about the um, some of the limitations and, and challenges with our ordinance. And I, I have served on the um, committees over the years when we were establishing our policy and then also making some revisions. And certainly there are lessons learned there. I'll just echo um, really all of the comments of Council Member Watkins in that regard. Um, and I having, you know, I was, um, I was hoping to be on this committee, but that, um, that opportunity was foreclosed. So I'm wondering, um, in terms of giving you feedback, how that will happen. I'm, I'm now sending a lot of those folks, I'm saying, connect with the committee um, because I, I don't really have, um, I'm not having those conversations with staff that you are. So um, just wondering how, 
do you want do you want my thoughts now? Are we are we well, are I, you coming back or a, <laughs> what's I, the um what what's the process for kind of sharing well, with me, you all? Let me try to to do something here. Uh, one of the recommendations we hope you will adopt is to give us some portfolio going forward. Yeah. Given that when we meet and how we do this doesn't work now with Council Member Watkins' new job, new wonderful job that she has, um, I'm wondering if you might be interested in serving on the... I, I, if it will be helpful, I, I, my sense was that, that it was there was a preference for I me mean, to, to want, step back. Do you want to so I'll, um, I, I, I would like to. I mean, I've been having a lot of conversations. Let's I've been involved it. in this since 2017. No um, so, okay, well, then I'll, I'll sh save my questions and comments. But I do think that this is really the, okay. the right direction. Great. Good. Well, welcome. We'll be glad to have you uh, and your seven-plus years' experience on this issue on the council. Thank you. Uh, further questions or comments on this? Council Member yes. Brunner. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is, um, isn't this a public meeting, and so it would be an appropriate place to discuss this agenda item? Can I just respond quickly? Because my, my point was mo more about getting really into the weeds with feedback here. It didn't I feel, I, I think it's appropriate, but I just didn't want to, like, take over and start getting into the weeds with specifics here. Well, we, we did this work. We're now under the part where you can ask questions and participate. Our goal here is we will also hear from the public. Our goal is that uh, if it's uh, uh, to your liking, uh, we would ask that you allow us to continue this work, report back periodically. Uh, that's what we're hoping to do. Okay, so then at that, thank you. That answers that question, and then I have another question. Um, so for, I, ha I have a question for planning. Um, can you just briefly speak um, how the transfer of licenses for cannabis, what, um, the differences with alcohol licenses or similarities? Thanks for that question. Um, so the license transfer for cannabis is approved by the, there's a background check that's approved by the police and um, they, uh, then come through our department for um, that actual transfer. Um, the license transfer for a um, alcohol establishment goes, uh, there. there is a review through the police, but the planning department is not um, involved in that. And so um, police may have some additional comments related to that. But, um, you know, if, say, um, you know, a downtown bar or a, a grocery store that sells off sale of alcohol um, transfers um, ownership, then our department is not involved in that. And um, in with the cannabis license, we're largely a, a conduit for the um, uh, the confirmation that they've met the background for um, the police for the cannabis. Um, does anyone know if the city captures a percentage of alcohol license transfers? To my knowledge, alcohol licenses are not issued by the city. They're exclusively the issued by the State Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control, who I believe check with the police department, perhaps to do a background check on a, on a prospective licensee, but it's not something that administratively the city is involved in. Are there any license transfers the city captures on? Not that I'm aware of. Not to our knowledge, Councilmember Brunner. Councilmember Brown. Just, just to, I, I think, I hear your question, uh, Councilmember Brunner, and I think one of the reasons that this case is somewhat specific, not only because we are the issuer of the licenses, but because there is a cap, there were something much, the, the, the 
licensor, the license holder can really collect what in economic theory we call rents off of that, right? Whereas with some of the other ones, in addition to not having a, a city issued license, there isn't a cap in that way. So they're, they're not, they don't inflate, they don't have an inflated value. And I think that's why we're talking about it for this case. I just had no context of what what to compare that to. I do know like the ABC and alcohol licenses are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, so didn't know what role the city had in any of those. Um, and thank you for starting this work. And I appreciate um, the four categories that come from the original letter that was received from various cannabis uh, owners and operators. So thank you for looking into ways um, to work with the community, with the stakeholders, and look at ways that would um, potentially be an update. And um, um, you know, in, in looking at all the four categories and some of the information um, at um, I'm curious to hear from members of the public. I'm surprised there's not more people here. Um, but, um, you know, it, it seems like um, it would be good to have all of these changes at once rather than piecemealing um, updates on one part now and one part later. Um, I just think holistically looking at at it as a whole and figuring out the exploration of some of these items in process and um, you know making a decision for updates as a whole would be in everybody's benefit so um, thank you thank you for the questions or comments Madam Vice Mayor I just want to briefly say thank you for your work on this I know this is something that's been coming up over um, the past couple of years, we've met with uh, many members of the public mm -hmm. around almost all aspects of this. So I know it's important work and I appreciate your thoughtfulness and in, um, including all the stakeholders in this work. Thank you. Let me ask uh, uh, Mr. Newsom, certainly. Oh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I just want to uh, as well thank you for your work and uh, Councilmember Colin Tardis Johnson's work on, uh, on these issues and just thank you and say I support you continuing this work. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Let me see if there's anyone with us today that wishes to comment on this item. Please come forward. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, Bradley Snyder. Um, spent most of my life living in Santa Cruz and I currently reside in uh, Boulder Creek, uh, way up in the mountains, uh, where we have problems with uh, people who grow. Uh, uh, I, a lot of people think they can claw their way out of poverty by selling uh, a lot of people think that the super saturation of zoning of pot oriented businesses, marijuana, cannabis oriented businesses in the city uh, is is normal, perfectly normal. Uh, some people think that it's a valid, you know, like core uh, industry that they can, you know, hang their, you know, their hopes on the future uh, economic vitality on that selling things that are inappropriate for people under the age of, I mean, uh, during school hours, of course, under the age of 21. Um, and, uh, you know, it's at this location where uh, Emily Riley used to own and sell cookies and soup and sandwiches. So uh, what, what's the issue? Well, okay, you have, you have about 20 of these businesses in Santa Cruz. You have fewer pizza parlors and taquerias and fast food restaurants than all of these kinds of businesses. You've, so you mentioned that uh, Jerome Powell, the head of the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, Janet, Janet Yellen's uh, former assistant, uh, Arthur Shemitz, he, he, he's from Santa Cruz. He's a friend of mine. I've known him since he was a, a little boy. And uh, I, I would like to put that past Jerome Powell. Like, what do you think of Santa Cruz being, you know, its entire economy being built on flying cars and flying people? Thank you very much. Do we have someone online? We do. Person online. Good afternoon. Welcome. Yes, hello, this is Garrett. I see again you're back to limiting public comment to two minutes. Uh, I suggest you start meetings earlier so the public can speak for the normal three minutes. Uh, I see a lot out the door of people wanting to speak anyway. 
So I won't get to all of this, but I quote from the summary of item 21, cannabis safety taxes are uses in the spirit of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The subcommittee recommends consideration of a slightly lower tax rate for minority women or majority locally owned establishments. Of note here, this is very similar to the original very discriminatory DEI written license application scoring that must now include modified factors to be approved, including C, a majority of the business is minority or women owned, or the non-free market interference requirement of a majority of the business is employee owned, uh, and, and others. Uh, some people think DEI actually means divisiveness, exclusion, and indoctrination. But I can state with 100% clarity and certainty that what the DEI subterm nowadays called diversity actually means is too many white people. White people are racist. We need less white people. We need to discriminate against white people. Yes, that is the meaning. DEI mocks anti-racism as a racist dogma similar to CRT and its occult pillar of woke cultural Marxism. As policy so-called experts, you should know policy is derived from principles and your principles contain leftist, DEI, socialist, and globalist yuck. Of course, this agenda item would not be complete without the city probably trying to line its pockets for nothing so the license transfer fees will be explored for establishment. Money for nothing, probably a large increase. Uh, we'll find out later. Remember that awful progressive equity theft idea of the 2022 Measure N or the DOA progressive real estate wealth theft real estate transfer tax idea? The public said no and actually did a council recall, but that doesn't stop the leftists. Leftists see taxes as a special justice wealth distribution. And we really should have three minutes, Mayor. Bye. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else who's with us wish to make comment? Do we have anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. <clears throat> yes. Hello. My name is Grant Palmer. I am the co-CEO of Canna Cruz. And uh, I would just like to uh, just make sure everybody is aware that the majority of cannabis dispensaries in California right now are failing. And I would believe the majority of the dispensaries in Santa Cruz City are not profitable at the moment. When we talk about the value of licenses, we're talking about this idea that, you know, whoever got a license lucked out and now they're, you know, billionaires or like Jeff Bezos or whatever. It's not really like that. The, the majority of the people who sell are in debt and they're, they're, they're not selling because they want to. They're selling because they have no choice. And what people are buying when they buy a license is they're buying a business, a built out facility, not just a license. So unless there's a way to separate the license costs from the business costs, perhaps, maybe, maybe that would be helpful. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, we, you know, I, I, we would definitely really appreciate lower tax rates. It would really help us. Most cannabis is sold on the black market. High school kids are not buying their cannabis from dispensaries. They're buying it from the black market where it's cheaper and they don't ask for IDs. Um, and, and that's your real problem. I, I think if most cannabis was sold in the store where they actually carted everybody, you know, you, you would have less use in high school. So I think dispensaries reduce high school use, not raise it. Um, as far as giving people different tax rates because of their ethnicity or gender, uh, you might want to check to see if that is actually a legal thing to do. Um, maybe it is. Maybe I just don't know. But it seems like discrimination. I don't know. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else online? No? Anyone else with us wish to make comment? Matters back before the body. I'm sorry, hand just went up. Okay, we'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Three, two, one. Okay, the matter's back before the body. A suggestion here may be that we do a couple of things. Uh, a motion like this might be in order to uh, uh, continue the work in these four areas, as indicated by the ad hoc uh, committee, uh, to add Council Member Brown uh, in the place of Council Member Watkins to the ad hoc committee and to direct us to come back, um, hopefully with a package uh, at one time, 
please don't restrict us to that. That would be our goal, but there may be something that runs ahead for some reason, but our goal would be to bring back a package of recommendations after we have done more due diligence. So if a motion like that makes sense, uh, perhaps someone could make it. The vice mayor makes that motion. Okay. Second. Ms. Bruner, would you second that motion? I will second that motion. motion second. Thank you very much. Uh, on the motion, anybody who wishes to speak to the motion. Please. Yeah. No, I appreciate um, this direction. I think it really makes a lot of sense. I do think we need to look at these things. I appreciate uh, Councilmember Brown stepping in to the place that I am unable to make at that time. I will just say, I think one thing to, to sort of understand a little bit about the history here is that when looking at the licenses and choosing the amount of licenses, we sort of just landed on that number kind of, we had some already in place, we wanted to allow some new ones, mm -hmm. it was sort of arbitrary. And when thinking about holistically our approach to cannabis outlets in this community and thinking about the maps, the regulation, the licenses, I think it's important to look at it hol holistically. And so if, you know, one of the callers mentioned, like, we have, if we were to consider a transfer license fee or a component that we're collecting, well, at, at one time, actually, there was the inability for a business to transfer their license. Mm -hmm. It had to come back to the city mm -hmm. for us to assess to mm -hmm. ensure whether or not we wanted to have control over the people who were doing business mm -hmm. in this area. So it, it is, it's complicated, and I think it's, Fix, you know, it's solvable, uh, but I do think it needs to not, it's not about a license, it's not about a license transfer, it's mm -hmm. not only about buffers, it's about the whole thing That's and the right. whole package collectively. Mm -hmm. So as you do your work, um, just keeping that in mind and um, thank you. Will do, will do. For the debate or discussion. I just want to make one Ms. quick Brown. comment since we yes. won't be able to talk about it. Um, I, I just want to say that having been through the last round of revisions with you, um, Council Member Watkins, I, I hear you loud and clear. And, um, you know, we learned a lot of lessons in that process. And so I think that um, this point is so critical, the holistic view, and that's what I see the components in this. So, yeah, really appreciate your, your input. And I think I, you probably owe me and I told you so. <laughs> My goodness. Okay. For the debate on discussion, Ms. Contar Johnson. Thank you. I, I just want to add to that. Um, I was working on this with the county, not the city, um, and, and a lot of the similar issues came up. Um, I think that, that the balance of um, making sure we don't create density with not creating a monopoly, that's the tricky part that hopefully we will be able to accomplish. But I just wanted to name that because there is lots of research around density and the impacts it has on um, you know, vulnerable communities, including youth. For the debate or discussion, seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Melantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item 22. Uh, this is the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing project we have presentations uh, by our development manager and by Ms. Lipscomb our materials in our packet good afternoon welcome good afternoon mayor and members of the council I'm Bonnie Lipscomb director of economic development and housing and with me today is Brian Borguno who is the project manager um, for the downtown library affordable housing project and while Brian's pulling up the presentation, I'll briefly just provide a little bit of context um, for the meeting today. Um, as I think most of the council knows, but the community may not be aware, is that we officially closed in the acquisition of Total Fitness on April 22nd. And so as part of that um, very important milestone, we needed and for our financing application, which was due just several days later, we needed to amend our option to ground lease that we had with the developer to incorporate the um, new parcel that the city now owns in order to provide total site control for our funding application. 
So that is the actual action before you today. But at a previous meeting, um, Councilmember Brown had requested a project idea. So we thought this was a great opportunity to sort of combine them both into one item. So the majority of the presentation today will be the project update, but we do have that council action to ratify the minute and restated option to lease agreement. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian and who will be providing the majority of the update for the presentation today. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. I guess good microphone check. Um, Brian Borguno, Development Manager for Economic Development. And I'm going to try to be as concise as possible with a pretty complex project. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to move this. If I go too quick, feel free to interject. I'll say one thing while he's moving that is that we do have some updated drawings and renderings. We're really excited to show those to you today. And I guess the, fir the first order of business would just be to kind of make sure that everyone knows who's involved in this project. We get often asked this question uh, repeatedly because we have a you know pretty big team. So we are the lead agency as the city on this overall project, but we do have developer partners, uh, Eden Housing and For the Future Housing, as well as two architect teams, Tenover Architect and Jason Architecture. Um, each one serves a different role. Tenover is the prime for the overall housing, child care, core and shell component, parking garage delivery. And Jason is our, our lead architect on the library components. So just a review of what we're going to cover today because it's a more comprehensive update. We'll go over the highlights of our recent progress, design progress and our building permit application, an update on the farmer's market and their transition to their new location, a budget update, the project schedule as a whole is it where it stands today, and then next steps. So a few highlights. We've been busy for the last year since the council approved entitlements in March of 2023. Um, a little recap, most are aware that we received a significant grant award of $33.5 million um, from the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities grant opportunity. It also is broken up into a mix of grants and loans to the developer, and I'll touch on that later in the project. But we were really happy to bring uh, this amount of revenue to this project, and also um, additional benefits to projects adjacent to the to the footprint and site. Um, of course, as Bonnie mentioned, we acquired the 113 Lincoln Street property um, and are working on a relocation plan for Total Fitness. And we have submitted a California Tax Credit Allocation Committee um, application at the end of. April, which is in process currently. Uh, the design teams both are in their final phase of design work leading to construction documentation, um, which also resulted in us submitting our building permit application at the end of April. And then the design team has taken an extra step of submitting uh, this particular project for design ward called the, the Golden Nugget Design Ward. This is a California um, Building Institution Association award that's been around for a number of years. I think this might even be 60 plus years of this award opportunity. The design progress and building permit application. As stated, we just submitted this, so this is just getting started, but we expect that the plan check and review process would be completed by October of 2024. This will result in construction documents uh, for, the, for the building permit phase and phase one in particular. We have two phases for this project, one which will be the core and shell components, the housing, child care, parking garage, and then two where we will go as a se separate uh, building permit application and um, finalize construction documents for the library build out, the commercial build out, and some of those other components. So now to what I think is the most powerful is that we have a lot of new imagery. Uh, so this is a view from Cedar and Lincoln of the progress that we've made on the design. It's really starting to, I think, feel real as I go through these pictures and I hope that um, the same sentiment comes across. A view from Cedar and Cathcart. Just a floor plan again of the housing components. One of the things that may not be as noticeable is that there's a lot of outdoor space on the upper podium deck related to residential private use. So all of these courtyards and residential community areas are going to be accessible to the residents on the top floor of what is the parking deck and the first floor of the residential component. Um, so those are areas that I think like 
aren't necessarily highlighted in some of the imagery that we've shown before, but we're starting to, to further that design effort. So here's a view of the community room and the community patio. So this is a separate area compared to some of the rooftop uh, renderings that you've seen related to the library roof deck. So this area here, residents would be able to use um, as well as walking out to this space where there's you know, this private residential area. Um, and of course, there's all those additional components of courtyards and you know, children's play areas, things like that. A recap of what the housing and child care components are. We have 124 units, one manager's unit, um, and we often again get asked what is the affordability and we've presented this information before and nothing has changed since the last time we've presented it, but we thought it would be good just to kind of reiterate. Uh, these are truly 100% affordable housing at different tiers um, and a mix of sizes. I think that's important to emphasize that we have three bedroom, two bedroom, one bedroom units, studio units. It's not just studio um, you know, workforce housing. It's, it's housing that can accommodate families. A, a little sneak peek of the uh, child care area. That's the outdoor play area down on the lower level. And if I could just add one thing about the affordability levels, I think it's important to mention that the affordability you see at Brian's outline, 30%, 50%, and 60%, that goes across all unit types. Sometimes you'll see the smallest units are the affordable ones. That's not the case with 100% affordable housing for the type of funding and project that we're moving forward. So there's affordable units for all sizes from studios up to three bedrooms. Great. And we also get asked like about when availability for these units will become available. The city does not actually manage the, the affordable housing, housing units, um, but our affordable housing partner will. And as soon as we know that there's applications accepted, like our other projects, we try to make that as publicized as possible so people can get in the queue. So just another elevated angle, you can start to see that there's additional outdoor space and courtyard space for the residents in this, this vantage point, as well as the green roof um, and solar panels for the library component. A view from across the street on Cedar. So this would be looking almost, almost directly standing in front of the Red Church and now the new housing project that's adjacent to that. So you can get more of like a profile view from across the street. And now I'm gonna take it inside the library. So this would be the front entry as you're approaching um, the main entry for the library on the Cedar Street side. This is as you walk into the main staircase. To the right would be the community room, which I don't have pictured, but to the left is the children's area. And these are some additional new renderings of the updated children's area. More of the children's book stacks and different vantage points, uh, the circulation desk specific to the children's area on the first level. And this is the atrium going upstairs. So that as you go up to the second level, this would be your viewpoint from there. And then pulling back just a different vantage point from the far corner of the second level. Um, you can kind of see the mezzanine from this vantage point as well. The teen area to the left that was in the last image, uh, it's a little more modernized than the children's area, a little bit more hip um, with some you know different color schemes and pathways, but still kind of um, still hits a similar note as some of the rest of the, the aesthetic. The special collections area, which is also located on the second level. And then the mezzanine looking out as you would be walking to the rooftop deck. We've showed a vantage point looking down, but this I think would be the first time that we've shared an image where you can actually see what it would look like as you were approaching um, this particular level. And then, of course, the, the rooftop patio as, as we envision it. So a farmer's market update, I'm going to pass it to Bonnie to kind of talk about some of the specifics that, that she's been working on with them. So we have been working with, thanks, Brian, we have been working with the farmer's market um, for quite a while and going through various options of where they could be both for a temporary relocation while the library's under construction, and then the permanent site as well. And after going through and vetting numerous options, the Farmers Market Board has settled on this proposed site, and you can see this outlined in the blue. Um, the um, other areas right now, this is the preliminary sort of concept plan. 
And just to orient you, the area includes our lot, parking lot 16, next to the library, a portion of that. And then it's on street, just southeast of the Cruzeo building. So on that frontage, and then um, turns the corner and goes down opposite of our Church Street, um, you know, a double-decker garage all the way to Walnut Street. So it's really taking advantage of a prime sort of central to City Hall and, the, and that area with a minimal impact to businesses because it's taking care of, you know, of a lot of frontage where you don't have, particularly on the, the garage side, um, direct business competition. Um, we're looking at and sort of next phasing is looking at sort of the special event permit process that we need to go through and vetting sort of what will be the traffic controls and some of the conditions in place to make sure that this, you know, works well for the farmer's market and for the community um, because this will be, you know, we're calling this a temporary, you know, layout, but, you know, realistically for the, the timing of it, it's a minimum to two to three year um, site. Working with the Farmer's Market Board has been a really great process. You know, um, they definitely have, you know, strong leadership with True Vision. And um, we also put out, I think, um, you know, many of you are aware, and I think some of you have actually taken the Farmer's Market Survey um, with sort of preferences for sort of the temporary and permanent market. And so we've had over a thousand responses. We'll come back with sort of some highlights of that in the future of, you know, what they want to see members of our community in the farmer's market in the future, both for the temporary and the permanent, what's important to retain, what are opportunities to enhance, what's the time of day, what are the hours. We got some really great feedback about the farmer's market. And it's clear our community loves the market. You know, on a permanent site, one of the reasons the Farmers Market Board and Council Member uh, Watkins can also jump in on this because she does sit on the board um, with some additional context, but really like this site is they were excited about the prospect of being included as part of the Project for Public Spaces report from a few years ago of permanently being on the existing library site as a permanent location. And so we're really excited to try out on a temporary basis this location and utilizing part of the parking lot, which could be part of their permanent uh, development as well. So they think there's a lot of synergy with being really centrally located in the downtown, close to the civic, other civic uses. They really like that idea. So we're excited um, that they're excited, and our next phase uh, with them will be uh, sort of fine-tuning this layout. Um, you, know, you may recall that when we were looking at Lot 7, we did additional renderings for them, site layout, looking at what improvements we can do in, in the parking lot that can benefit them, potentially some work that may benefit later on as well. So we'll be doing those um, steps next, as well as kicking off the permanent process um, with them. So those are some of the next steps related to the farmer's market. And so next we'll touch on the budget updates. We'll start with uh, the phase one, because I think phase one has been our priority over the last year, because we want to make sure that we can get that started in order to build out the corn shell and then, you know, focus on phase two. Right now we have a total cost estimate as, as shown, and these are the different components of, of breakdown. So right now the affordable housing and child care combined total cost is $110.1 million. Uh, the library facade corn shell is $22.1 million. The parking garage and bike parking is 20.4 million, and the commercial corn shell is 1.3 million. In large part, this represents numbers that almost directly correlates to square footage, if you think about the size of the components in each representation. In the pie chart adjacent, you can see that 72% of this cost is related to the housing and child care. Um, but what we've been busy doing is making sure that we have funding for this phase. And so with the ASIC award and all the other funding stacks that we've been able to secure over the last year, we are, we are totally sourced for this first phase at this point. Um, in addition to the ASIC award coming to this project, I want to highlight that it also brings $11 million to other improvements in the area, which include uh, the bike additional bike connections and improvements to the bike transit plans that, that Public Works works on as well as pedestrian enhancements like sidewalk enhancements, connectivity in places. All of this is going to be within, um, I think it's a half mile of the project site or closer. Um, we also were able to include Metro in that application. It's going to bring three new electric buses and some bus stop enhancements and upgrades. And Thanks, Brian. I, I just want to stop for a second and highlight that because this is pretty exciting. And we see this um, as well 
with the Pack Station North project, but the benefits of being able to apply and secure these affordable housing sustainable community grants, which we now have two in the community, because it's 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 more than just the project itself, right? So we have a, you know a critical funding over 20 million, you know, specific to the ASIC award 22.5 that's going towards the housing component. But on top of that, and beyond our project budget, as Brian you know, just went over, we have 11 million that we're bringing to the community for this grant that's beyond the scope of the housing project. And so it's so exciting to see those in the downtown. And because we also have one on PAC North, we're able to really leverage those into some really incredible public improvements and amenities in the downtown through these affordable housing projects. And of these two, of these sources, only two components are not finalized. They're in process. Um, there was action taken by this body in March to authorize us submitting the tax credit application, as well as working with the uh, financial director and our municipal advisor on securing the parking bonds. So those two things are the last two check boxes that we anticipate coming together over the next several weeks and months. Um, we're expecting scoring determinations in June from the tax credit application, which would let us know if we've been awarded those funds. Um, and then the parking garage financing, we have a meeting set for um, next Tuesday where we're going to outline what the timeline looks like for bond issuance. Um, so far, every indication looks like all of these are lining up as expected and planned for. Um, if for some reason we don't get a successful scoring determination in June, there's a second round application that we could submit immediately at the end of August. So we are, we're looking at these as check boxes that are in process that we have a plan B as well to ensure that we can move forward with our phase one construction. And again, a pie chart that just kind of represents, like there's a lot of complicated funding sources in this project as a whole that we've rolled up into these numbers. So phase two, a little bit more unknown here. So at this point in time, we really need to solidify phase one and make sure that we can move forward with construction as we anticipate in January. Um, with those last two pieces that we expect to be final, we'll be able to come back and finalize our, our budgets as it relates to, to phase two. So because we have to get through permitting to a certain extent on phase one, phase two permitting, phase two construction documents, phase two bidding documents and, and cost estimations are gonna lag a little bit behind that phase one. And so to date, we you know, are expecting to be able to solidify that over the next few months, and we would love to come back to, to present to this body an update on phase two and where it stands. We do expect that we would be able to start construction um, by the end of 2025, because the corn shell components will need about eight to 12 months before we could get in to start working on the, the interiors. Of course, that's not solidified yet until we really get into the phase one construction and start outlining our construction schedules. Um, additionally, we do have funding sources identified for this phase two already in the tune of 18.5 million approximately. And this is a, a breakdown of those sources currently as they stand. Um, we don't think that this is the end of us sourcing for this project either at this point. We have been researching and identifying additional grant opportunities, and because this falls behind phase one, we still have until the end of 2025 before we anticipate starting construction. And so we're going after a number of different grant opportunities and monitoring the notice for availability of, of funding over the next couple months and hope to have additional applications already in the queue this summer and this year that will help us fund um, additional components of the project when we get to phase two. There's another, another little shot that I didn't call, but it's a little sneak peek from uh, a little nook that you can look through into the children's area, kind of like a peekaboo spot for kids. Now I'll touch on the, the project schedule as it stands. This, this graphic isn't unfamiliar to this body. We've, we've updated it. And as you can see, we've moved much closer to construction, but looking back, the body of work that's been completed to date has been substantial. Um, we still are anticipating phase one construction early 2025. The tax credit application award, if we are awarded that, will determine that we will have a mandate to start construction by the end of February. And so this is starting to become you know, more and more certain as we kind of get through uh, the next couple of process steps on the funding side. Um, and then phase two, of course, we will be able to, to lock in um, when we expect to start as we 
developed a construction schedule for phase one and coordinate on those two efforts. Now next steps. First of all, we have action today, so I wanted to make sure we address that. Um, we're asking for a resolution to ratify an amended and restated option agreement in your agenda packet today. That amended and restated option agreement is necessary because we just acquired the 113 Lincoln parcel and we have already had an option agreement in place for the other parcel that we controlled a year ago. You guys adopted a, a similar resolution. Um, ground lease doesn't actually execute until we know we're construction imminent and we're ready to, to execute that portion of the, of the agreement. Um, and it is also a requirement for a number of the funding sources we're seeking and some of the awards we've already achieved. So again, I'm just, this is just a restatement of the recommendation that's in your packet and I can pull up if, if you guys need to revisit it. And then ultimately the next steps are building permit review for phase one, final funding sources for phase one, the relocation of total fitness and farmer's market, which is well underway and expected to be completed before the end of the year for both. Uh, then we would move into building permit review for phase two, final funding sources for phase two, bids for phase two, and construction of phase two. And thank you for your time. Oh, thank you very much. Let me see if there are questions at this stage by council members. Questions, comments? Uh, we'll start with Ms. Watkins. We'll go to Ms. Brown. Ms. Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation and update and for all your great work and just bringing this you know, puzzle piece of a uh, project together. It certainly feels that way or seems that way. Um, just a quick comment on what Bonnie was saying about the Farmers Market Board. Certainly a lot of vision, very engaged and certainly committed to ensuring that we have a great temporary space, but also a great permanent space. And Part of that vision includes not only a permanent farmer's market potentially, but also a permanent public market. So I just don't want to lose sight of what that could look like in terms of the possibility for bringing community to this, more community opportunity to our, our downtown area, um, which is super exciting. And then the question I have, which is around what I didn't see on your financing, but I know we've heard about in the past, which is the child care developer impact fee to contribute to the project for the child care component. Is that something that's still being considered? And if so, how much of that is going to be going towards this project? Yeah, to my understanding, there is available funds. It could cover uh, pre-development, development, and or operations. And so we haven't decided exactly how we're going to allocate it okay. and determining the final amount that's available to us. But I believe there is action taken by this body to ensure that we have a portion of that funding coming to this project at some point. Right. OK. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know if that then the how the timeline works for that and the allocation process works for that in terms of our annual budgeting process or other uses potentially. I, I guess just more clarity, maybe as budget season comes around or right around our corner, right, mm -hmm. um, for us to think about that. But I'd be curious how much is, is in there and how much could potentially contribute to this project or other needs. To my understanding, it's around $80,000, okay. and we have a follow-up um, meeting with the planning department to discuss like, making sure that that number is solid and how we want to allocate it to this project. Okay, I appreciate you, sh you sharing that number. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. I really uh, appreciate the detailed information here. Um, it's incredibly helpful to see how these different elements are coming together and the the financial contribution sources and um, so just really really appreciate it it's helping me think through you know the next steps as well um, and feel good about moving forward with the uh, lease I wanted to ask a, cu a couple of questions some are very particular <laughs> first is that uh, is that Grand piano really going to be in there because I love that. <laughs> I, I, I believe that we, we could call up Eric Howard if he'd want to speak to it, but I believe that absolutely that All is right. planned to be there. Um, I, I sort of I asked that mo because I um, is an introduction to my question about the internal work that's going to be done um, and that that number uh, eighteen and a half million or whatever exactly it was, um, seems that's a lot of money to raise, right? And and so you, the core and shell, it's wonderful to see. That, I mean, that's a huge milestone to be, uh, you know, to have that, those resources available. Um, but to make it pretty, 
is going to take more, and you've given us a sense of what that might look like. Um, I guess I just am wondering, um, in terms of how, where are, you, there's grants and all of that, but if we don't get them, um, how will we? Uh, what, what, are you, what are we thinking about how we will ensure that we can do those improvements? We can make, uh, you know. I guess I, I want to first yeah. be clear that the 18.5 million is funding sourcing that we believe we did. We did not share an updated cost estimate today, okay. so that's funds that we believe will be available for phase two. Available. Okay, thank yes. you. So, and, and there it will be. It's, it will probably be higher than that, right? It, it seems like a lot, but it will be more. Um, but you're. It seems like on the right track on that. I, so most of my questions have been answered because I was going to ask. Can you know where's the update before we make the decision specifically on the lease. Um, another question I have is, um, and this is mostly because I received questions from the public about this, and I want people to understand what we're doing here today. Um, the, ground, the, the lease, the option on the ground lease, is an amended version. I heard you say, we've already done this, and we're amending it because of the property acquisitions. Were there any other, without a red line, it, couldn't really see if there's any other changes, but we've already been through this, and so we're really just amending it. I want to make sure that's clear, and that, that is your, yeah. Um, are there any other changes that would affect the um, kind of I process? I think the most significant change is the additional parcel add. It is an amended and restated option agreement. So the original option agreement mostly remained the same. We did some housekeeping on you know totals of funding sources, things like that, that just needed to be updated from a year ago. Um, but largely the, the driving force is one that it was expiring and we need to have an active agreement in place for our funding sources to demonstrate site control. And two, that we acquired this parcel that wasn't included in the original agreement. And, and just to add to that, I would say previously what we had, the structure that we had, because we did receive previous funding awards, was based on an option to purchase agreement that the developer had directly with Total Fitness. The city was not involved. Right. So the distinction was as we move forward, the city acquired the parcel, so we needed to amend our existing um, option to lease um, to include that site. Thanks. I, I really, I mostly, I, I understood that, you know, and I, I saw this as a uh, kind of pro forma, another step we have to take in the process. But when I started getting messages from people saying, this is a really big deal, I thought, did I miss something? And I just wanted to make sure people in the public also understood this is, um, this is not a major change, of course, or uh, some kind of agreement that we're making that um, without information. Um, my last question, can we get this presentation up on the website too? I think it would, and a lot of people maybe didn't know that it was going to happen in this format today because it's listed the way it is on the agenda. So I think it would be great for people to be able to access it. Yeah, absolutely. We can make this uh, particular presentation available, but we also plan on um, putting additional updates on the web uh, for the project page, which I, I glossed over on the previous page. There's a QR code that will get you there. Thanks. And I will say there, we continue to provide project updates uh, about quarterly that are on the project page on the website. So this would automatically go to and be added as a link um, with a date specific on the project um, website page. So those, you know, we we're always have all our updates there. And you did ask a question, and I just I did want to get back to it, is about the overall funding. And I think that's one of the things that we're excited to come back to you in fall is that we're really looking at uh, finalizing, we're in plan check now, you know, on the phase one and get that feedback. We can really finalize the numbers for phase one and see where we are with the funding, particularly the Measure S funding. You know, we've made an estimate of how much of the Measure S funding goes towards the, the phase one and how much is available for phase two. So we'll be able to really visit and solidify those numbers. But part of what we'll be looking at for phase two is once we can really move forward with the overall estimate for the projects is being able to come forward and looking at what is the total cost and what is our full funding plan for how we go forward. And so that that is a process. The more information we can, we can secure here, the better um, we're going to be able to present that information and any decision points for you in the future. And, and I would also add to that that Getting phase one solidified makes us even more competitive on the phase two grant applications. Um, and we're looking at some that could bring as much as $10 million for one award um, on some of those different various components that were listed in the presentation. Further? 
for the questions and comments on the item. Councilmember Newsom. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Mayor Keeley. Uh, I just want to very quickly thank um, uh, Director Lipscomb and her, and, uh, her team for all the work on this project. I also want to thank you for this very uh, detailed report that you gave. This is really exciting to see. I really love seeing the pictures, uh, and it's really great to see all the progress that we've made towards making this great project and really great community asset uh, reality. So thank you. <laughs> Other questions, comments? The vice mayor is recognized. I do have a question that I thought of that I hadn't thought of before. In terms of the child care, as we're implementing um, universal pre-K and next year three-year-olds are going to be going onto the elementary school campuses around the state. And so I think the real need for child, and we have to have them just there till 6 p.m. So the real need, and we have to offer summertime stuff too. So I think the real need is for working families between birth and the age of three years old. And so when you're thinking about that, I look at the ratios and I think it's a one to three ratio of adult to child for up to 18 months and then it increases after that. But you can also be as young as 14 if you work there. So I'm just thinking in terms of, I don't know how it's gonna get staffed, but I know we have a wonderful ECE program out at Cabrillo and if we could work in collaboration with them in any way to get students um, either from Cabrillo, from the high schools, or from the university to work there and, um, you know, develop some sort of internship and career path into child care or education. Um, in, and then if there's any opportunities for a co-op or including parenting classes as part of that, I think um, the more uh, connected we make parents um, with each other, and the more we give children opportunity to socialize with each other and provide opportunities for working parents for safe um, childcare that contributes greatly to the economy. So I don't know who's running that, but those are just some thoughts that I had. We, we can pass them along to our, our, <laughs> our developer you. partner who's working closely with an operator in both the design of the interiors and, and on the programming and operations of that facility. And I would just add to that, the, the reason why the developer partner is working directly and not, not us at the city is because they, they've also been able to include the lion's share of the funding for that in their housing application. So it's a, it's a nexus between the funding award ultimately and the operation of the child care. But we'll definitely pass that on and particularly hearing where that need is on the age group. I love the suggestion for the workforce development. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Council Member Watkins is recognized. Vice Mayor, I heard your comment in the back. <laughs> and I also heard it out here, and I wanted to just say one um, suggestion is to connect with the Childhood Advisory Council locally. They're dedicated to work on these issues from workforce development to need and um, recommendations as well for our county and would be a certainly a great uh, resource for us as we move forward in addressing some of the concerns you raised. Thank you. Other questions or comments? This will be the opportunity for anyone who is with us today in chambers or online who wishes to make a comment on item 22 regarding the downtown library and affordable housing project. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? We'll take that person online. Good afternoon and welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. Um, this is Matt Farrell and I just wanna thank Bonnie and Brian from the bottom of my heart because um, this is a um, it's a it's a community asset that is going to change the face of downtown and um, it's been years of work and it will build on the foundation that's already started I don't know if council members have had a chance to go by the Cedar Street Apartments and see the recently completed Paseo that connects Cedar and Center Streets, but it's uh, it's a dramatic change in the face of downtown. There's a play area that is right off the Paseo, and having this community asset across the street from that housing and the mix of affordable housing downtown is going to be a ground-changing 
um, event in our community. So thank you so much for your work on this. Mr. Farrell, thank you for everything you do in this city. Do we have anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon and welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon. Uh, hi, this is Judy Grunstra. Um, this might be um, past history, but I think it's worth reminding everyone back in 2017 when the Downtown Library Advisory Commission made their recommendation to place the library in a mixed-use building rather than renovate the existing library. One of the factors in their decision was that they believed the library in a mixed-use project would save money on things like foundation, walls, etc. At the time, they believed they had $23 million of Measure S money to work with. They weren't told they had $22 million for the uh, for phase one of the facade and the core, and yet would need another $18 million for the interior. So that's about $40 million. And if they had known they had $40 million to work with back then, they may very well have made a different decision. Um, so... It seems the library design is a separate structure from the garage and housing. So the public is entitled to see if there are indeed savings, perhaps in a breakdown of those building elements like the foundation. Also, we are waiting to see the floor plan of the library. And when construction drawings are presented, I hope these uh, will include the square footages for each of the different areas so that we can verify the claim that there are 35,000 plus square feet of programmable space. Um, so thank you about that, and I'm also wondering how many square feet is this new farmer's market um, temporary space? Thank you. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to respond to the two questions. Did you track both those questions? Good. Thank you. Is there anyone else online, Ms. Bush, that we wish to take? No, I don't think Anyone else who is with us wish to comment? Let me go to staff. Matters back before the body. Let me go to staff and ask if you would provide a response to Ms. Gunster's questions. I'll start out on the funding question, and then Brian can supplement that. Um, you know, one thing I would say back in 2017, I mean, all the budgets then were conceptual. So as we keep progressing more, you know, in time, and granted 2017, and here we are in 2024, so it is it is seven years later. Um, but the um, early budgets that we had at that time were comparing a renovated budget to a new construction with some efficiencies of the project um, through doing the project that we have today. Those efficiencies are still there. We are um, getting a benefit on the library side of the budget from the work, certainly on soft costs, foundation, many of those. The savings are still there. Um, the overall cost today um, compared to 2017 are higher. Um, as we move forward in refining the budget, getting further into plan check and have real construction drawings, um, those costs are becoming real. So, I mean, I think that's the reality of where we are today. If we bid out a renovated project right now, those costs also would be higher. At the time in 2017, when we compared those two budgets, the renovated project budget was higher um, substantially. If I recall, the new construction budget um, for lot four was roughly 1,000 a, a square foot, and the renovated project budget was roughly 1,300 a square foot. So those were the costs in 2017 comparing a renovated library to a new project today, and I don't think those would be any different if we were to run new numbers today for a renovated budget. And I think the second question was on square footage. Yes, sir. Um, so We've presented the square footage numbers in past presentations. It's available on the website. The square footage of the library footprint, the housing footprint, the garage footprint have not changed as far as, as what we've presented last time. Um, in part, that's why we didn't highlight it in today's presentation, because there hasn't been any significant adjustments um, to, to that aspect of things. There have been minor changes through library um, feedback and the, the team that's working on it on the library side for things like adjusting the staff areas and making, you know, moving a bathroom from one side of the room to the other, those types of things. But programmatically, um, we're still in, in, in the same square footages that we've presented in the past. Thank you. Matters back before the body. We've taken testimony. You've asked your questions. Is there a motion? Madam Vice Mayor. I'd like to go ahead and move the staff recommendation. Motion. Second, Second by Ms. Watkins. You may open on your motion, Madam. I just sure. want to express uh, tremendous gratitude. I think there's 
it's already been expressed, but thank you. I know it was no small feat to get um, this. It's not quite over the finish line yet, but it feels a whole lot closer. And so I really appreciate the work um, of you and your team and uh, the collaboration between the different people in the room that called in. So thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see this. Further question or comment? Seeing and hearing none, <laughs> clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Pumpkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari John? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you very, very much. We are on item number 23. This is a resolution to authorize the agreement between the City of Santa Cruz Water Department and Wells Fargo Bank in the amount of $25 million line of credit. Ms. Lickenbach, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, this item will authorize entering, entering into a line of credit with Wells Fargo Bank. As you may recall, the Water Department has two existing loans that we draw on to implement our capital program. These are reimbursement agreements that um, don't always align with our cash flow needs. Uh, we have an existing line of credit with Bank of America that expires in June. And um, that was a three-year line of credit. Um, as staff recognized the time limit was coming up, we did a procurement of sorts with agencies that we know do this kind of um, agreement. And we negotiated a lower price with Wells Fargo and want to move in that direction. Let me see if there are questions or comments from council members on this item. Questions? Would I be right in assuming that the reason we don't do this with a local bank is it's just way too much for them to handle a, a line of credit on that scale? Um, we, we have reached out to um, banks that we know do this sort of thing, and I can't say as to whether or not any of them are local or not. Excuse me, I'm having allergies today. Um, <clears throat> and that we went with the, the agency that had the lowest terms in order to save us money. Very good. Thank you. For the questions or comments, anyone with us wish to make a comment on this item? Anyone online, Ms. Bush? Matter is back before the body. Ms. Brown is recognized. I'll go ahead and move the item, uh, move the staff recommendation. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Bruner. Ms. I'll second. Ms. Browner on the motion. Uh, so, well, Ms. I'm. Ms. Brown on the motion. <laughs> um, I, I just want to appreciate the work that you're doing and recognize how incredibly complex it is and that um, the cash flow issue, it, you know, that, that it just, you, you need this money to do some of the incredible work that, you know, you're, you plan for. Um, I did want to make a comment because somebody reminded me that um, years ago, we had asked the um, city finance director about uh, Wells Fargo in particular, and it was during the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. And so this, this issue and Wells Fargo's role um, in, in creating climate chaos was was questioned and um, we never got any um, we didn't get very far with that but I you know Wells Fargo just kind of hit me that um, it this is an institution that um, is is probably not the preference and I think mayor your question about finding you know are there local institutions or others um, is a good one and I, I just want to encourage us all to be looking for those alternatives whether they are smaller local banks or um, larger institutions that do Re, you know, finance this kind of work. Also recognizing the terms are critical and we can't necessarily be making choices that cost us a whole lot more money um, in the process. But I did want to say it since um, Wells Fargo is just clearly listed here that, um, you know, hopefully there will have options in the future. And uh, maybe that'll be in the form of a state public bank. Thanks. Thank you. Further on the motion? Seeing hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Martin? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Currently absent. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and ordered. We're on item 24. This is Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History Building Improvement and Community Process. We will hear from Mr. Elliott. Mr. Elliott, good afternoon, sir. All right, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present um, an exciting item, hopefully, 
uh, related to the Museum of Natural History. I'm joined by, oh, thanks, joined by the Executive Director of the Museum of Natural History, uh, Felicia Van Stock, and our Acting Park Superintendent, Mike Godsey, should be over on his way uh, as well. So I kick well, off the presentation. I think you may also have one of your We've got a board a, member here. We've got a couple board members yeah. from the museum as well. There they are. So, Welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So before the council today is a request to uh, initiate a public process uh, led by the Parks and Recreation Department and the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History related to facility improvements of the museum uh, and to enter into an agreement uh, that will really define a uh, process, roles, and responsibilities for both Parks and Rec uh, and the museum as we embark upon a public process. So. Uh, by way of a little background, uh, the Museum of Natural History, uh, sometimes known as the Whale Museum. Uh, Bonnie, will you advance that forward? Is over on East Cliff Drive at 1305 East Cliff Drive. The building is owned by the City of Santa Cruz and leased by the Museum of Natural History. The museum is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, the museum has resided in this building since 1954, um, but the, when the museum became an independently run nonprofit in 2009, the city leased the museum to uh, what is now the um, current Museum of Natural History. So in the early part of this year, uh, museum leadership uh, here with me approached the city uh, to propose uh, an idea uh, for improvements related to the museum. So the museum uh, is an older building and needs some improvements, uh, needs a fair amount of work. So uh, the museum approached Parks and Rec staff with uh, really a conversation about the future of the building uh, and its needs uh, related to the current facility. So long term, the goals are related to improving accessibility, protecting the collections and the archives, uh, and investing in the historic museum uh, over at Tyrell Park. Uh, so I'm going to pause there and welcome Felicia to come up and give some more background. But ultimately today, and we'll come back to this, uh, is a request of the council to green light a public process uh, that would allow us to move forward, uh, developed concepts for this new museum, uh, these, these new museum improvements, I should say, um, and really get that, that feedback and input from the community as we work forward toward potential improvements. So with that, I will introduce uh, Felicia. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, so we can advance this slide and I'll just continue to expand a little bit about background in case some of you all um, don't know about the museum. Um, so as Tony mentioned, we've uh, been in this Carnegie Library uh, since 1954. We've actually been in the Seabright area uh, since the early 30s um, and serving Santa Cruz since 1905. So we are the oldest museum in Santa Cruz, and we were originally just the city museum of everything. <laughs> and um, it's certainly evolved in over 118, 118 years. Um, and we're really gra uh, grateful for the partnership that we have with the city team, um, especially Parks and Rec and Public Works. They are amazing partners in caring for the building along with us. Um, we're just a really wonderful, a, a, relationship that we have going on. Uh, this museum staff cares for the building interiors. Um, we've done a lot of work inside, you know, new carpets, paint, all kinds of maintenance, um, as well as basic security and surveillance of the building and the grounds. I, I hope that as tenants, that we are valued as tenants, um, bringing, uh, bringing safety and positive use to that park and that neighborhood. Um, we do really love that building and we love the neighborhood where we are. Um, and it's just a really unique place and a unique opportunity to make connections to nature both inside and outside. And the fact that it's a historic building and historic nature, uh, neighborhood also adds to the experience of visiting um, our city's oldest museum. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, as much as we love where we are, there are some issues, and I'd like to highlight that even when the museum was the city museum, there was an acknowledgement that this building um, was not adequate for its functions. Um, it has actually already been expanded upon twice. The historic building has been extended uh, toward the park um, uh, in, in the early 60s. 
Um, and also previous city councils have approved other building improvement concepts in the past um, that never came to fruition. And those issues that were acknowledged uh, a couple of decades ago are still persistent. And the museum as an organization has continued to grow uh, since becoming a nonprofit. And with that steady and sustained growth, those issues are just becoming more of a threat and constraint. Um, they're listed here on the slide. Uh, the, some of our issues include that this historic building and its systems, including HVAC and the foundation, are really in urgent need of safety, preservation, and sustainability upgrades. In particular, the museum's collections are threatened by substandard space, environmental conditions, and uh, seasonal flooding, which has gotten worse over the last couple of years. Additionally, when large collection items or exhibits need to be moved, we have to carry them outside and upstairs because there is no elevator. And sometimes that's in the rain when we're flooding. Um, and of course, this is less than ideal both for the safety of the items and for the safety of our staff. Um, no elevator also means limited accessibility in our workspaces. And in fact, accessibility throughout the building and the park uh, are definitely in need of significant improvement. Uh, furthermore, insufficient space and limited airflow make it challenging to create a healthy, safe, and welcoming environment from our staff, volunteers, and guests. Uh, the pandemic has only has really drawn highlighted that as an issue that having those cramped spaces and inadequate airflow um, as an issue. And if any of you have gone on field trips with your children to the museum or visited a museum, visited a museum while there's a field trip, you know that a lack of dedicated classroom space impacts the educational programs and the visitor's experience with children and backpacks strewn all over the floor. Um, and then having limited space also limits our ability to display our collections. Currently, only 4% are ever shared with the public. And we can't host most state-of-the-art traveling exhibitions, which require more room and better environmental conditions than we are able to currently provide. Um, next slide. So we're really coming to this project with a problem-solving lens. Uh, we're not developers trying to create some big new feature. We're really focused on preserving and enhancing a public asset, a city building, and a beloved educational resource for the community. Um, but as I've mentioned, these issues are becoming increasingly urgent, and we know that timely action is essential to preserve the historic building and to protect the collections for generations to come. Uh, we're focused on enhancing accessibility for all and improving our offerings, the exhibits and programs that our community has come to expect and appreciate. Um, so the next slide. The process that we're proposing um, and that Tony mentioned is really focused on community engagement, and I look forward to hearing more from our community about what they value in a museum and in that building and in that park space. And of course, we also have solutions to propose to the issues that I've just outlined. Um, and these solutions that we're proposing preserve the historic building and its internal systems, and will expand on the non-historic part of the building, as has been done before, to increase office space collections and exhibits. Uh, we also pro propose to add a classroom to provide a better learning environment, and that can also become a community space, which is lacking in that part of town. Uh, we believe that these solutions will not only address our issues, but also create new opportunities that allow us to serve for another 120 years. So I appreciate your consideration and the support and partnership of the Parks and Rec team. They've been amazing. Um, so I'll hand it back to Tony to go back into that process piece to make sure we're understanding what we're talking about. Thank you for your presentation. Mr. Director. All right. Bonnie, next slide, please. Thank you. All right, uh, so on our process roadmap, this is really simplified, but we are at the beginning. So these first steps are around creating a conceptual design uh, of these improvements to the museum and really engaging the community um, on these concepts and what this means for the park and what this means for the neighborhood and the museum uh, as well. So uh, in broad terms, uh, community engagement will, would be our next uh, big step with the museum We'd go through a series of public hearings, Parks and Recreation Commission, Historic Commission, 
uh, et cetera, as we work with the planning department uh, as well on various approvals and permits. And then we'd work, uh, we would work toward a building agreement, or in other words, a, a construction agreement. So once we get approvals, once we go through these uh, public hearings in this process, if there's general support uh, to move these building improvements forward, uh, including the park design, uh, we would come back to the city council before initiating the project to say, uh, here is a project agreement or a construction agreement. Here's how this would work. Uh, the expectation here generally, and it's outlined in the staff report, um, as well as in the agreement that's attached with the, the packet, um, is really that the museum would lead this project, would do the bulk of the fundraising for this project. Um, and so th this is unique in many ways. It's not every day that we have one of our partners um, uh, come to us and say, hey, we want to raise millions of dollars and invest in a city building. Um, and this is beyond uh, Parks and Rec, certainly. This is really um, a benefit to the entire community through the work that the Museum of Natural History does. So a unique opportunity, a really strong partnership there, um, as Felicia mentioned. Um, and, and again, uh, we could talk about the, the partnership and the relationship uh, on and on, but a lot of layers to that that we hope to really build uh, and grow um, as well. So again, I just want to quickly thank JM and Juliana and Felicia for their uh, participation in this. A lot of work ahead of us. Um, as I go to the last slide, please, Bonnie, um, it's just our thank you slide. Um, I just want to mention to the City Council uh, for your consideration is that uh, Parks and Rec staff, if it wasn't clear already, really support this project, um, support this moving forward, um, and encourage the City Council to consider supporting this as well. And the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, heard this back in April and unanimously supported uh, this as well for council consideration. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Thank you again to the museum team and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Thank you for those presentations. Let me ask if council members have questions and comments on this item. No. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have been on field trips at the museum and they're just wonderful. Um, just one piece of data that stood out was um, the slide that said only 4% of artifacts, artifacts are on display. Is that because of the limitations on the building and the structure? Yeah, it's just not enough wall space or ceiling space to, to get any more of those big animals out to, to show to folks. And um, with the, so follow-up question, with the anticipated restructure of the building, we hope that we will make it such that the footprint will allow for more of the displays, I assume. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we are proposing an expanded footprint, which will get us additional exhibit space. And we're working with an exhibit designer to kind of envision uh, new state-of-the-art modern exhibits that make the most of our collections. OK, thank you. And then a question for Director Elliott. Um, uh, Felicia mentioned that there were prior plans with the city that didn't pan out and come through. Um, could, uh, yeah, either one of you, I guess, if you could speak to that, why that was. Yes, so the there have been multiple efforts to change that building. The, there were two successful ones in 1962 and 68. And then um, there were at least one one set of plans for extending the building in in the 80s. I think it's the 80s, Juliana. Yeah. And um, I think it, those plans, even though they were approved and pursued by by the city, uh, failed for funding reasons. And then there was another effort to move locations um, to Depot Park. I think there was even talk about Topogonep at some point. There have been lots of conversations about the inadequacy of that building, um, but then it keeps on coming back to the history of the neighborhood and the wonderful location. And uh, the most recent effort did identify the build that building and location as where we'd want to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and that was right before the recession, and that's okay. why that last effort didn't work. Okay. Thank you for that yes. context. That's it. Council Member Brown is recognized. I'll, I just want to thank you for your commitment, your dedication, and applaud your ambition in taking on this project. I had the opportunity to um, take a tour recently, and so everything you're saying, really, I can visualize. Um, I wanted to ask a question mostly about how we can 
um, support you in this stage? Uh, you know, the, the, as a city, you're working with city staff, but uh, council members, how can we support your efforts moving through this process? And just, you know, I ask that question and or say, how, you know, how can we support you? And then we never really have that conversation. So I want to put it out there. Um, you know, what are, what are the, some of the ways that we can uh, make sure you're successful? And you don't have to answer it all now, but just like wanted to put it out there. I really mean it. I'm not just saying it. <laughs> Thank you. And we certainly will get reach out to you all um, to ask for further support um, in engaging the community at this at this stage, um, and what this proposed process that we're asking for action on today outlines. You know, authorization of staff time to help us move through the permitting process. Um, perhaps pursue grant funding when we are doing a lot of fundraising, but I know that there are uh, city grants out there um, or that we could co-apply for because this is an uh, ultimately for the city's building. So thank you. Ms. Brown. <laughs> for the questions, comments at this point, we will go out to the public. Is there anyone who is with us today who wishes to make comment? Mr. J.M. Brown, welcome. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you as always, Mayor Keeley Council. Thank you for agendizing this item today. There's been a lot of work that's gone into this process, to exploring this process for the last couple of years internally at the museum. And um, we just are so excited to bring you this first blush this afternoon. Um, I am J.M. Brown, I'm Vice President of the Board, and I have with me two other board members, Sue Pierce, our President, and our Master Planning Committee Chair, Juliana Rebliati, who many of you will recognize as the city's retired planning director. So we're enormously grateful to have her expertise leading this master planning process. Um, and I wanna just continue um, the gratitude that we have for our park staff that's working with us um, so far, and also the CAO's office has spent some time dedicated to this and the city attorney's office already. And so we feel very well supported being before you today to bring this um, this idea. And in response to your question, Council Member Brown, um, I wanted to let the council know that we're having a meeting on May 19th, that's a Sunday from three to five, at the museum just for our Seabright neighbors mm -hmm. to hear um, their questions, comments, concerns, excitement, and we dedicated that meeting just to them because obviously they'll be most impacted by the project while it's underway. Um, and uh, then on May 22nd from six to eight is our general membership meeting. So attendance by council members, certainly the mayor um, as well, would be welcome at any of our future outreach meetings. So um, again, thank you for your time and your support, um, enthusiastic support so far for our efforts to get this underway. And thank you again. Thanks to you and your colleagues for your fine work. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to address us on this item who's with us today? Do we have anyone online? No one with their hand raised. The matter is back before the body. Council member. Watkins is recognized. Yeah, I'm happy to move the recommendation. There's a motion. Second. There's a, a second by Ms. Contar Johnson. You may open on your motion. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just wanted to say thank you for being here and for your work, and it's great to hear about the collaboration, and it certainly takes us all uh, working together to invest in these just historic and well-valued institutions in our community and seeing them for the future years to come is certainly a priority of mine and I know of our communities. Um, I too have taken my kids on the field trips and just so you know, it's awesome. And it, I mean, yeah, sure, it's a little cramped, but um, but it's great. It's a really, it's a really amazing space. And when you mentioned um, in the 80s as the proposal, I just went back to my childhood and climbing on the whale. <laughs> and and, and it is, it's just, it's, um, it's an icon for our, our local community, it truly is. So I, I look forward to, um, as Councilmember Brown uh, offered, to support and help and assist in any way I can to ensure the success. I'm happy to support this direction and really look forward to what the future could be. I also really appreciated, and I, I wanted to mention this, that there isn't a lot of community space in that area, and I, mm -hmm. I, I forgot about that, honestly, until you mentioned that. And so I just want to thank you for saying that. I think it's really important. We have, um, we have local community spaces for, for gathering. So I appreciate you also, um, Jay, I'm mentioning that you're going to start with our Seabright neighbors and letting them um, have, have their voices heard. So anyways, happy to support it. Thanks for being here. Um, look forward to seeing the next iteration. 
for the debate or discussion. Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, I also am happy to support a green light um, to this public process and staff support um, to develop you know, these concepts and a plan to move forward. Um, this location is absolutely a community asset. Thank you for bringing it forward um, at the beginning stage at this start and really wanting to be intentional with community engagement and council approval for the process. Um, I too had the honor of viewing um, the archives and collectibles downstairs and seeing where the flooding happens and I've been at many, many events there um, up and down those stairs and I've seen the need for accessibility um, for a lot of seniors that attend events and walkers and maybe accessibility, um, mobility um, obstacles to the park and to the museum itself. So I think um, the fact that um, you're a great tenant on this city property and a proven steward of the surrounding area and neighborhood and Tyrell Park. Um, and I have no doubt that you are committed to um, really investing in your future at this location. So happy to support this motion. And I really, truly thank the board and the staff of the Museum of Natural History. And I thank the Parks and Rec City staff and any other staff that has supported along the way. Thank you. Thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. I also would like to thank you guys for all that you do to contribute to the education of the youth and the community. And I think that no one's gonna believe this, I've never been on a field trip there um, <laughs> because I'm always teaching during when my kids did field trips. And fifth grade, that isn't a place where fifth grade goes, it's not really in our standards. But what is in our standards, what we did do is we borrowed things from you, like the stuffed owl for our watershed, um, stuff and so I really also want to acknowledge that although you're only four percent of the archives are displayed you really have a robust email network um, for local educators so they can borrow things to bring realia into the classroom and make learning um, accessible to kids that might not otherwise have the experience of going to a museum or learning about things um, through firsthand experiences. And so if you don't normally have little kids you might not think of those things or you don't know the California standards that you start learning about you know science as three and four year olds all, and um, and social studies and all of those things. And so I think of all of the places where our Santa Cruz City Schools goes on field trips, the museum is really excellent in their collaboration with um, the state standards in making sure that um, the, the field trips are meaningful for all students. So thank you. For the debate or discussion, Council uh, Member Brown. I can't help but say one more thing. I kind of commented my thanks um, in my with my question, but um, I just want to say this is mostly for the public. Um, anyone out there listening, I have decided since my last visit that this museum is, in addition to all of the wonderful things we've heard, um, prop, top of the list for attitude adjustment. Spot to have an attitude adjustment if you are feeling frustrated or just like over it okay. to step into that museum and see how young people are engaging and the, the dedication that you all display. It really is like, a, you know, 10 minute reset. If, if that's all you have time for, but it's worth staying and exploring everything. <laughs> for the comment, seeing here none, we have a motion and the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Hamilton? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Kelly? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very, very much for your very fine work. Best wishes to you. Thank you. What we are going to do now is I believe we have dispensed with as much work as we can until we come back here at 4 o'clock for, for item 5 and item 6. 
then I suspect we'll dispense with those. We will then come back again at 5.30 to take up item 25, so everyone knows where we're at with this. So at this point, we will stand in recess until 4 p.m. I know I don't. No, I just do. Gets him so much yeah, do, you ever, do you get to work with Margaret Spring? Yes, I do. I'm in her division. She's not the smartest person in the world. She's amazing. Oh, that yeah. Road. <laughs> yeah. She's doing extraordinary work yes. internationally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, she's working on the plastics. Mm -hmm. she's not. She is a trip. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's fun. She's had fun. Mm -hmm. She's got like a good attitude. You know? Yeah. Seems like she just enjoys. What are you taking pictures for? I think the level at which she has oh, played cool. over the years. Right. Oh. <laughs> it may be for anything. Yeah. Be a surprise. So impressive. Yeah, that's Stop an impressive there. place. Mm -hmm. oh, Even God. made more impressive now. It's getting too kind. <laughs> no. KSPW had like some stock footage of him chewing gum, but they kept playing. It was nothing even. So I only chewed gum once. On the dais? Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Okay, I'm going to do this part. I'm going to do this part. Yeah, but I'm going to give you, teacher. Okay. Okay, so here's what happens. I just say, look at okay. all these wonderful people, and I introduce Linda Snook. Perfect. She does her thing, and then you do okay. all that. Deal. You're like a vice mayor. Oh. The hour of four o'clock having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will come back into session. The clerk, call the roll for purposes of establishing our quorum. Thank you. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Currently up. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Calentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Having established a quorum, we will move on to item five. Uh, we're pleased to have a special presentation. This is the Hans Christian Anderson Contest Awards. Um, our sister city committee uh, has uh, done a lot of work in this regard. It's a wonderful writing competition for children and teens and young adults uh, sponsored by our sister city committee. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Linda Snook, who comes here every year and uh, helps us engage in this wonderful activity. Good afternoon. Welcome again. So wonderful to have you here. Good afternoon. I'm happy to see you. I'm happy to see you often this year. Sister City is really active this year. I'm happy to be here a lot. And uh, today, um, our Santa Cruz Sister Cities Hans Christian Anderson essay competition is presented as part of the Hans Christian Anderson Fables Bay competition in our beautiful sister city of Sestri Levante, Italy, mm. where Hans Christian Anderson is considered a favorite son. This is the 57th year of the Sestri competition. It's part of a larger celebration of childhood and youth during a 10-day festival that has music, puppetry, circus, theater, and more. And the festival is one of the most important Italian 
festivals dedicated to fairy tales, and it's unique in the world. And the writing contest is one of the most popular in Italy, and the winners of the contest will be announced in June during the Anderson Festival in Sestri. Our competition is open to writers in four age categories, age three to five, six to 10, 11 to 16, and 17 and over. The essays can be about any subject, but must be an original folk or fairy tale. The winners of the Santa Cruz contest will, in each age group, will be submitted to the Sestri Levante competition. And we're pleased to be here in person and joined by our fantastic writers today. And without further ado, I would like to invite Mayor Keeley to come up and present the awards. Thank you. What I think we're going to do is uh, I'm going to ask the vice mayor, uh, because during her day job, she is the principal of a school. So she knows all about this education business. So, uh, And I am, I, a, I am a former uh, Sister Cities Committee member, and so it gives me great, great pleasure to announce the winners, and we'll hold our applause till the end. But when you hear your name, come on down. So for ages under 10, the winner um, in second place is Piper Hoff. Now, if I don't want to butcher, butcher anyone's name, Hoffman Fr Frides with the story Once Upon a Time. And in first place, Alex Hernandez Jason with the Chronicles of a Bookworm. So let's give those two a round of applause. <laughs> For ages 11 to 17, we have a first place winner of Morgan Schramm with a Broken Promise Baboon Learns a Lesson. Come on down, Morgan. <laughs> and for the division of adults, ages 17 up, the third place winner is Joan Prebilvich. Pre 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 I don't know if I said that right. No, now you know my name. Second place, Carly Perlman, Bear and Red Fox, and first place, Sally Gray with the Hourglass. Um, and we would like to uh, congratulate all three of those winners right now with her with the round of applause. We want to thank all of the entry, um, the, the applicants that entered in this competition and the Sister Cities Commission for putting this together for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, briefly, I'm Isabel Tanser. I'm the chair of the Sestri subcommittee. I would like to thank you, council member, Mayor Keeley, and hopefully next year we'll be able to organize a delegation to Sestri Levante during the festival. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder if what we could do is if uh, the award winners and uh, whoever is with them, why don't you come up uh, in front of the railing here? We can get a picture with the vice mayor and, and so on. Maybe the council members are going to want to do this. Let's go all get a I was a judge. judge. I was a former judge. What? That's very fun. That's awesome. I remember you coming. Yeah. I have a founded orchestra. Those kids are seniors now. Oh. Uh, they go so fast. Yeah. On to another part of the Yeah. We are on item number six on our agenda. This is junior guards. Uh, this is a send-off of the delegation. Uh, we understand that uh, Carola Barton is going to be making a presentation. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Um, I am Carol Barton, a member of Sister Cities, and today I'm going to introduce the uh, delegation going to Biarritz, France. They're leaving on June 1st, and they're very excited. They'll be participating in lots of activities with their French peers, learning a great deal, and they're excited to represent our wonderful city. Um, they're spending a week, and in preparation for this experience, they've had uh, classes in French language and culture, mm. and um, since this is an exchange, uh, the, a delegation from Biarritz, France, will be here in July, mm. and we'll be hosting them. So, um, I will tell you their names. Maybe you can raise your hand. Alden Miele, Anthony Mohammed, Drake Harper, Hayden Mandel, Isla Cooper, Nico Vandermeer, Otis De La Selva, Zoe Poche, and Zoe Roth. And we also have two chaperones, Amos Fishbein and Paloma Richardson. Thank you so much for your support of this wonderful program. Well, thank you so much for being here. We we want to hear a little more. How about one of one one or two of you back here are going on the trip? Come on, come on and tell us about this. How did this all happen? What are you getting ready to do? Any one of you? Hayden, Zoe. One come young on. man, one young Let's lady. Let's go. Come on, come on. You don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from yeah. me. Yeah. Want to hear from you? Yeah, <laughs> as much as we love you dearly. Sure. Yes. Uh, I think we like doing the activities like with them, with the host families and all that. Anna. Great, sounds like fun. Good. One of the young ladies, come on up here and tell me what, what how you, uh, what's going to happen here. Um, I'm you really hardly excited. look like a young lady, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really excited to see the, the culture of beer mm -hmm. and like learn more about, um, yeah, how, how they live over there. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Welcome. Um, yeah, I'm excited to train with them and experience the culture and like how they live for the first time. Well, thank you so much. You are ambassadors of the city of Santa Cruz and we know that you're going to make us proud when you travel. And we thank you so much for doing that, Madam Vice. If I may, I have to say I know some of you personally, and I've known you since you were four or five years old, and I think you will be really good ambassadors of our city. And through Sister Cities, we create relationships across cultures and across languages. And I hosted the first delegation of Junior Gardens, and my daughter was fortunate enough to go last year. And she said it was an amazing experience. You're going to be exhausted, but it's going to be so um eye-opening for you and so I hope you enjoy every moment of it and we want to hear about it when you get back so um, good luck with uh, keeping up with the um, the French guards and I know you guys train in the meantime and, and beat them for us please make us proud <laughs> yeah we're gonna get a picture let's uh, don't ever go away How get together Another picture. Oh, yeah, they come up here. Come on up. You get behind us. There we go. We need more fun. Yeah, good idea. I'm so glad you're going. I'm so excited. I'm excited. Good to see you, too. Yeah. There you go. Twin, right? Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Here we Thank you. Thank you. We will. I know. Take us. <laughs> now we get to go away for an hour and ten minutes. Okay. I know. What a luxury. All right. Uh, we have now finished the day's business with the exception of the time certain item we have at 5.30 p.m. this afternoon, item 25, uh, which is an appeal. We will 
stand in recess until 5.30 p.m. this evening. I must have something that I need to do. The hour of 5.30 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will resume its meeting of May the 14th, 2024, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we are going to move to item 25. This is an appeal of a planning commission approval of an administrative use permit to establish a cannabis retail facility on a parcel in the MUM zone district and within the Mission Street Urban Design Plan. We will, for those of you that have not been to a council meeting where we're taking up an appeal, let me take a moment and set how we're going to proceed this evening. We will first receive a staff report. That'll get our the stage set for us in terms of what is the issue and what are the issues embedded in that. We will then hear from the appellant. Uh, Mr. Sykes will have up to 20 minutes uh, for his appeal. He can use that time as he wishes. If he wants to cede some portion of that time to other people, that's his choice. But he has a total of 20 minutes, however he wishes to use it. Following Mr. Sykes' presentation, the applicant, Mr. Berryessa, will also have 20 minutes. Mr. Berryessa similarly can divide his time as he wishes. He can use it all himself, he can cede some time to other people, but his response time will be a total of 20 minutes. At that point, the council may have questions that it wants to ask, they will do so. Then we will move to the public. The public, we will hear from every member who wishes to testify. You have up to two minutes time to do that. Oftentimes at uh, hearings such as this, it's not at all unusual for us to have both folks here in the chambers and folks who are online who wish, wish to participate. If that's the case tonight, what we will do is simply alternate back and forth. We'll take somebody online here in the council chambers, we'll then hear somebody online, then we'll take somebody in council chambers and so on, until everyone has had the opportunity uh, to provide testimony. When all of that is finished, the matter will be back, uh, excuse me, at that point, Mr. Sykes will have a total of five minutes to rebut. Again, he can use that time as he wishes. At that point, the matter will be back before the body. We will decide to take up any action uh, that we deem to be appropriate. So that is how we will proceed. Uh, cautionary note for everyone, a request of you. Uh, we will listen to each and every one of you attentively. Uh, you will have our full attention during every presentation we would ask that you extend the same courtesy back. Um, this is a council hearing. It's not a salon. It's not a, a gathering outside at a park. Uh, so what we would appreciate is you give your attention to whoever it is that's speaking. They have their two minutes to use it how they determine. It's not helpful if there's responses essentially from the audience. Uh, that tends to intimidate people who might otherwise want to participate and they'll feel somewhat intimidated. So we would ask that we all extend the kind of courtesy that you would ask to be extended to you. Let's extend that to everyone. With that, we will begin. Mr. Bain, good evening, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Ryan Bain, Senior Planner with the Planning Department. So tonight, um, we're considering an appeal uh, of a planning commission approval of an administrative use permit to open a cannabis retail outlet uh, within an existing commercial building located on the northeast corner of Mission Street and Laurel Street, as shown here. Um, the building was occupied by Emily's Bakery for many years, and the uh, 2,878 square foot building is being proposed to be split 
into two commercial spaces, um, including 1,000 square feet for Emily's Kitchen and Cafe, and 1,878 square feet for a new cannabis retail store called The Hook, Santa Cruz. So uh, there was a well-attended uh, March 7th planning commission hearing um, where uh, there were approximately 36 members of the public that spoke both in support and in opposition to the project. Um, the planning commission listened to the public testimony and discussed some of the issues raised by the speakers. Um, the planning commission voted 5-2 to approve the administrative use permit. Um, and here are just a few kind of highlights and comments from the commissioners. Um, conditions of, they felt that the conditions of approval addressed many of the concerns. Um, they expressed some concerns about moving the goalposts on the applicant, and that would be bad, bad government. Um, there are limited locations available for this use, and the proposed site is consistent with the zoning code by meeting the buffer requirements and performance standards. Um, commissioners mentioned that the finding for denial in the, res in the resolution for the denial resolution was fairly weak. And while uh, no way to reconcile how close this location is to the high school and the negative impacts on students and some concerns about the proliferation and potency of today's cannabis. Um, other comments included the 600 foot buffer was fully vetted when the ordinance was adopted and the site and use meet the zoning requirements and the city should not be changing the rules and applicants. Um, there was some mention about students being very mobile these days with e-bikes, et cetera. So um, access to dispensaries or um, cannabis is fairly, it doesn't necessarily equate to location. Um, and that the Santa Cruz, the police department has reviewed the application and found no complaints uh, or service calls for cannabis sales to minors at any of the existing city retail dispensaries over the last four years, and that the strict rules for multiple verifications to gain access to dispensaries uh, should suffice. So those were some of the comments um, addressed by the Planning Commission as part of their vote to uh, approve the administrative use permit. So an appeal um, on March 14th, uh, following the Planning Commission approval, an appeal was received um, from a group of concerned parents. Um, the, the appeal letter, which was a part of the staff report, um, had a, uh, basically the appellants assert that the approval was not in conformance with the commercial cannabis use findings, as well as the AUP findings, specifically um, referencing some general policies and then questioned if the use was allowed in the MUM um, zone district. So um, the zoning ordinance allows cannabis retail sales in the MUM zone district um, with approval of an administrative use permit and subject to our commercial medical and adult use cannabis regulations also in our, our municipal code. So the zoning code allows cannabis retail sales with approval of an AUP, a city canna cannabis retail license and the obtaining of a state cannabis retailer or, or nonprofit license. Um, the applicant recently applied for a transfer of one of the five cannabis retail licenses that are uh, permitted in the city. And that license transfer was approved by the city with final administrative steps being completed to transfer the license from WAM Phytotherapies um, to the current applicant. Um, the hook will have a partnership with WAM to ensure that affordable cannabis reaches community members in dire need. Um, but I should note that there have been a lot of comments about WAM, and so just wanted to be clear for the record about WAM's involvement um, in this application. Uh, so this, this is not an application for WAM. Um, WAM is, is a partner with the applicant, but that is a private agreement that can change and does not directly address this part of this application. So um, the applicant obviously will be speaking tonight, so um, if you have any questions regarding that relationship with WAM and more, if you'd like it, some more of that in detail, I'm sure that they can explain that to you. Um, but the collaboration with WAM will ensure that a segment of the sales go toward providing free or sliding scale cannabis to low income patients suffering from severe medical conditions like cancer, AIDS, MS, and epilepsy. Um, WAM has been providing the service, as many of you know, um, for many decades and is committed to compassionate care and community support. And the organization is dedicated to offering therapeutic quality cannabis products that are both accessible and affordable, uh, reflecting a deep-rooted commitment to health, wellness, and holistic care for individuals with serious illnesses. So taking a, just a look mainly just at the administrative use permit and the use, um, the proposed 
uh, use would be conducted entirely within the existing commercial building. Um, the proposed hours are from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, however, the use would be permitted to operate between 7 a.m. in accordance with our zoning ordinance. Um, the Hook Santa Cruz would employ up to 10 individuals. Uh, total on site and anticipates up to three commercial vehicles entering and existing the site. Um, deliveries would occur between 8.30 to 3, Monday through Friday. Um, commercial vehicles are mainly vans that don't exceed 20 feet in length. Um, the business would provide labeled packaged products and sell them directly to consumers of both medical and adult use markets, and no cannabis products um, would be visible from the exterior of the store, uh, and customers would leave the building with products and opaque packaging. These are all part of the performance standards required in our zoning ordinance. Um, the applicant is proposing a sec secure facility and has provided a detailed security plan that meets the requirements of the state of California and the city of Santa Cruz rules and regulations. Um, the plan includes perimeter security lighting and video surveillance. Um, there's many requirements regarding high security steel doors and all of that, integrated cameras and alarm systems. Those are all part of a security plan that's been reviewed and approved um, by the city of Santa Cruz Police Department. As I mentioned, there's um, performance standards that are listed in our um, commercial cannabis ordinance. The standards regulate criteria such as security, noise, odor, um, no product usage on site, hours of operation, no loitering, litter removal, advertising, et cetera. So the proposed use has been, it's been reviewed and it's consistent with all these performance standards. Um, also part of our um, cannabis ordinance it requires the cannabis retail facilities maintain a 600-foot buffer from schools, parks, daycare centers, and youth centers, um, in addition to any other retail um, cannabis facilities. So the proposed project meets all of the specified setback requirements, including maintaining a distance of approximately 850 feet from Santa Cruz High School and approximately 1,360 feet from uh, Mission Hill Middle School. Um, as I mentioned, there's, uh, the zoning code also has specific uh, AUP findings for cannabis-related uses. These are the, the uh, findings listed here. Upon review of these findings, um, staff and the Planning Commission found that they can be made based on the information provided by the applicant and the proposed retail use meeting the required zoning code requirements as previously discussed. So um, getting back to the appeal, um, the appellants assert that the proposed use is not in conformance uh, with findings two and four, as the proposed use would be located approximately 850 feet from Santa Cruz High, uh, uh, one of two main signalized uh, Mission Street Highway 1 crossings where a lot of students uh, cross and that uh, on, their way, on their way to school, and that the retail dispensary use would adversely affect the health, safety, and welfare of students in the area. Um, the, the appeal also states that finding four specifically requires decision makers to consider persons under the age of 18 when reviewing a cannabis application. So um, staff presented these draft findings to the Planning Commission in two separate resolutions similar to what we provided the council, uh, one for approval and one for denial. That would have allowed the commission to either support the application um, by making these findings or deny by not making the findings. So. Uh, upon review of those findings and the staff report and public testimony at the Planning Commission hearing, the Planning Commission found that they can be made based on the information provided by the applicant and the proposed retail use conforming to the required uh, zoning criteria. Um, the appeal raises the question as to whether the application meets the intent of finding number two um, regarding the cannabis retail use being, quote, located within proximity um, of an incompatible use such as a children's school, daycare facility, or youth center. Um, so while the use meets the objective standards of a minimum 600-foot buffer from said schools, uh, daycare facilities, youth centers, and other cannabis retail outlets, the findings are, are more subjective, um, allowing the city additional discretion to consider whether the use is you know, within proximity of an incompatible use and whether it will adversely affect health and safety, um, namely students at, this, at the high school or middle school. So similar discretion is afforded to the city under finding four, uh, which speaks to the use being compatible with other neighboring uses in the surrounding area, particularly those used primarily by persons under the age of 18. 
So while there's a fairly long history of cannabis ordinances here in Santa Cruz, the current ordinance was adopted following state legalization in 2017. Um, the 600-foot buffer zone was thoroughly discussed uh, as part of the cannabis ordinance uh, adoption process with input from Santa Cruz Police Department, obviously, um, the public, as well as the city council. Um, in November of 2017, after several public hearings and discussions, the city council adopted the new ordinance um, establishing the 600-foot buffer and limited the number of retail establish establishments to five. Um, the following map indicates the locations within the city that meet locational restrictions, as well as proposed uh, zoning uh, district restrictions. And as you can see on the map, um, these restrictions result in limited number of locations throughout the city uh, where retail outlets would be allowed. So it's, it's fairly limited as to where they can be located. Um, the Santa Cruz Police Department um, reviewed both the cannabis uh, retail license transfer um, for the hook, from WAM to the hook, as well as the subject um, AUP that's being considered here tonight. Um, with the project outside of the buffer zone and the stringent ID requirements for adults 21 years and older, the police department did not express any concerns with the proposed location um, or the retailer. Additionally, as part of the review of this application, the police department researched the records for other cannabis retail outlets in the city and found no complaints or service calls for cannabis sales to minors. Um, based on these facts, it could be argued that the proposed retail use does not qualify as within proximity as it meets the buffers of a school and that it would not adversely affect the health and safety of students. Um, it could also be viewed, um, as the Planning Commission found, as unfair to the applicant for the city to, to move the goalpost, so to speak, by finding that the established 600-foot buffer is insufficient. Um, many concerns about the proposed use at this location have been expressed by the Santa Cruz School District, uh, as well as parents of Santa Cruz High and Mission Hill students, and those, those uh, concerns are certainly understandable. Um, a number of students from both schools walk and bike by this location uh, every day um, during the school year, um, with the signalized intersection of Laurel and Mission Street serving as one of the two primary locations where students cross Mission Street, and the presence of a dispensary could be conveyed as normalizing cannabis use. Um, additionally, it is not uncommon for underage individuals to obtain false identifications or medical cannabis cards. Um, raising concerns about the potential for younger students to gain access to cannabis through fake IDs or for students to acquire these cards and distribute cannabis to younger peers. Uh, in addition to providing a letter of opposition, the superintendent of Santa Cruz Schools has also included a number of articles uh, on the impact of THC on youth, the impact of dispensaries to schools, the acquiring of fake IDs, and relevant school data on marijuana use within the school district. And that was all included as part of uh, your um, staff report packet. Um, to add to that discussion, um, the applicant has also provided data regarding the effects of marijuana on young people and the effectiveness um, of, of ID policies at cannabis outlets and assessing the ease of access to marijuana by underage patrons. So while the general population must be 21 years old or older to purchase a recreational cannabis, adults 18 years old and older who have a doctor's prescription for medical cannabis can also legally purchase cannabis at retail stores. Uh, anecdotes have pointed to ease obtaining a medical cannabis card, which have raised concerns about 18-year-old high school students having legal access to cannabis products, which they could then distribute to others. Um, to combat this concern, um, the applicant has voluntarily agreed to not sell cannabis to anyone under the age of 19, even if they have a valid medical cannabis prescription and that's been included in the conditions of approval. Um, another uh, mention in the appeal was the assertion that the proposed use is not in conformance with the AUP findings, specifically arguing that the use is in conform with certain general plan policies. So the subject parcel has a mixed use, medium density general plan designation. Um, this designation is intended to, intended to accommodate businesses that serve the general needs of the community, including retail, service, office establishments, et cetera. This being a retail use, it's consistent with, with that policy, or this, uh, this uh, designation, I should say. Um, the proposed use is consistent with the policies of the general plan, um, including um, the following listed here, 
as well as there are several other that are listed in the staff report. Um, the cannabis industry in Santa Cruz as a whole, which includes not just retail, but manufacturing, distribution, um, labs, retail, uh, benefits the general public providing additional high quality jobs within the city, um, consistent with some of these policies, including scientists and other technical positions. Um, the Hook would be one of two cannabis retail stores that serve the west side neighborhoods as well as visitors to the city. And the land use element and the economic development element, economic development element of the city of Santa Cruz general plan uh, lists goals and policies that support the proposed use at this location. Um, that said, the general plan's guiding principles express the city's commitment to education through our schools, education systems, and programs. Um, the appellants have expressed concerns about the proposed business due to its proximity to Santa Cruz uh, High School and Mission Hill Middle School. And opponents to the proposed use indicate that the normalization of cannabis use due to repeated exposure to business patrons and signage could result in increased use of cannabis among students. And such use would have implications on children's health and development due to the detrimental effects of THC on adolescents' brains, including heightened risk of anxiety, depression, and psychosis. <coughs> so while the proposed use is consistent with a number of general plan policies as previously mentioned, project opponents would suggest general plan inconsistencies with policies such as these listed here. Um, it could be argued that establishment of a cannabis dispensary in this general vicinity of schools is inconsistent with these policies, um, tempting juveniles into bad behavior and normalizing the use of cannabis through exposure to the, to the facility along their school route. Um, she also mentioned the project is located within the Mission Street Urban Design Plan um, area, which encourages retail uses such as this. Um, the vision of this plan is to reestablish Mission Street as a vibrant commercial corridor that recognizes and carefully balances its functions as both a state highway and local serving commercial district. Um, some of the goals of the Mission Street Urban Design Plan include enhancing economic vitality, pedestrian oriented uses, local serving. Um, and reduction of auto uses. So um, the project meets all of the goals of the Mission Street Urban Design Plan. So uh, in conclusion, the, the proposed cannabis retail use meets all of the objective standards laid out in the city zoning code. Um, that being said, subjective findings, as I mentioned, um, allow the city council additional discretion uh, to consider potential impacts the use could have on high school and middle school students, given proximity to the schools, um, and that, that key Mission Street pedestrian crossing. There are certainly merits to both arguments, um, and both sides present very valid points. Um, hence, staff recommends that the City Council consider the Planning Commission's approval uh, and the information, information provided, as well as the testimony tonight, uh, and make a determination to approve or deny the application based on one of the resolutions provided. Um, and as you've seen as part of your staff report, we provided two resolutions. Um, the approval resolution includes findings supporting the approval and um, includes conditions of approval. Uh, and then the denial resolution includes findings supporting a denial. And uh, I'm available for any questions. Mr. Payne, thank you very much for your presentation. Mr. Sykes, this will be your opportunity to open for 20 minutes. Are you Mr. Sykes? I am here for Mr. Sykes. My name is Melinda White, and I am a okay. parent. Well, wait a second. Oh. Where's Mr. Sykes? Where's the appellant? Are you an appellant? I am part of the appellant teacher and parent and doctor group. Are you you're a named appellant? Are you someone who filed the appeal? Well, I need somebody who filed the appeal. It was filed on behalf of a large group. No. <laughs> I mean, hold on just a second here. What? I hope we're going to hear from an appellant, not somebody who just wants to talk.
No, look here. Look here. Talk to me. Talk to me. The, count, the city attorney asked you a question. I just asked you to repeat your name. Oh, Melinda White. I also go by Mindy. I, I, she she is listed, listed mayor on the appeal. Okay. Uh, Please proceed. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Just so uh, we're very clear. Yes. You have 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, can I ask one question? Sure. You can. Uh, there are other people in our appellant group. Are they? Can we all speak? We are going to take. You have 20. Do it in 20 minutes. Then right. they'll otherwise they'll be recognized for two minutes at a time. Right. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, thank you for this time. Um, I am a parent. I'm also a physician. I represent a large group of educators and therapists and doctors that um, work with uh, kids, and we have significant concerns about this dispensary being in this location. We have no uh, dispute with legalized marijuana. When it's legal, it, it keeps it clean, it keeps it safe and accessible, and that's great. We also are not opposed to recreational use by adults. That is not the issue. Uh, we support WAM. I mean, WAM, I have huge respect for Valerie Corral and her organization and all that she has done. We are here specifically because of the location of this dispensary. There are a ton of kids that have to walk by it every single day to get to and from school, and there is evidence that this could be harmful. I am going to start, so um, I want to talk about, um, can you go back, uh, please go back to the first one, now the second one, thank you. So there is a lot of research that marijuana on a teenage brain is completely different than marijuana on an adult brain. The brain stops developing at age 25, so when it's used by a teenager, 14 to 25, it's much more devastating. And um, this point has been studied so much, hundreds of studies, and um, all of the organizations that uh, guide medical care and policy in this country uh, agree on that, okay? The um, marijuana stunts brain development. When it's used as a teenager, you don't develop the cognitive and physical um, assets and, and, and capacities that normal kids should develop. Uh, they don't develop uh, organizational skills, memory. It impairs their judgment, decision making, mood regulation. It disrupts sleep. It has eating patterns. It devastates a lot of normal brain functions. So the consequences is there are more accidents and injuries. There's more mental illness. There's more difficulty with relationships, school dropout, trouble with the law, and future uh, substance use disorders. So increased mental illness, there, depending on the study, there are tons of studies that show this, two to five times more depression and anxiety compared to non-users, up to four more times psychosis and bipolar-like uh, episodes, and increased suicidality. Even occasional use, and that can be once in the last year, has been shown to have these consequences. Frequent and occasional users both had similar rates of major depression and suicidality. Both were higher than non-users. Any marijuana use can have significant def cognitive deficits, lower GPA, and trouble with the law. The risk of addiction is high. So in most adults that use cannabis, risk of addiction or substance use disorder is about 9%. When someone starts as a teenager, it gets up to 17% when they are um, an adult. So we know there's actually a lot of research that shows the built environment plays a significant role in adolescent substance use. They studied this first with alcohol. So liquor store density around adolescents' homes has been correlated with more binge drinking. Then with tobacco outlets, they found it was uh, more stores that sold tobacco, more cigarette use among adolescents. Same thing with vaping stores. We know more stores that sell vapes, more kids uh, near a school, more kids are going to be vaping. Multiple studies have been done that show trends like these, and they all have the same conclusion that you, if you reduce access by limiting density and reducing proximity to schools, it can re lead to reduced use. And based on these trends, Oregon makes it, um, requires that dispensaries be at least 1,000 feet 
away from schools. There are good studies that show advertising either online or storefront signs also increase cannabis use. Two times the increased cannabis use between kids that saw the, the stores or the ads and kids that didn't. It also shows that kids um, perceive cannabis as less harmful and it increases their intention to use. So these trends have been sh played out in further studies that looks at dispensaries and we know that proximity to dispensary influences use. In Washington, adults that lived within 0.8 miles of a retailer had increased use. In Los Angeles, young adults who lived in neighborhoods with a dispensary also increased use. 11th graders in Oregon that had a school within a mile of a dispensary increased use. So we also know that this increased visibility reduces the perceived risks by the adolescents. So youth living in LA near dispensaries had more positive views about the drug. Eighth graders in Oregon had lower perceived harm of the cannabis. And there was a US study done over the last decade that showed perceived risk of harm of weekly cannabis use by adolescents dropped from 47% to 27%. So we are concerned that as perceptions of cannabis continue to improve, use is expected to also Im increase. So is cannabis use increasing? Well, national and state, there's a lot of evidence that it is. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry made a statement last year, teenage marijuana use is at its highest level in 30 years. Uh, there was a survey of 3 million kids in California around the years when it be recreational marijuana became available, also showed increased use. Recent survey came out, 17 studies, 200,000 kids, sevenfold increase in vaping of pot in school-age kids, up to 8.4%. This has been played out in other national surveys as well. And the average THC product has four times as, I'm sorry, the average cannabis product, four times as much THC. So this actually increases the adverse effects even more. Higher addiction rates, all, all brain, brain changes. Thank you. Um, so we have this California Healthy Kids Survey. So it was span the two years, 2019 to 2021. Those two school years were totally, um, altered by the pandemic. So these kids were not in their classrooms for over a year. They did not see their friends. There were no social gatherings. Even if they wanted to smoke pot, they probably couldn't get access. So we cannot rely on these, this data at all to actually indicate what our kids are doing. We don't have more recent data yet. So is marijuana use on the rise? Well, if you look at our schools, in the last school year, there were 91 incidents involving controlled substances. 95% of those were marijuana. And that was double what it was the school year before that. So we see these national trends of marijuana use increasing. We have parents, doctors, teachers having more um, exposure with kids smoking marijuana. And so we really need more data. We, we think that there's a chance that yes, marijuana use is rising, but we need more data before we can go on. We also know mental illness is increasing in Santa Cruz youth. So in 2021, 44% of Santa Cruz students that were surveyed had symptoms of depression. This was a 13% increase from 2019. In 2020, um, there were more kids hospitalized for mental illness in Santa Cruz County than in the state of California. We know when People are depressed. They tend to use um, drugs, alcohol to self-medicate. There is a much higher risk of substance use disorder down the road. And so basically multiple studies show that the frequency of use increases and the perceived risk decreases when there is closer proximity to a cannabis retailer. We know increasing use of marijuana in kids has devastating lifelong adverse effects. And we know we already have a mental health crisis. So we need to be very careful moving forward with where we place our dispensaries. And I will say on a personal note, 
I recommend marijuana to my patients for certain medical conditions, but they are adults. And for kids, it's a totally different ballgame because teens do not want to talk about when they're dealing with difficult emotions, and so they self-medicate. And they then their anxiety can worsen, depression worsens, they lose their coping organizational skills, and they never get that footing to get back into, into life. And that is so sad because that once that brain development period is gone, then you can never get it back. So I really feel strongly that we need to do everything we can to reduce marijuana exposure and use by our teenagers. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Derek Kindle, and I've been honored to serve as the principal at Mission Hill Middle School for three years. I do not have an issue with the hook, its commercial business, or its owner, Mr. Barry Essa, who will soon be a Mission Hill Middle School parent. Furthermore, I recognize the good work WAM does to support adults in need. I am here tonight because cannabis use is an issue for children on our campuses, and I must advocate for their education, health, and well-being. Today, serving students has grown beyond just the academic learning. Public schools now address everything from food and housing insecurity to di di digital citizenship, parent education, to hearing and vision testing, and much, much more. We embrace the opportunity to address these issues and serve our community, but our capacity is not unlimited. Schools are now the primary mental health support resource for most of our students, and we're proud to provide these supports. The issue is that as incidents of depression and anxiety have become more prevalent, so does self-medicating through substance use. The problem is that this life-changing medicine for adults exacerbates anxiety, depression, and mental health issues in the growing child brain. Given the rise on campus use, the location of this dispensary places an additional burden on schools by increasing access to cannabis. There is a pervasive idea that the fake ID, which we accept are used in bars, restaurants, grocery stores, and gas stations, will not be used in dispensaries. And it's been shared that there have not been any reports about fake IDs uh, in Santa Cruz dispensaries. But from personal experience, I can tell you that not reporting does not mean it's not happening. My family has owned and operated a restaurant for 44 years. And I can speak from personal experience that when fake IDs are found, we refuse service, the customer is turned away, and the matter is closed. We continue with business. Students confirm that fake IDs are prevalent, and students have admitted to successfully using them. We want parents, neighbors, and government leaders to understand how easy it is to obtain scannable fake IDs and to obtain age-restricted substances, and that putting an outlet steps from the high school and blocks from the middle school will make obtaining it during the school day that much easier. Good evening. I'm Michelle Poirier, principal at Santa Cruz High School. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, Emily's Bakery was for decades the place to go for muffins and other goodies. Generations of Santa Cruz High alumni know Emily's. And they also know how heavily trafficked the corner of Laurel and Mission is for Santa Cruz High School and Mission Hill students. So it shocked the Santa Cruz High School community to see the Emily's location becoming a cannabis dispensary. We know that the zoning ordinances allow it, but our worry is that the future as existence will create marijuana normalization and access to my 1,100 students. What we are seeing on campus is that kids' lives are full of stressors their parents didn't have to face, and they are misusing cannabis to address stress, anxiety, and depression. This is dangerous not only because modern cannabis products have astronomically higher levels of THC, but because students are relying on substances rather than uh, dealing, coping with their stress. As well, youth cannabis use can impede brain function and development and increase the risk of mental health issues. Minors self-medicating mask issues that should be addressed by our counseling and social emotional health staff. Students who feel the need to come to school high to manage their anxiety or mood are not only setting themselves up for academic ruin, 
They are learning to address issues with substances instead of learning how to manage their issues. With increased levels of THC modern, in modern cannabis, self-medication sometimes now leads to students collapsing on campus and turning up in emergency rooms. This self-medication has increased along with the normalization of use in our community. Santa Cruz City Schools 11th graders use marijuana at a rate higher than the state average, and these numbers are rising, up 21% last year from 16% in 2021 whereas the state average went from 11 to 12% in that same time. While our past county report, state reporting data has shown at times downward trends in use, this year we have seen more than double the instances of students under the influence of cannabis at school. I feel in these hearings that we're talking past each other. The Santa Cruz High School community does not oppose compassionate access to medical marijuana for those who suffer. We oppose the retail side being in daily close proximity to about 1,800 students. I share with parent leaders and medical professionals here tonight to ask you to support the well-being of our students. Thank you. Good My evening. name is Annette Olson. I am a Santa Cruz High parent and a land use professional. Uh, the Hook and Allies have presented our objections as moving the goalpost. They say it's unfair because the application meets all of the requirements, including the 600-foot setback to schools, and therefore should be approved. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of discretionary permits in general and the cannabis ordinance in particular. As the name suggests, discretionary permits require the application of discretion by the decision maker consistent with the values of the community as expressed in city policies and ordinances. The cannabis ordinance's stated purpose is to protect the community from the negative impacts related to commercial cannabis uses. It anticipates an application like this one, where a cannabis use is proposed near a school. It explicitly says that school and cannabis uses are incompatible. The heart of the cannabis ordinance is its findings. Findings are the legal basis for the decision tonight. Cannabis finding two and four specifically direct decision makers to consider schools and youth. The first part of finding two requires you to find that the proposed use will not adversely affect the health, safety, or welfare of the residents. As previously presented by Dr. White, the research tells us that proximity induces use and cannabis harms the adolescent brain. The second part of finding two requires that you find that the cannabis use will not be located within proximity of an incompatible use such as a children's school, daycare facility, or youth center. The finding says schools and cannabis uses are incompatible, and it uses the phrase within proximity, not 600 feet. This gives your council the discretion to approve a greater distance and tells us that the 600 feet is a minimum. This means that if you find that 1129 Mission is within proximity of the high school, then according to the finding, you cannot approve this application. Any common sense evaluation would find that 1129 Mission is within proximity of the high school. Cannabis finding four is similar, but it uses the phrase in the surrounding area. It requires that you find the proposed use is compatible with the sizes and types of other neighboring uses in the surrounding area, particularly those used primarily by persons under the age of 18. Finding two told us that the uses are incompatible, and we know that the vast majority of the student body is under the age of 18. This means that if you find that 1129 is in the surrounding area of the high school, you cannot approve this application. Again, any common sense evaluation would find 1129 mission to be in the surrounding area of the high school. In short, the code was written specifically to protect students from cannabis by keeping cannabis uses away from schools. And it's important to know that when people tell you that the 600 feet was litigated and discussed and debated, so too were the findings. They're in the same ordinance. This is consistent with the successful anti-tobacco legislation that keeps tobacco ads and re retailers away from kids. The city's ordinance requires tobacco retailers to be 1,000 feet from schools. This is because the built environment influences youth substance use and proximity matters. Weighing heavily on this decision will be its impact to WAM. Mr. Berryessa previously testified that WAM serves its patients through Treehouse, and in the past, WAM offered its products at Kind Peoples. So there are alternative locations for WAM. There is no alternative location for Santa Cruz High School, and the well-being of our youth should not be compromised for the well-being of WAM. Our kids are in a crisis. 
All of us who care about Santa Cruz youth have a role to play in addressing the crisis. We need allies and parents, medical and addiction professionals, school leaders, public health officials, and in our land use decisions. We ask that you follow the science and the city's policies and ordinances. Please prioritize the health and well-being of our youth over a single recreational cannabis retailer and deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add. Hold on just a second. It's not going to be taken from your time. Hold on just a second. I need to address the audience for a moment. Um, I'm going to say it again. This is more like a courtroom than it is going to the Civic for a concert. We don't need your applause, we don't need your boos, we don't need your fingers clicking, we don't need anything. We need you to extend courtesy to everyone who speaks. You have 38 seconds. Yeah, I just wanted to add all of my references are on the, on the end of my slide. So Thank all you. of those studies that I cited, there's a lot there. I, it's a lot to go through, but it's all included. Thank you. Mr. Berryessa, you have 20 minutes. Good evening. Good evening. Can we wait to start until the slides are up, please? You can go to the next slide, Money. Okay. Good evening. My name is Bryce Berryessa, and for nearly 15 years, I've been deeply involved in shaping sensible cannabis regulations in our county. As an elected board member of the California Cannabis Industry Association and founding and current board member of the California Cannabis Manufacturers Association, I've worked alongside the state to implement regulations after MCRSA and Proposition 64. I've also closely collaborated with both the county and the city of Watsonville to develop effective cannab cannabis policy that promote public health and safety. Next slide. Our organization has a decade-long history of operating legal, legal cannabis retail in this county with a flawless record of regulatory compliance. We're proud to be pioneers in the industry, working proactively with our local governments to establish transparent and safe practices. As a process-driven organization, we constantly adapt to ensure we meet and exceed the evolving regulations in this nascent cannabis industry. Next slide. Our partnership with WAM and our proposed operations directly align with the city's general plan. We share the city's commitment to supporting local businesses that prioritize community health, sustainable practices, and economic diversity. This project is a testament to our shared vision for a thriving and equitable Santa Cruz. Next slide. Our organizations have a deep commitment to the well-being of our community, especially our youth. We've actively engaged with organizations like United Way, promoting responsible cannabis use and safe storage through their Talk It Up, Lock It Up campaign. For years, we have provided lock boxes at cost to our customers to help ensure intoxicating substances are not accessible to children and pets in the home. We've partnered with the county and worked with them to secure grants for poly substance impaired driving campaigns, and we consistently deploy educational resources about safe cannabis use harm reduction, and providing information supporting parents on how to address and deter youth substance use. Valerie and I have been active with community prevention partners for several years, and we have each been awarded and acknowledged for our volunteer work with prevention organizations in the county. Our commitment to community extends beyond our business. It's a core value that we live by. Next slide. It's very important in this conversation, and we agree that our Santa Cruz students deserve a safe and healthy environment. Yet alarming gaps exist in our understanding of cannabis in our schools. Schools lack crucial data on where confiscated, confiscated cannabis originates, be it the black market, psychoactive hemp, the home, or legal outlets. Staff are untrained in distinguishing these sources, leaving us in the dark about the risks our children face. Furthermore, student surveys fail to address how they acquire cannabis. While we know that dispensaries are not selling to minors, as confirmed by the police department and the county cannabis licensing office, we must fully understand the pathways students use to access cannabis if we as a community are to effectively address cannabis use amongst minors. To truly assess the risks our youth face regarding accessing cannabis, 
It's time for comprehensive data collection and actual staff training. We must address these gaps to protect our children and promote informed policy decisions. Next slide. Let's turn to the data from our county's Healthy Kids Survey. Since legalization in 2018, coinciding with expanded dispensary access in our city, use substance use across the board is unequivocally down. Next slide. This positive trend is mirrored at Santa Cruz High, where usage, while leveling out in recent years, remains significantly lower than pre-legalization levels. This aligns with nationwide trends reported by the CDC, where teen cannabis use has consistently declined over the past decade. Next slide. Next slide. The appellants also mentioned that this evidence, uh, the, or this survey might be inconsistent given the fact that the pandemic happened in 2020 and 2021. And if that would be the case, then it should also be noted that the increase in uh, confiscated cannabis products in 2022 would naturally be higher than in 2021 when students weren't as active and on campus for the entire school year. Next slide. Recent studies, including two comprehensive analyses of nearly 1.1 million high school students published by the American Medical Association, along with research from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, consistently show that legalizing cannabis and expanding retail access has not led to an increase in youth cannabis use. In fact, some of these studies suggest that youth cannabis use has either declined or remained stable following legalization. Next slide. We know that legal dispensaries are not selling to minors, and now the data reinforces that legalization hasn't fueled increased youth consumption. This evidence underscores the importance of understanding the real pathways of access for our youth, as opposed to relying on outdated fears and assumptions. Next slide. A key concern raised this evening is that this location will normalize cannabis use among students. However, let's be realistic. Cannabis is already a part of our culture, present in media and everyday life. The cell phones in students' pockets expose them to far more temptations than a single monument sign with a green cross on Mission Street ever could. Our business prioritizes discretion with minimal signage and a design that ensures no transactions or products are visible from public spaces. Next slide. Another concern raised the proximity to student pedestrian traffic. Data collected from our security cameras, which meticulously track all pedestrian traffic, reveals that for the three weeks leading up to this meeting, commuters with backpacks during school commutes and lunch times accounted for only a tiny fraction of the combined Mission Hill and Santa Cruz high population. The total number of these pedestrians logged for the past three weeks would account for just 1.32% of the combined student population slide. Over this same period, total pedestrian traffic, meaning everyone that crossed that intersection that was not in a motorized vehicle, during these times, an hour before school, during the entire period of lunch, and an hour after school, wouldn't even account for 3% of the combined student body of both schools. Simply put, the data confirms that unlike other streets, this is not a major corridor for students traveling to and from school. Next slide. The proposed dispensary location is situated 850 feet from Santa Cruz High School, exceeding the required minimum distance by 250 feet, representing a 142% increase beyond the mandatory setback distance. Next slide. Santa Cruz County's cannabis guidelines established and refined over decades with broad community support have resorted in responsible dispensaries operating without negative impacts. Two existing dispensaries on bustling Ocean Street, frequented by families and tourists, are comparable in distance to sensitive use areas as our proposed location. Kind Peoples received a variance due to not meeting setbacks from parks, and Reefside operates without issue just 58 feet from Marianne's Ice Cream, which is extremely popular with minors. These businesses have shown that responsible operation is possible, even near areas frequented by those under 18. Given our history of compliance, we ask to be held to the same standards and precedents granted to these established businesses. Next slide. Our unwavering commitment is to be a pillar in this community, operating with transparency and proactive outreach. 
We've listened intently to the concerns that have been raised and have taken significant steps to address them. These include voluntarily not transacting medical cannabis sales to anyone under the age of 19 years old. Weekday operating hours that begin after school is in session as requested by the school district. We have made design modifications to ensure complete discretion from public view. We have reduced all proposed exterior signage down to a single monument sign and one green cross. We have elaborated on work that we've done in the past and updated that information with the creation of Safe Cannabis Net, an, ed an educational resource for the community. We've invested significantly in enhanced security measures, including live camera monitoring to deter unwanted activity and enhance neighborhood security. These actions are a testament to our dedication to being a responsible and respectful neighbor. We believe these compromises not only address neighbors' concerns, but also elevate the safety and security of our operation and everyone involved. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Alan Hopper. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I specialize in cannabis law and policy. Have done so for about 20 years now. Uh, I've submitted written um, comments and we will just briefly summarize those here. I want to leave um, some time for uh, Val Corral to, to speak um, as well. Um, I uh, have represented government, local governments uh, in uh, litigation concerning their um, cannabis regulations. I've advised local governments in enacting and drafting local cannabis regulations. I, um, in fact, uh, represented as co-counsel with Ben Rice uh, at the request of John Barrasoni, who was then the city attorney, uh, represented the city of Santa Cruz in litigation arising from the 2002 raid of, of Wham and the gardens. And uh, the city of Santa Cruz's participation in that litigation was significant because it gave rise to a claim that was successful that was based on the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution that prohibits federal government's improper interference with local governments. Uh, and, and the claim in that case was that the federal government chose to enforce uh, against WHAM the way that it did to send a message to local governments, to the state of California, to other states, um, that if you try to legalize cannabis in the face of federal prohibition, we will come after you. And that was improper. Um, and the city uh, stood up to the federal government, and, and that litigation, I think, uh, laid the groundwork for what became the Cole Memo, the Ogden Memorandum, and the eventual Department of Justice carve-out for local cannabis and, and state cannabis uh, activities in compliance with local and state laws, even if it violates federal law. Um, I, I share that history with you because uh, the significance of Santa Cruz and Wham it goes far beyond uh, our own community. It really does. Um, I also consulted with Dana McRae when she was county council in the early days of trying to put together the county's cannabis ordinance. And um, as I mentioned in my comments, my written submissions, it's, 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 it's a bit ironic because, uh, sadly ironic, I think, because there was language included in those local ordinance early days in the county that was intended to give the county discretion, broad discretion, to deny uh, an application based on public health and safety concerns. And that language was in there largely because they were trying to grandfather Wham in. And they didn't want other less scrupulous operators to be able to shoehorn themselves into an exception that was intended for Wham in light of Wham's long history of, of collaboration with the city and the county. Um, I also just um, briefly want to point out that, um, as, as you're well aware, uh, the ordinance that you have in place already has that 600-foot setback requirement. Um, the discretion that you're granted to otherwise deny has to be read in a manner that's consistent with the rest of your ordinance and doesn't give uh, the city unfettered discretion uh, to deny an application where all the other requirements are met. And, and finally, um, the, the one point I wanted to address is the fact that WAM is partnering here with the hook um, and with a, with a for-profit operation should not be held against WAM or the hook. I mean, I, I, there should be no suggestion that, 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 that WAM and this project shouldn't get the benefit of WAM's long history of work in this community based, because of that partnership. In fact, you know, I was one of the drafters of, of Prop 64. I was one of the attorneys on the drafting committee. We wrote that initiative um, and enacted that law. And one of the things we tried to do was to carve out a public interest, nonprofit licensing pathway for entities like WAM. Um, 
despite our efforts at the state level and despite the efforts of a lot of people around the state and in this community to protect WAM, the sad fact is that they've been left behind by this commercial cannabis economy. And that really the only way for WAM to survive really is this kind of partnership. And they can't partner with just anybody. It has to be someone who you know, adheres to their values and principles and understands the real reasons for, uh, for what WAM does. And they found that partner in, in The Hook and in Bryce Berryessa. And you know, they've gone to great lengths to make sure they comply with all of the requirements that are imposed by the city's ordinances. And uh, I would just encourage you um, to uh, deny the appeal, uphold the Planning Commission's findings, and grant the, uh, grant the request. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Corral. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Valerie Corral. Um, I'm the director of WAM Phytotherapies, and I want to thank you all, my community too. This has been, brought, the last months have been brought about a difficult uh, situation, even creating some hostilities in our community, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, you know, I won't pretend that this hasn't raised questions about the legal process and how politics can unravel 33 years of, of dedicated work and progress. Um, but really nothing can be taken for granted. So here we are. We're again challenged to address the same rhetoric that we fought so hard to dispel over the last three decades. And in fact, we are aware of the contributing factors that raise alarm among parents and among our community facing youth. And that awareness, we continue to share concerns in keeping our kids safe, to protect and to educate them, for they are every community's most precious gift. We don't argue that there's potential effects that are harmful. There's, there's no argument with that. But what we do argue is that we're a party to delivering cannabis to those youth. We argue that a child that walks by a sa in a safe way or any market that walks by a can of beer is going to want to drink it and that we should outlaw all access to viewing alcohol as well. We argue that, you know, of course we're going to, to continue to hold their interest, children's interest, and that of our community at the core of every action, doing exactly what we've always done. Still, without equivocation, it is at the heart of our work to care for those whose voices are quelled by pain. For, young, for youth that have a doctor's recommendation, who are facing cancers, who have epilepsies or intractable pain due to illnesses, we serve them, whether they're 8, whether they're 18, or whether they're 108 years old. We will not discriminate where suffering is concerned. If you need us, we're here for you. The two sites in the past that we have lost in the last six years speak very, very clearly to the ability for us to find a place to serve our members from. We have to have a home to do that. Kind Peoples no longer allows us to, no longer can work with us to serve our members. They have new owners. We've found no other organization that meets our, our values and which we feel is of the highest integrity. But here we are. We finally found the partners. They share our vision. And in this kind of madcap, crazy uh, avenue, the journey to serve the underserved and to help us sustain our efforts to do exactly that, now we're faced again with more challenges. And this has been, this has been hugely challenging. And I know it has been for you, too. And I know it's been for all of the people here in our community. This is a, this is a lot for us to take on. It's... it's we can't, well, it's been a, a huge challenge. There no, make no mistake that the real challenge is to mitigate pain and suffering. For above all other things, this is the greatest transgressor. And we can't fight it alone. It takes an entire village, each of us doing our part, working together to stave off the agony, as each day more people face illness and the financial constraints that it brings. Which brings me back to the importance of community. Whatever happens here today, we share this community with each other. And we share it with all of you, whether we're in agreement or not, we're still part of the same community. And that's one of the most profoundly important things that we have, how we meet each other, right? And how we work together. So, you know, you can't trust the promises that we have made over the past 33 years 
you can, you can trust that the promises that we have made over the past 33 years will not be compromised. We can, they haven't been and they won't be. Well, thank you for your time. And if any of you ever need help, we're here at your service. Thank you. Our partnership with WAM in this project embodies Santa Cruz values of health, safety, and sustainability, fulfilling key objectives of the city's general plan. We are committed to the highest standards of regulatory compliance, ensuring safe and responsible operations. This project is a testament to our deep love for Santa Cruz and our dedications to WAM's mission of serving the most vulnerable and our belief in creating meaningful beliefs for the community. We have barked on this journey in good faith, meeting every city criterion, confident in our investment because we adhere 100% to carefully crafted city rules and regulations. We are eager to continue collaborating with government, law enforcement, the community, including schools, as we move forward. We respectfully urge the city council to recognize the overwhelming community support and meticulous planning behind this project. We are people will allow us to move forward together for the betterment of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This would be the opportunity for the council members. This would be the opportunity for council members any initial questions you may have of staff. Let me see if there are any. We'll have an additional opportunity later. The vice mayor is recognized. My question's for SCPD. I don't know if Bernie or someone here from the police department's here. Police departments? Yeah. Mr. Butler, good after good evening, sir. Thank you. I was communicating with Chief Escalante. He should be available soon. So okay, maybe I'll just hold off and let somebody else go. My okay. All right. Councilmember Kalantar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, I do want to just take a moment and thank the appellants and the applicants for um, speaking and addressing um, addressing the concerns that have been brought forward by the members of the community. Um, I have some specific questions. Um, in staff presentation, um, there was a statement made that that we have advertise. Uh, excuse me, that part of the conditions for this project is that there is advertising and signage limitations. Could you please expand on what these limitations are? Well, we certainly have our sign ordinance, which has limitations on signage size. Um, and I think we do also in our cannabis ordinance, there's certain limitations on advertising as well. Um, if you give me a little time, I could probably look okay. it up and give, it, get, give you more specifics. And, and I bring that up um, because earlier we had a, another item where we were looking at the framework in its entirety. And, and I mentioned that there's the Public Health Institute has a scorecard. And we scored zero on advertisement um, towards youth a, a, as a community, not for this project. So I am just um, wanted some additional clarification on what our local policies are on advertisement towards youth and what those conditions are for this specific project. Um, Another question I have, and maybe this is, uh, I need to wait for um, our police chief. I'm just wondering, um, we used to have a prevention plan in place for tobacco, alcohol, um, and in doing decoy and sting operations. So um, if, if maybe the city manager or the chief, when he comes, can speak to uh, what our prevention plan is now, do we conduct decoy sting operations um, at, at all of the outlets, cannabis, tobacco, and alcohol. I can take a first crack at that, Councilmember Calentari Johnson, that I'm sure that Chief Escalante will have more to add. But um, in 2023, uh, the police department was successful in applying for one of the tobacco prevention grants. Mm -hmm. uh, that window is opening again for 2024, and we intend on applying again. Uh, we think that that funding stream could be used for both cannabis and tobacco prevention efforts. So we will, we will be looking at opportunities to leverage it in that way. And I think there's an opportunity for us to uh, more proactively work with our prevention partners um, here in the county on expanding that to alcohol as well. So taking a comprehensive approach as we look at prevention efforts for both cannabis, tobacco, uh, and alcohol when it comes to protecting our youth. 
But we don't have an active program currently. We're hoping to implement one. Is that correct? We currently have a tobacco prevention grant that we're that we're implementing as we speak for this current fiscal year. Okay. We plan on applying for one more for 2024. That window opens uh, soon. To expand it to cannabis and alcohol. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I have one more question for right now. Um, there, um, uh, Mr. Berryessa, I believe. Um, put up a slide around the um, corridor um, and, and the, the footprint and the, and the traffic. I'm just wondering um, if public works staff or someone in planning could just speak to that corridor and, and maybe when the time is appropriate, I'd like to ask just the methodology of conducting that, gathering that data. I don't know if the time is now, but. Um, I did find the information regarding signage. Um, Oh, I can't read that. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if I can Even with my glasses. Uh, increase it. Uh, but it says basically all signage and advertising shall comply with the state of California business and professions code sections, et cetera, et cetera, and any modifications or relocations of these code sections. In addition, any form of advertisement or signage that includes pricing of cannabis and cannabis products, details related to specific cannabis products or photography or graphics of the cannabis plant or cannabis products is prohibited except on a dedicated business website accessible only through an age gate portal. Other than the above noted restrictions relating related to pricing, special cannabis products, photography and graphics signage shall be regulated by part four, advertising devices, signs and billboards of this chapter, community design. Um, the above noted restrictions related to pricing specific cannabis products, photography and graphics apply to consumer advertising and signage do not apply to direct business to business advertising that is not available to the general public. So I think it expands beyond that. But yeah, it's basically the idea is that they're limited to basically one sign, wall sign, monument sign, and they're not supposed to have any other cannabis related products, pricing, images on the outside of the, that can be visible um, from the Okay, so and this is our general policy, not specific to this project. This is a performance standard that's in our cannabis ordinance. I see that applies to this project. Correct. Okay. Yes. Well, later on, I'd be I'm curious to explore why we got a zero by Public Health Institute on our advertising. So, what is there? What do they recommend, and what is lacking in ours? Um, but that's maybe for a later conversation. So, yeah, I wonder if planning or Public Works could just speak to d defining a, a major corridor. I was just curious about, and if that's not. Um, available to us right now, that's fine. When you say a major corridor, I mean, in terms of Mission Street corridor and... There was a very intriguing slide around foot traffic and study that was done around foot traffic. So I, I'm not sure if we have a definition of what defines that. And maybe that's getting too in the weeds. Um, so we can save that. I'm sure others have questions. Thank you. Let me go back. Uh, Chief Escalante is with us now. The person who asked the council member who asked the question about the chief, please rephrase your question. The chief is here to answer it. Mayor, I think the city manager responded about decoy and sting operations. Um, Chief Escalante, I was just asking what programs we have in place, and, and the city manager um, responded. But if you wanted to add to it, please go do ahead, do that. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, the City Manager was accurate. We are currently participating in the tobacco grant, and we uh, we do uh, daily inspections, uh, and those uh, operations also uh, will include decoy operations as well. Uh, the focus right now is on tobacco and not so much the alcohol. Thank you. Other questions by Council Members? The vice mayor is recognized. Um, my first questions will be for you, Chief. Um, you said you do daily inspections? Is that what I just heard? Yes, we have a, a community service officer that is assigned to that detail full time. Okay. Uh, and that is all he is doing. And so a lot of it is education and prevention and, and educating not only the public, but also educating the, the merchants, uh, the, the business owners. So. Um, and, and then that also includes collaboration with with county, uh, and we've we've attended many different events as far as education and prevention. 
And that's with alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis? Uh, no. Right now, the focus is tobacco. Got it. Okay. And um, I saw in the staff report, and it was mentioned tonight, that there were no calls to service for fake IDs at cannabis dispensaries. Um, how many calls for fake IDs do you have in other retail establishments? Uh, most of the time, the, the businesses do not call us. Uh, they confiscate the IDs and they either turn them into us later on, um, but they don't necessarily call us when the act is, is occurring. So um, we do annual inspections of the uh, cannabis businesses in town. Um, and a few of the retailers have confiscated a, a low number of fake IDs, but they did not call us when the act was, was occurring. And then just one more follow-up is that how often do you get calls for youth under 21 that are stoned or drunk or in other ways intoxicated? And like, what would be a process for that? And what kind of records would you keep for that? Or how would we report that data? Um, so in other words, kind of a call for service for public intoxication for somebody that's under, under 21 or underage. Yeah. yeah. Under 18, under 21. Um, well, if they're under 18, then we usually try to get a hold of a parent, um, and turn the custody over to the parent. Uh, if they're an adult, then if they're unable to care for themselves, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or a combination of both, then they would go to the sobering center. Um, and or the jail, depending on the circumstances. And could you say, like, an average under 18, like, what kind of reports or calls that the police department gets to handle something like that? Yeah, I, I don't have that, that information readily available. Uh, it, it's not that frequent, um, but I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how many um, juvenile arrests for public intoxication we've, we, we do a Year. You wouldn't arrest, you would call the, the parents, right? That's what you're saying. Well, ultimately they would be arrested, but we would turn the, the, the custody of the child over to the parents. Juvenile Hall will not keep them. They'll just call the parents. So it's just more efficient for us to call the parent directly. Um, and then ultimately the juvenile courts deal with them and the family regarding the circumstances. Okay. Uh, yeah. Please. Uh, just it, it's interesting to um, to think about the the question of enforcement and and what's happening um, with law, with law enforcement in and youth in our community. And so I wanted to follow up. It may not be a question that can you can answer, but um, do you get calls for service to schools in the city um, and? And how are those handled? I, I mean, I, I imagine I, I saw one that was not related to a, a marijuana or an intoxicated child recently, and so I know that there are calls for service. And the principal slash vice mayor was out there, um, so I know it happens. But for this this purpose, um, are, do you get calls when students are say greening out? I've just learned of this term um, in uh, school on campuses. <laughs> Yes, we, we have a school resource officer that is assigned to both high schools and, and junior highs uh, full-time. Um, and so, um, yes, the administration at all those campuses, including our elementary schools, have uh, his number on speed dial, and uh, we do respond. Um, I can't necessarily say how many of those are cannabis-related. I would say most of them are not. Most of them are, are more acts of violence or just acting out. Um, not related to, to cannabis, uh, you know, specifically. Other questions at this time? Uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, late last week uh, at a conference call with uh, Ms. Willard from the county of Santa Cruz who works in the area of... of um, prevention and so on. Uh, also on that call was a Mr. O'Brien who, as I understand it, is a assistant or associate or deputy superintendent of the city school district. I'm not sure of the precise title. Um, 
in that meeting uh, that at least one other council member was on, a question was asked if uh, either the county or the school district had data with regard to how youth do, uh, underage youth, either in high school or middle school, obtain uh, marijuana for those who do. Uh, Ms. Willard was kind enough late yesterday to send a document which indicated, uh, which is based on an applied survey research document that says that, and this will add up to more than 100% because it's a question of where do you get it. So you might get it multiple places. So the most frequent was from friends. at 60%. At 40% was buy it from somebody else. 20% uh, was at parties. 21% uh, was from friends at their home without the parents' knowledge. 12% was growing it. 10% um, was from relatives other than parents and siblings. I'm wondering if you have had any data submitted to you that either supports or, or, or is contrary to that data. I haven't received any data to that extent, no. Secondly, uh, in that same conversation, the gentleman, Mr. O'Brien, when asked, does the school district have any data which correlates student use with obtaining marijuana from either a dispensary or a retail outlet? The gentleman said he did not have any such data. I'm wondering if you have any other source of data on that question. I do not. Thank you. This would be the opportunity for anyone to address us for up to two minutes in time. So we'll do this, make sure everybody understands. We'll start with somebody online, uh, in line, then we'll go to somebody online, then we'll do in line, then we'll go online. We'll toggle back and forth. We'll start with you, sir. Good evening. You. Welcome. Nice uh, to see thank you again, you. sir. Uh, good evening, Mayor Kelly and mem Mayor Keeley and members of the City Council. There we go. My name is Howie Schneider, and uh, I'm a California ma uh, licensed marriage and family therapist. I've worked with many families, and I'm familiar with teenage marijuana use. I can assure you our school-aged children are not obtaining marijuana from our highly regulated licensed dispensaries because the statistics I found, which are very easy to find online, are very similar to yours, Mayor Keeley, at the National Institute of Health. All I did was I Googled where are teenagers getting marijuana. Close to two-thirds are obtained by teens from friends who eat, purchase it on the illegal black market. About uh, almost another third is purchased directly from illegal drug dealers. And then the rest is obtained from relatives. Nothing about licensed dispensaries. Um, there's never been a single accusation, as we know, of wham or hook dispensary providing marijuana to teens. Uh, you know, if you look at your ID, your license or your identification, this is not something you can scan and get away with. Maybe you can in a grocery store, but certainly not at a licensed dispensary. There's watermarks on here that can't be scanned. There's raised, embossed dates of birth on here that can't be scanned. So, you know, the idea that they're using scanned IDs is not going to work in a licensed dispensary. Um, over 30 years ago, Santa Cruz made a mistake when Valerie Corral was arrested by the police department. Later on, you certainly made up for it by uh, supporting her case against the federal government when she was arrested again. You know, it's really important that the city council not make a mistake again and get wham, you know, banned from the city. Um, and I'd like to ask the representative from the planning commission to maybe, if, you know, you put up a map of where the areas are. It's fast. I more. Thank you. Finish your sentence or take Thank a you. moment. You know, uh, where are the areas that dispensaries can be located? You didn't actually show the map, though, of where they are located. We'll be glad to do that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. We'll take the first person online. Person online, welcome. We'll be glad to take your testimony. Yeah, okay. <laughs> wow, this is good. Hey, it sure seems from the letters that there's an amazing number of people that took the time to advocate for this weed dispensary admission, even though, of course, they could have gone to many other places in town to get weed. 
Anyway, the staff did a superb job of summarizing the arguments on both sides, and the proposed business has certainly jumped through all the existing hoops, and moving the goalposts doesn't seem fair. I will add, though, my opinion that anything that influences students to smoke weed is not a healthy thing for their sake to do, and it's a real consideration. In the process of growing up, children must increasingly grow out of their dependence on their parents to become independent and have a self-aware identity as adults. Part of this process of achieving an independent self-identity involves an intermediate step of belonging to groups with group identities, which then become part of their growing self-identity. Normally, these have the rewards of more parental independence and separation, a sense of group belonging, and that can become part of their burgeoning self-identity that comes from membership in groups. Most groups have personal growth achievement requirements to become a member, but others, like criminal gangs and doper cliques, admit anyone have no real personal growth requirements or necessity. They do nothing for personal development. There are some sort of a personal growth stress escape coping mechanism with no real productive personal growth path. So I totally get it why so some uh, community members don't want weed dispensaries near schools. Children can stay in these uh, zero personal growth groups their entire school experience as a comfort zone, but no useful door is going to open to them for more normal, expansive, and productive, indoor responsible futures by being in them. As a real uh, close to the summer of love high school student of 68 to 72, I smoked a lot of weed and more and feel it may have damaged my life outcome somewhat. Life is complicated to navigate to a haze that's mostly up in smoke. Thanks. Chief Escalante, I'm not sure you need to remain on here. Uh, we'll, this is going to go on for a while. If we have a question, we'll reconnect with you uh, later in the hearing. Thank you very much, sir. Good evening. Oh, excuse me. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is. The council meeting. Thank you. My name is Suzanne File, and I had polio as an infant, and now I have post polio syndrome, which causes ongoing uh, paralysis and 24 7 pain. Cannabis is one of the few medications that works to treat these symptoms. In 1996, I joined WAM after the passage of 215. Shortly thereafter, I joined the board of directors, and we worked with the city council, board of supervisors, law enforcement, to help make sure that there was safe you know, access for patients. And despite all that, in uh, September 5th, 2002, we were raided by the DEA and I woke with five assault rifles pointed at my head. And it was a terrifying experience, but I kept working towards changing the laws. We all kept working and the laws have changed. They've now allow dispensaries. There's many in Santa Cruz. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to take advantage of a lot of that. Um, and it's been a difficult time for us. Um, I raised three boys here in this town. One's an attorney, one's a builder, one graduated with honors in business. All were exposed to my cannabis use growing up. And Kids are smarter than you think. <laughs> they don't, just because they walk by a liquor store, that doesn't mean they're gonna want to drink or buy cigarettes. It's the same thing with cannabis. Um, WEM really needs this opportunity to partner with The Hook so that we can continue to serve the most sickest and vulnerable in our community. And I would really appreciate if you guys would allow us to do that and continue our work so that WEM doesn't die and our patients continue to be served. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. We'll take the next person online. Person online, good evening. Welcome to the city council meeting. There is nobody with their hand raised Nobody right with now. their hand up. Good evening, sir. Hello, um, Mayor Cayley, uh, members of city council. I'm Arnold Leff, a retired physician. I have previously sent you uh, uh, some of my relative experience. As you know, I've been your health officer as well as a practicing uh, physician specializing in HIV medicine and addiction issues, among others. I've been on the staff of the White House Drug Abuse Office, as well as consultant to the Department of Defense, and was appointed by the governor uh, for the, the advisory committee uh, for the Bureau of Cannabis Control on a state level. Um, 
Others have discussed Wham's credibility, so I will not belabor it. Wham is not just any cannabis dispensary. I do not, nor does Wham, support adolescent use of cannabis except in certain uh, medical conditions. I appreciate that the appellants have provided evidence of the possible dangers of cannabis use, and I think we all uh, understand that. Um, hopefully, we're not going to uh, relitigate, if you will, of those issues. Evidence has been provided to you that supports my contention that there is no significant impact of cannabis dispensaries on adolescent cannabis use. A recent study um, uh, on uh, medical marijuana uh, basically showed no direct correlation between the location um, and um, adolescent use, I believe, based on the available evidence, you really have every legitimate reason to deny the appeal, and I urge you to do so. Thank you, Dr. Leff. We'll take the next person online. We do have someone online at this point, so we're going to take them, then we'll be glad to hear you. Person online, good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Dr. Keeley and City Council. Lira Filippini here. And I'm very concerned about what denying WAM's ability to open at this location, a location that meets all of our municipal codes, signals to our society, as well as specifically to our youth. I actually look at this concern driving this appeal from a little bit of a different perspective. Kids are already extremely exposed to substance use and they're already extremely easy. And it's actually critically important to our youth that they are aware of the medical and compassionate care side of the cannabis industry to the historical fight for it as a legal right, and to what amounts to a pivotal legacy created by WAM and the city of Santa Cruz, historically working together to make it happen. If WAM crumbles because they can't recoup the investment they've put into this location with this partner, it would mean the fifth and last dispensary slot available in the city, their recreational business instead of WAM. What does that signal to our society? What does that signal to our youth? Only five dispensaries are allowed in the city of Santa Cruz, so if WAM is allowed to open in partnership with The Hook at this location, the last dispensary slot available will be filled by this cherished organization, allowing them to continue their compassionate care of seriously ill people who actually need cannabis medical need help affording it. This would signal that we support medical cannabis and help facilitate compassionate care. Exposing our youth to this side of the cannabis industry is exactly what we need to restore a little balance in a world in which they are already exposed to endless recreational drug paraphernalia through the media and social media and their friends and where black market availability is rampant. So again, I think it is important passionate care and medical and its history as well, our history. Let's restore a little balance while doing the right thing for Wham and the critically ill who rely on them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, and my name is uh, Nancy Kensinger. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, I've been with Valerie for many, many years. I've had seizures. I Right now, my mobility is a problem. My back, um, I'm wearing a medical boot, and I'm falling apart. Thank God for this woman. I'm asking you to please reconsider this location because it's very hard for me to get all the way out to Soquel in order to pick up my meds. And this would be so helpful. And uh, I, I believe that you should allow Valerie, this is one of her big dreams. And it's going to continue regardless. Her help like she said, she doesn't care if you're nine or 99. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bush, someone else online? Oh. Mr. Dodge, good evening. Nice to see you, sir. Pleasant good evening, Mayor. Thank you for good allowing evening. me the opportunity to be able to speak tonight. Um, I wanted my name, for those that don't know, my name is Daniel Dodge Sr., I might add. Um, I've been... 
Um, my family's had eight over eight generations here in this community. I am a proud Mission Hill Matador and a graduate of Santa Cruz High Go Cards. As a former elected official, Watsonville, that always got me into trouble. And they always tell me that I'm not from Watsonville. But that being, that being said, uh, I wanted to address the project along the Highway 1 corridor. I come today to be able to speak on behalf of that project in support of the project. Um, I am on the Planning Commission of the City of Watsonville. Some people say I kind of live there. I've been on there for many years, active in uh, the whole process of being able to bring uh, dispensaries and creating ordinances uh, inside the city of Watsonville. And I um, really want to be able to um, speak tonight on two things. One, responsibility. The hook has shown, and their owners have shown that they're a responsible business. We welcome them into the city of Watsonville. They're involved in the community of Watsonville. They, they've asked everything that we've ever thrown in front of them. Um, I also wanted to be able to mention, I, I, I learned it from my granddaughter. I use Wikipedia on a regular basis. And so definition of an angel is a person of exemplary conduct or virtue. I'm, I've only met Valerie a couple of times over the last, well, actually, maybe not even this century. but. I have seen the work that WAM has done to be able to help veterans in my family, to be able to treat them when no other medications were able to work. So again, I ask you to support this project. Um, there's many others who can speak uh, to uh, the new prohibition that's going on, but when you have responsible owners and, and medical need, it's a win-win, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Do you have one? We've got uh, we've got another person online now, and then we'll be right with you, sir. Person online. Good evening. Welcome. Person online. Good evening. Oh, hi. My name is Grant Palmer. I'm the co-CEO of Canna Cruz. Tonight, I'm in here in support of my competitors of Wham and the Hook. Uh, they deserve to be treated fairly by the government. This project is in a qualified location and not too close to schools as defined by Santa Cruz law. The reefer madness not nonsensical statistics presented by the school district are correlative and not causative in nature. Psychosis, violence, and blacking out are not known effects of cannabis. There's also no evidence that kids get cannabis from dispensaries. If that ever does happen, then the schools need to call the police so we can cooperate them with them on the investigation, which we would all happily do. Um, typically, kids get their cannabis from the illicit market and, and drug dealers. Um, please vote on the facts of this project and not just on an, an antiquated drug war scare tactics. Thank you for your time. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Craig Reinerman. I'm a professor of sociology and legal studies at UCSC. I've done research and taught classes on drug use and drug policy for over 30 years. I presented my research at lots of conferences uh, across the country and uh, internationally. And uh, I have to say that WAM is lauded as a model of professional well-run marijuana dispensaries. And Valerie Corral is treated as a hero in virtually all these conferences and has been for years. On the proposed uh, rule change, first, the premise is really incorrect. Mere visual proximity poses no risk to our kids. There's no advertising, no smoking at a sidewalk cafe, no big neon marijuana leaf in the front. There's um, no reason to think that walking past a regulated dispensary will make young people more likely to use. And please remember that street dealers don't ask for ID. Dispensaries always do. They have all of their incentives lined up to make sure that they are rigorous about that. When Proposition 215 years ago first put medical marijuana on the ballot, there were a bunch of wild claims about increased availability leading to an epidemic of use, marijuana use among young people. That epidemic did not happen. Indeed, marijuana use among California youth actually declined for many years after dispensaries opened across the state of California. I had, uh, years ago, a major research grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, to study marijuana use in the Netherlands, which was then the only 
a uh, place that allowed legal sales. Uh, there are three or four hundred cannabis outlets in a country the size of Connecticut, uh, and yet the prevalence of marijuana use among Dutch youth is half of what it is in the United States. Availability is not destined. Thank you. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? Okay. Good evening, next person. Who's willing, next person? Good evening, welcome, nice to see you. Hello. Um, my name's Valerie, and this is my s autistic son, Kai. Hi. Um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak in behalf of Wham and Valerie Carell. Um, I can't begin to tell you how much they have her uh, CBD, THC tinctures have helped his seizures. Um, he has a Stanford neurologist. We've done every single test possible, even sedation, MRI, all of them are normal, and none of the uh, pharmaceutical medicines, uh, he isn't able to take them. So my only option that's been working is uh, uh, Valerie's uh, uh, special formulated neural uh, CBD THC tinctures, which luckily he likes C uh, Starbucks brownies, and so I'm able to precisely measure it out onto little cubes of those to give it to him because <laughs> otherwise it's impossible to get him to eat anything he doesn't want. But anyway, um, it, and for me being a single mom, Valerie's compassion has just been a godsend. And my son, he doesn't really communicate, but for some reason he really loves Val Valerie also. He gives her lots of eye contact and lots of smiles. And, and um, I'm just so grateful for for her and her compassion and love and her expertise with dealing with grand mal seizures. Um, that's all. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you, young man, for coming in. Nice Thank to you. see you, sir. Thank you very much. All right, do we have anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good evening, okay, person online. There's nobody with their hand raised. Right. Nobody with their hand up. Good evening, sir. I'm doing it from here. You want to speak? It's your turn. Good evening. My name is Gavin Kogan. I am uh, representing cannabis uh, folks as a lawyer since about 2008. I've co-founded a number of companies. I'm also a co-founder with Bryce Berryessa of the California Manufacturers Association, um, promulgating testing before the state was requiring testing. So we've been in the fight to try to get uh, responsible cannabis out for quite some time. In that body of the Cannabis Manufacturers Association, our biggest issue is illegal cannabis after hemp products, high THC hemp products. That's the biggest problem, and I'll bet, I will bet that the problem at the high school is those products, not products obtained from a legal dispensary. That's supported, I have the great fortune of having two young boys who are no longer teenagers. And that's, I asked them, where do you guys, I'm, this is the common modern world. We know that they have access. Where do you guys find this? Where does it show up? It follows that report, parties, friends. Is it ever a dispensary? No. Why? Because kids with fake IDs don't go to places where they're at risk of having it taken. Simply put. The other thing I want to say is this. This dispensary is 825 feet from it is 825 feet from the proximate zone. The city is, or the school is saying 1,000 feet is their goal. This whole fight is over 175 feet? That seems silly to me. That's not going to make the difference of whether or not these children are impacted by cannabis. Where the real lesson happens is a macro issue at home and in mass media, not the location of a dispensary. That's just my opinion, but I thank you for, for, for listening to me. Thank you so much. Anyone else online? Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. It's pretty high, sorry. Um, good evening, members of the City Council. Although we see the green papers from the many warm supporters here, unfortunately, we don't get to see the large population of minors that are going to be affected by the decision the Council will consider today. 
it was made very clear at the beginning of this uh, here meeting that this meeting is not about WAM. So I re kindly and respectfully request that you keep that in mind. I'm here as the mother of a Santa Cruz High student, West Side resident, and longtime Santa Cruz resident. I have skin in the game, just like other parents, school organizations, West Side residents, standing together in opposition to this location for the dispensary. Close to 1,000 signatures of local residents were collected in opposition to this location of the dispensary. The legality of the licensing is not an issue of whether you can, but if you should, they can do it, should they? It's different. I'm an attorney and I work with juvenile dependency cases. I see firsthand every day in my practice the effects of drug use, including but not limited to marijuana, and the dysfunction it creates in families, in teens, and I deal with juveniles a lot, trust me. Um, and additionally, I talk to so many teens, as, as well as my own children, someone, which one is calling me right now? <laughs> Uh, I talk to teens all the time, and they can actually buy weed from other teens, which is provided by adults. They get really good stuff that adults buy at dispensaries and later pass on. As a matter of fact, kids can go on Snapchat and have the drugs delivered to their homes. And anyone pretending this is not happening, they don't have kids in Santa Cruz High. I can guarantee you that. Um, um, Let's be clear, dispensaries support recreational use as, um, as well as an underground economy of drug sales based on what I've known from other teams. This business did not develop overnight. It won't go away overnight. This is not about where does it start, it's about where does it end. Um, Santa Cruz chapter, city chapter 6.91030 regulates the licensing and sales and allows Thank sales you. of online marijuana. WAM can get it Thank that way. You. Okay, and a little note here for everybody. You have two minutes. When you get to hear that sound, if you want to finish your sentence, that's fine. That'll take you one or two seconds. 17 seconds is abusing the privilege. Welcome. Thank you first for the council for uh, listening to our statements. Uh, my words probably aren't uh, uh, up to par, but uh, I'm coming uh, from someone that does smoke marijuana. Uh, I went through the D.A.R.E. program. Uh, I feel like the school uh, institutes are doing their job. It, sound, it seems like from the numbers we saw, doesn't look like they're doing their jobs correctly. Um, I guess from the uh, uh, last but not least, I think you're, uh, the, st the stemming from the issues is, uh, comes from the uh, parents and at home, uh, not uh, the issues here uh, uh, stemming from uh, what, what you guys are uh, having issues with. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much, and have a good one. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Good evening. Welcome. Hi. My name is Dr. Suzanne Lerner. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm grateful to the city council, the school board, the principals, the parents, and the supporters of WHAM. I think really why we're here is for the kids, all of us. The reality is when people self-medicate, it's because they're stressed. Even the slides were saying these statistics are pre-pandemic. We know that the kids are needing all of us to do more, not less. That said, we need programs in the school to help reduce stress reduction, to help people learn how to say no to peer pressure. Going after WHAM is not going to solve the problem of self-medication. As adults, we know how stressful the past few years have been. Imagine with the kids and their crucial social connections having to deal with being isolated at home with very stressed parents. Yes, they're self-medicating. I, I want to invite all of us as a community to be acting with the kids, looking how the schools can be supported in helping these kids. But going after WHAM is really misguided. And so I, I speak in support of WHAM and in support of the kids. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Welcome.
Good evening, sir. Hi, my name's Aaron. I've been resident of the West Side for decades. I've got two children who grew up in Santa Cruz and are at Santa Cruz High. Um, I shared the shock expressed of have, hearing that the dispensary would be opening uh, so close to the school and the location where my daughter used to go very regularly for her lunch breaks. It is, it is a frequented area. It's part of the school zone, I would say. Um, I don't know what happened. If, if, if a ball got dropped and alerting the community about this before things got so far down the road, it feels like the city council is painted into a quarter where you're having to choose between our children and WAM, which is you know, helping people with medical needs. And I would just uh, exhort you to try to find a third way, try to find another solution that protects our children and protects the interests of people with the medical needs. Um, I have heard some various arguments back and forth about our dispensary is actually harmful to our youth being <coughs> proximate to schools. I mean, this seems to be established a state regulation about this, that it's, it's a question of the distance, the 600-foot distance, wherever that came from. I'm a physicist. It's not a law of physics. It says the influence of the, of the dispensary ends at 600 feet. You know, 800, I heard it was pretty small dif difference to the 800-something feet. So it's, it's a question of discretion of the community, of the city council, of is this particular location part of where you feel like we need to have our kids protected from that influence, which is agreed by state regulations. So I'll just um, close and just saying, um, you know, ask the city council members to think about your legacy as you look back years from now. Where do you want, what decision do you want to made here? Um, how do you, how did you want to protect the kids or let this uh, dispensary be in the heart of our city right next to the schools? Thanks for your attention. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I wanted to say a big thank you to every council member here for your service to the public. I'm Manuel Lawrence. Um, I'm a twin dad um, of two five-year-old girls. And I wanted to tell you a story. I was 16 years old, and I was as stupid as one can be when you're a 16-year-old. And I had a good, very good friend. His name is Marty. And Marty, he's still my friend. And um, he was 18 years old, he had a driver's license, I didn't. So he promised me um, to take me out um, to a club. And so we hopped in his car and, um, well, Marty, he smoked cannabis. And um, he lost control of the car and the car came to a stop. And that was, I sat on the passenger seat, probably two or three feet um, away from a tree that was very close to me. So the very fact that I'm standing here was um, pure luck. And um, I would say, and that's how I want to close, um, protect our children from happening something um, that happened to me in this case, where I just needed pure luck um, in order to survive. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alec Dixon. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of SC Laboratories, a uh, cannabis testing analytical laboratory. I've been uh, operating at Santa Cruz uh, since 2009. Um, I'm very uh, integrated in the public health and safety side of uh, testing for the cannabis plant and the, the intersection between food, agriculture, medicine. And uh, I just wanted to speak up for um, WAM and uh, the hook and how much they uh, are beyond exemplary in kind of their dedication to public health and safety and producing products to serve patients, communities in need that uh, exceed food standards and testing for water, you know, across a lot of areas in the nation. And um, I wanted to reiterate uh, the fact that Valerie Corral really is an angel in the service that she's done and helped to establish medical cannabis globally. Uh, to bring healing in this great time of need where systemic inflammation and illness and chronic disease and cancer and all of the different conditions that in so many ways really come down to the intersection between agriculture and pharmaceutical medicines that are widely prescribed. I didn't hear anything about how widely uh, abused um, Adderall and Ritalin and uh, amphetamines and other psychotropic drugs that are circulating through high schools are that are widely prescribed and some of the biggest issues and epidemics in the communities these days. Um, but again, uh, Valerie Caravilli is largely across the globe recognized as Mother Teresa of Cannabis in, in her life's work, dedication, and service to the sick, the poor, and the terminally ill. And uh, when legalization of cannabis came about, you know, really the first thing that was ditched was compassion, which is the work that WAM did to help establish this great plant and the potential it has to help heal those are uh, our brothers and sisters of this planet. And um, 
this Santa Cruz had such a pivotal place uh, in the global cannabis story to help really bring this plant forward. And uh, it'd be ashamed for WAM not to be able to really make the uh, profound impact on this planet and the plant and Santa Cruz community like uh, WAM has always done, but in a way that's been limited. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We're going to take the next person online, then we'll be right with you. Person online, good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello, um, am I online? Yes, you are. Hi, my name is Sasha DeFoy, and I have been a WAM member for um, a decade. I, it's been a while, and I'm a quadriplegic, and I uh, graduated from UCSC, and I couldn't have done all of that without the use of cannabis because I have a lot of chronic pain and anxiety issues. And Valerie's been a big part in helping to provide me medicine. Not only that, I can call Val anytime and she's there for me. When I had to go into the nursing home, she took my cat for a little while. So she's really there for the people in our community and we need to be there for her. There's no way that the kids are gonna get access to the marijuana at the dispensary and even if they did they're going to smoke whether they get it at the dispensary or not that's just the nature of being a teenager so i agree that we need to protect our children but i don't think that a dispensary is going to cause them to want to smoke more or it's not going to give them more access I have to give my ID every time I go in there and uh, to the hook, and they're really diligent. So just let Val do what she does and provide her service to people, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name's Christy Kelly, and um, I've lived in, I'm a, a resident of Santa Cruz County since 1967. And I can assure you there was a lot of drugs in the late 60s and early 70s when I attended high school here. And I knew where to get it. You know, it was, there, there wasn't a cannabis club on any corner of any street, but I knew where to get it. And um, I wanted to come up here because I'm the face of someone that has cancer. And um, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer about three or four years ago. And so there's a lot, you know, I'm on <clears throat> chemotherapy three weeks out of the month, and I'll be on it for the rest of my life until it doesn't work anymore. So there's a lot of issues with somebody that does chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, cannabis has been a really uh, changing drug or, you know, medicine, I want to call it for me, um, as far as uh, being able to curb uh, the nausea and the vomiting and all the other stuff that I go through. So, you know, I just want to say that this isn't just a normal cannabis club. This isn't somebody that's going in for uh, pure profit like everybody else is. I could think of one liquor store that's open not far from Live Oak School. It's probably about the same distance, and nobody's saying anything about that. Um, you know, I just want to support Valerie because, you know, uh, this is coming out of mostly out of her pocket. That's why she wants to open a dispensary, so that she can fund people like me that are sick and need it. And, and you know, I can't say enough about her and what she does uh, for me. And I'm just happy to be here. And I hope that, you know, to God, that you guys have somebody like her if you guys get cancer and you don't know what it's like to have to do it with all the other drugs that they want to give you, which I don't want to take. Thank you for listening. Good evening, welcome. Hello. Hi, my name's Arturo Ayala. I'm a Santa Cruz native and a Gulf War vet. I've been a WAM member for about 10 years. I have volunteered as much as possible um, to give back. Give back because WAM provides me and others with medical marijuana free of charge that would otherwise be out of reach for me. Out of reach because I would not have the disposable income 
for the amount of medication that I need. As a 100% service-connected disabled veteran, my income is fixed. I need this medical marijuana to supplement my VA meds for anxiety, depression, and arthritis. Medical marijuana has helped me overcome addictions to drugs, alcohol, and tobacco from military traumas, or the use, excuse me, coming from the military traumas. I joined the military to get stronger because believe it or not, I was a shy, quiet kid and I was bullied. I joined to get stronger so I wouldn't get bullied. This moratorium thing is like being bullied. The people of the state voted to legalize. The people of Santa Cruz voted to set the standards of where dispensary can be established. Wham and the Hook have met all requirements. Don't be a bully and block the progress. I also recognize the concerns of the use, of the youth use. Um, I also am very concerned about the youth zipping around on these electric bikes with caution to the wind. That's more dangerous. Than, well, anyways, um, I grew up here in Santa Cruz. I disobeyed my parents, as I'm sure some of you probably have too. Santa Cruz is a counterculture city influenced by skate, surf, weed, music, and art. Thank you, for your you, sir. Good evening. Welcome. Hello, City Council members. My name is Phoenix. I'm 23 years old, and I've lived in Santa Cruz all my life. I'm an immune compromised artist, student, and member of the workforce here. I have an autoimmune disease that causes high levels of inflammation in my body, which weakens my immune system and leaves me vulnerable to catching illness, makes me feel fatigued, stressed, and in pain consistently. Using medical marijuana is one of the only things I've found that consistently stabilizes my condition and gives me relief from my symptoms. I first got a medical marijuana card to manage my symptoms as a teenager under the careful guidance of my mother, who had honest conversations with me about the detrimental side effects of THC if I were to abuse it. Because of the education and support my family provided me with about how to use responsibly, I never abused cannabis. I believe that it is every parent's responsibility to be there to talk to and educate their children so that they do not abuse cannabis. I do not feel that a legal cannabis business being within eyesight of youth alone would mean that they will abuse it. I feel that conversations that affect how youth do or do not use cannabis start at home. WAM Phytotherapies does not have anywhere else to go if this new location is rejected, as they have already heavily invested in this project and will have to shut down if this location does not open. If WAM ends, it will have a tremendous impact on the quality and length of my life and the lives of fellow WAM patients who rely on WAM every day for vital medicine. We will be forced to make the difficult decision between paying our bills and purchasing our medicine, as affording both is not an option for many, as a, many of us living paycheck to paycheck or on disability or social security in our expensive beach town here. I implore you to vote in support of this partnership between WAM Phytotherapies and The Hook. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. Hello, my name is Ethan, and I am 24 years old. And I'm here to tell my story as well as make a few statements um, for the parents and the school board of this community. Um, first off, marijuana is an outdated term. It is racist. It was used during the reefer madness to really bring down Mexicans who are immigrating. It shouldn't be used as part of your presentation. And it's just an example of how outdated their um, whole understanding of what cannabis is right now. Um, as well as also, you do not have to be 18 to get a medical card for cannabis. You can be under 18 if your parents uh, sign off on that. I am an example of that. When I was 15 years old, I went and got a medical card over on River Street. Right now, it's the Holy Trinity Church. It used to be a medical rec center. And I was able to get my card, and that changed my life. I used to be a troubled child. I was in learning skills. I was also had an IEP for ADHD and a visual processing disorder. I was a DF student most of my life. Um, when I was around 15 years old, my parents were brave enough to go and get me my medical cannabis card instead of giving me Adderall, which is pretty much controlled methamphetamine. And 
as someone who grew up in, you know, this era of before cannabis was recreational and that medical, I dealt with a lot of my friends going through mental problems because of their Adderall, because of these antidepressant medications that they were given, while I, on the other hand, was becoming an A-B student. I was able to go through college. I was able to grow as a person, pay attention in class, sleep on time instead of just staying up all night because of cannabis. It's an herb. It's a plant, and it has a lot of medical benefits that can help people under 18, 18, and above for many different reasons. And it's a lot better than the things that are being handed out like candy, like Adderall by doctors. And I guarantee you that a lot of the students at your school are taking antidepressants, are taking Adderall to manage the stress that they deal with and are dealing with serious issues or are going to in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hello, Council. My name is Lorena Nunez, and I am a Santa Cruz High alumni voicing my support for the opening of the Hook Dispensary. I am now in law school and specialize in drug prohibition, and the fact is, banning legal cannabis only leads to a surge in illicit drug sales. Is that what we want? Consequently, prohibiting safe cannabis historically leads to an increase in accidental youth overdoses. Is that what we want? Councilmember Renee, you may recognize that you were once my teacher at Bayview Elementary. And while one of the pillars of Santa Cruz City Schools that has always stuck with me is fairness. I stand here today puzzled as to how we can expect our children to be open-minded when many adults here refuse to uphold these same values. In fact, the citizen behind me in line just told me to F off while we waited. Doesn't seem respectful, does it? And people have brought up that students will use cannabis to treat their anxiety. But what about the root of the problem? Why are you, your students in such despair in the first place? This sounds like a mental health issue, not a cannabis issue. Remember, this business will not allow anyone under the age of 19 to purchase product. Truthfully, if kids want substances, the one place that they won't be getting them from is a legal dispensary because they are so strictly regula regulated by the state. This business will be fully compliant and will bring gargantuan amounts of taxes into the city to improve your schools. All I ask is for you to think about the monument that this historical decision will have in Santa Cruz's story. You have the power to be remembered as pioneers for social justice, so don't look the other way now. I love our city and our youth just as much as you do, and all I want is fairness. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi. My name is Sage Smiley. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I run a substance use treatment program for youth all over Santa Cruz County. We are a free program, and we are harm reduction based, so we're not abstinence based. I'm here to say that I believe there are a lot of misguided ideas about youth today and cannabis use. I have worked with, um, well, I supervise counselors, and in our caseload, we have kids that are using three to six times a day. The cannabis of today, as you know, is so much stronger than anything I smoked when I was 13. <laughs> um, and I, I'm... Actually, I'm trying to cut back my thing. Um, what I want to say is I also have a student, uh, a son who's a student at Santa Cruz High, and I've seen the carts that he and his friends have come home with. And they, I've looked them up and found them on dispensary websites. So these are not illegally uh, produced. These are bought by adults and sold to our high school kids. And that is one of my main concerns is the proximity having easier access for kids to get online, get on Snapchat and say, I'll meet you behind, e okay, maybe not behind Emily's because they have cameras, but I'll meet you two blocks away. I just bought my stash and now I'm here to sell it for double the price because there are a lot of kids with money who go to ha Santa Cruz High. And I hope that you take seriously the concern that we all have for everybody's well-being here. Like it's killing me to hear is pitted against each other. Like, I, I'm a social worker. The last thing I want to do is harm people with chronic pain, with cancer. And at the same time, I work with children that are greening out, that are being found face down in a parking garage downtown, or that uh, young man who has had four psychotic breaks, all cannabis-induced psychoses, 
or the 14 year old who started using when she was 12. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome. Ooh, Good evening. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Nancy. And um, what was I going to say? I'm old and decrepit. I <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to keep you in that in informed. And um, I have been a teacher for 57 years, and I am still teaching. And I spent 20 years at Bayview Elementary as a special education teacher. I am a teacher, teacher, teacher. So what gets me is all in the 60 years that I've been working with parents and students and all that stuff, never once did a building cause any of the drug use, any of the um, uh, addiction, it's like we somehow miss the point of its parents. You guys, you are in charge of your children, but we're going to blame a building? I, 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 I told you I'm old and decrepit, and I've seen a lot in 60 years, and I've taught all over the United States. But in Santa Cruz, we want to blame other things, not the cause. Or like Santa Cruz City Schools, well, I don't get it. I'm old and decrepit, and I'm done. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. Hey, how's it going? My name is Darren. I'm a local business owner. Um, I went to Brands 40 Junior High, and we never had a problem getting weed when we wanted to. We'd just skate downtown and get it from the homeless people. This was before dispensaries. I think anyone that grew up here knows how easy it is to get weed if they want. So shutting down a dispensary or not letting them open isn't going to really solve anybody's problems. Secondly, a couple times today I've heard the Public Health Institute mentioned. Um, I'd really investigate that source. The person who runs that is a known prohibitionist, and she's been discredited many times. So you might want to, like, get the other side of the story before really basing your decisions on information that she's provided. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having us. Uh, Mayor Keeley and city council members uh, recognize some of you. Uh, so I'm here as a parent, a dad. I heard from my daughter earlier. Uh, volunteer with the community and lots of harm reduction and uh, in healthcare. Um, full time faculty at Cabrillo and 15 years experience veteran front lines in healthcare at Dominican Hospital. So work in the ER, uh, in the OR mainly, and I can tell you I have a unique perspective on the harm claims or potential for cannabis. I um, can tell you we see 0 to 1% trauma patients in the ER from cannabis issues. <clears throat> we do see a lot. Somebody brought up a good point about the electric vehicles. Some very like serious accidents as well. Um, but in terms of alcohol, how often do we see that? Daily, sometimes hourly for trauma patients. So I wanted to bring that perspective. Um, and as well, uh, Spent my Sunday night uh, working at the hospital till 11 p.m. to, you know, prevent a man from succumbing to sepsis. So that was how I celebrate Mother's Day. <laughs> um, so obviously my passion is really with this. I'm committed to healthcare as a career, and I really would like kind of common sense and cooler minds to prevail with this issue. There's a, definitely you've seen the evidence in terms of harm and harm reduction, right? We. Drug policy has been sort of a moderate failure at best. We really need new ways to look at this issue. And WAM is a, like comparing apples and oranges to regular dispensaries, right? My mom was early days, hospice health care uh, nurse, and so I grew up seeing the value of compassionate care and medicine when it is palliative care that all of you are going to want. So please give your mothers the best Mother's Day gift ever. Belated, she won't care. Give her the potential to have this care when you need it, and to all of you and to your children. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Council members, my name is Carly Adams. I stand before you today in strong support of the proposed Hook Outlet and Wham Dispensary. This project is not only in compliance with our city's regulations, it exceeds them. As you know, the Planning Commission has thoroughly vetted this proposal and overwhelmingly approved it with a 5-2 to two vote. Their deliberations were not taken lightly. As Commissioner Conway noted, uh, concerns about exposure are moot at this point. We are not introducing cannabis to our community. It is already here. Additionally, the evidence simply doesn't support the idea that this location will increase access for minors. 
Commissioner Dan echoed these statements, emphasizing the that the applicant has met and surpassed our standards. Changing the rules after the fact is unfair and sets a dangerous precedent. She stated, quote, that the findings for denial are not credible and the findings for approval are very, very strong. She aptly pointed out that vapes, a far more pressing concern for use, are read readily available at gas stations much, clo much closer to schools than this dispensary. Commissioner Kennedy wisely reminded us that the 600-foot buffer was a carefully considered compromise that ensures access to Madison while respecting community concerns. He stated, quote, the reason we picked 600 feet is because if you go any further, you will in fact be eliminating marijuana clubs in Santa Cruz. Our town is small and proximity to schools is unavoidable. Ultimately, he, as he noted, the responsibility for educating our youth about cannabis lies with parents and schools, not with dispensary locations. Finally, Commissioner Thompson highlighted the fact that this proposal adheres to existing rules established through a thoughtful and deliberative process. There is no compelling reason to change those rules now. He stated, uh, quote, this is the kind of question that has been asked and answered. It's time for us to just kind of take this as the grown-ups were supposed to be and say we've got a rule and they've met it. In conclusion, I urge you to uphold the Planning Commission's well-reasoned decision and approve the Hook Outlet and Wham Dispensary. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello. Uh, my name is Jenna Glant. I'm here to urge you to dismiss this appeal against the Hook and Wham Phytotherapies Dispensary. This project is not only legal and compliant, but it is a vital resource for our community. We are all on the same page that youth should not be consuming cannabis recreationally. There is no argument there. However, I believe the appellant's claims are based on fear and misinformation regarding legal cannabis. They worry about the youth access to cannabis, yet studies and dispensary experiences show that licensed dispensaries are not the source. Strict ID policies, surveillance, and staff training make it virtually impossible for minors to purchase from these establishments. In fact, the illicit market is the real threat. This is where the teens are getting unregulated and potentially dangerous cannabis products, and let me be clear, the illicit market does not source from dispensaries. No one is selling cannabis on the illicit market and paying the minimum 50% markup and roughly 27% in taxes they would have to in order to source cannabis from a legal dispensary here in Santa Cruz. The Hook, on the other hand, is partnering with Wham Phytotherapies, a respected organization that provides free, safe, and legal medicinal cannabis to those with serious illness. The Hook has also gone above and beyond to address community concerns. They've raised the age limit for purchases, altered their building to be discreet, and minimized signage. They've demonstrated a commitment to being a responsible and community-minded business. So please, do not let these exaggerated fears and misinformation of this appeal prevent you from making a decision that is logical and fair. To reiterate, to reiterate the basics, cannabis dispensaries are prohibited by law from selling cannabis to minors. There has been no evidence presented tonight that supports claims that this dispensary will increase youth access or use. We have a chance to support a local business that will provide safe access to cannabis, generate tax revenue, and partner with a crucial organization serving our most vulnerable residents. Please approve the Hook Outlet and Wham Phytotherapies dispensary. This is the right decision for the community. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Folks, my name is Michael Camp. Uh, today, I want to talk about how the Hook and Wham Phytotherapies proposed location meets and aligns with our city's established regulations. Our current zoning and setbacks regulations are not arbitrary. They are carefully crafted to balance the needs of businesses with community concerns. This is evident in the successful operation of existing licensed cannabis retailers throughout Santa Cruz. Reefside, for example, operates less than 60 feet from Marianne's Ice Cream, argu arguably the county's most popular and most delicious ice cream. <laughs> Canna Cruz is the same distance by path of travel to Kirby School as the Hook West Side location is from Santa Cruz High School. Additionally, Three Bros on Fair Avenue is within line of sight and just a few hundred feet from Ice Cream on Fair. It is also worth noting that Kind People's Dis Dispensary received a variance due to not meeting the 600 feet dis distance requirement from a sensitive use area. The unique layout of our city with its limited land area and commercial space means that many businesses, including cannabis retailers, are located within a comparable distance to sensitive use areas, similar to the proposed location on Mission Street. The 600-foot buffer zone while a guideline is, an is not an absolute barrier. There are instances where dispensaries operate closer to sensitive areas, areas and do so responsibly. This precedent has worked well in our city. Existing dispensaries operate harmoniously within our communities, generating economic activity, providing jobs, and serving customers responsibly. 
There is no evidence to suggest that the proposed location of this dispensary would disrupt the, this established balance. In fact, our commitment to stringent operational procedures, well-trained staff, and robust security measures further ensures that we will be a responsible and contributing member to the community. Once again, to be clear, cannabis dispensaries are prohibited by law from selling to minors. There has been no evidence provo provided tonight that supports claims that dispensaries will increase youth access or use. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Gary Boland. Uh, I've been a longtime member of WAM. Um, I served two combat tours in Vietnam. My best memories of happiest memories were Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, summer 67, right after high school, and then I went to Vietnam. There were two tours there. Uh, second tour, I was captured in Cambodia, severely tortured, witnessed my team members executed. At that time, 50 years ago, there wasn't PTSD, and if you talked about it, it was a career ender. So uh, I kept those demons inside for many, many years, and I just kept busy. I, I left the military because I couldn't stand the violence, but uh, I, I spent a, one semester teaching high school math in San Francisco, and then I went back to the government, and I served 30 years uh, with GSA Federal Technology Service, with U.S. Marshals, and the Secret Service. 2005, I was medically retired after being shot at work. I never thought I'd walk again. And I was on morphine and phenytyl, the drugs that you hear about in the news. Well, that's what the VA was giving me, phenytyl. So I, I was crippled in a wheelchair by myself at home, high on phenytyl and that. And so I moved to Santa Cruz, and with the help of WAM, I was able to get off the phenytyl through medical cannabis. And with time, I was able to learn to walk again. Um, I'm really here today because I'm not feeling well, but I'm here for the people that can't be here today. There's thousands of cancer patients that have passed, that their spirits are right here, right now, and they're, they're listening and watching and that. And WAM has done so much to help them. Myself, even though I was a retired federal employee and that, I couldn't afford the medical marijuana that I needed and the amounts needed to treat myself. I was given it. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and esteemed members of the City Council. I stand before you today to present the results of an online study I conducted regarding the proposed opening of this new dispensary on Mission Street. Through this study, I aim to understand the sentiments of our community members on this very important matter. I gathered a total of 288 comments across multiple platforms such as Instagram, Nextdoor, and Reddit. These comments represent the voices of our residents providing valuable insight into public opinion. Out of these 288 comments, an overwhelming 79.86% expressed support for the opening of the new dispensary. This clear majority indicates a strong endorsement from our community. Conversely, only 20.14% of the comments were in opposition. I would like to highlight that these numbers closely correlate with a significant st study titled Community Support and Proposition 64, Reflecting Santa Cruz's Vision. This particular study found that the use of both medical and recreational cannabis aligns with the will of the majority of citizens in Santa Cruz. Voting records from the Adult Use of Marijuana Act revealed that countywide, 70% of the nearly 128,000 votes supported cannabis legalization. These results demonstrate a long-standing trend of support for cannabis initiatives within Santa Cruz. I also want to mention the Move On petitions posted online. The dispensary petition received 2,189 signatures, while the Protect Our Youth petition garnered 941. A little visual there. Um, this nearly mir mirrors the community sentiment mentioned before, with 70% in support of the petition and 30% signing the uh, petition of opposition, respectively. Therefore, it's evident that sentiments expressed in my informal study are consistent with the broader vision of our community. In closing, I express my gratitude to the City Council for their time and intention, attention on this very important matter, and I would appreciate your consideration on this particular community input. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. My name is Zoe Carter, and I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council, and I want to thank you all for your time. 
I have been working with Bryce and Kyle on this project for maybe a year now and have come to several council meetings now to express our council support for them. And what we really are asking for is for this legitimate business to be treated like any other business would be treated in the city of Santa Cruz. What's happened, the months and months and months of delays, the hundreds of thousands of dollars they've already put into this would not happen to any other business in this city that was considered legitimate as they are. So they've met every single requirement set out by the city and we're asking for your approval today and to just understand that this is something that needs to happen for economic development, for good business, health in our community. And I'll also mention that during the planning commission meeting, it was stated by one of the commissioners that the trial on cannabis already happened. So that's been done and over with, and now we need to move forward with the rules that have already been set out. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Council. Thank you for allowing me the chance to speak in favor of WAM and the Hook Outlet. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple points that really stood out to me this evening, um, and that's education and normalization. Um, the lack of education regarding cannabis consumption is the reason why we are at this point where parents feel like they don't know how to speak to their children. Cannabis is such a nuanced topic, medicine, um, part of our culture, right? So I, I can understand the challenge in which parents, maybe it's easier to just say, no, don't do it, as opposed to giving them the true, giving children the true understanding of why we're saying no, why we're saying to wait, just as you would with alcohol consumption, just as you would with cigarette consumption or tobacco consumption. Um, the lack of addressing these issues is why we are sweeping under the rug fentanyl overdoses, um, alcoholism in young ages. Um, I was 19 when I got my when I got a DUI, and it thoroughly ruined my life. Um, I can't say the same for cannabis. I can say that cannabis granted me outlet to a, an amazing job opportunity where I got to learn about sustainable agriculture from brilliant humans, where I got to learn from Val herself about the work that she's done in the community for decades. Um, there needs to be proper education about cannabis. That's just flat out the point. Um, and normalization. You know, last time I was here, it was for the, um, in regards to the a moratorium and, you know, the topic of had a glass of wine the night before. And I'm not discredit, yeah, alcohol. I had, I had a DUI, no big deal. But my point is, we can bring kids to breweries with us, baby in hand. There is no way a minor will ever be allowed in a dispensary, even with parent. So, thank you. So, I'm gonna, excuse me for just, I'm gonna take the gentleman over here. Th thank you for your forbearance. Good evening, sir. is not just trying to have agreements with the call dispensaries. The Hook has agreed to help WAM continue its mission, to provide help to those in need with little to no income. Uh, it's a symbol of responsible use of marijuana. Uh, let me be clear, allowing the location in question will not be a negative influence on school children. They will not have greater access to cannabis. If the problem is vape pens, severely increasing the ease of use and potency of cannabis use. For the young, I suggest this body focus encouraging schools to provide better education on that particular aspect. Uh, we have been providing people of Santa Cruz compassionate medical assistance res responsibly for over 30 years. The, this responsibility will reinforce the hook to act in accordance with best, best practices. Uh, please grant this waiver so that we can continue on that mission. 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, council members. My name is Stephanie Kimitsuka. I want to address the concerns about the proposed dispensary at 1129 Mission Street and the idea that its presence and signage will further normalize cannabis use among our youth. First, it's important to clarify that the intersection of Mission and Laurel Streets, where the dispensary will be located, is not a primary route for our students. In contrast, California and King Streets, as well as Walnut Avenue, see a far higher frequency of student traffic. It's worth noting that a prominent cannabis company currently has a large 4x6 banner blatantly displayed at the high Santa Cruz High School football field. This raises serious questions about the consistency of the opposition's stance on cannabis exposure in educational environments. This banner is not only visible during games attended by hundreds of students, but also during daily physical education classes and numerous athletic activities that take place on those grounds. The existence of this banner in that location highlights a major discrepancy in the opposition's claimed philosophy. This inconsistency calls into question the outrage from the opposition to a dispensary sign on Mission Street, suggesting that concerns may be selectively applied and not aligned with a broader, more equitable approach to managing cannabis visibility in our community. Furthermore, our community faces more visible drug-related challenges, especially near Harvey West Park, which sees a ton of foot traffic from families. The real issues we should be paying attention to are drug activities in these public spaces, which are far more conspicuous and harmful to our youth than a dispensary sign. In conclusion, if we are genuinely committed to the well-being of our youth, our focus should be directed towards meaningful and comprehensive drug education and prevention, rather than symbolic gestures that do not address the root of the problem. Let's use our resources and energy to tackle these real challenges, ensuring a safer, healthier environment for all our residents. Thank you for your consideration. Mr. Rice, good evening. Good evening. I want to say one thing that uh, Suzanne forgot to mention when she woke up at uh, the farm that morning. There were five rifles pointed at her, and they were yelling at her, get up, get up, stand up. Well, she couldn't stand up, and the fight was on. So I don't know how many times I've had the honor of being here uh, with Wham, for Wham, but it's been a number, and I'm particularly proud this time uh, because we have an awful lot of people who have indicated their support for Wham that aren't here today, tonight. Um, and some of those people are, I know, known to you all, and they have signed a letter in support of Assembly Member Pellerin's letter, which you now have a copy of if you haven't already seen it. But you recognize those names, probably at least half of them, people you know, and many of them are, of course, political people in our community have proven their worth and have been mentoring some of you, I'm sure. And I just think this is extraordinary that that many people with that kind of power came for. And I have to say that it took about a minute to start getting those signatures. And Don Lane was one of them. I'm only going to mention a couple of Don Lane was one of the very first people to say, yes, I am going to support this effort. And another one was uh, Andrew uh, Golden Crans, who called up and said, hey, I'm a member of, I'm not only the Democratic uh, Central Committee chair, but I am uh, also a member of, I'm on the board of the Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency. And he was stunned by, uh, he was stunned to learn that they had vote, voted to support the schools and now was saying, what's, what's the back, what's the back story? And when he learned, he signed on with us, and that's happened a great deal. Many of the people Thank you, uh, Mr. Rush. were felt manipulated. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Good evening. Good evening, City Council. Evening. Uh, my name is David, and 
Uh, I'd like to address the effectiveness of ID policies at dispensaries like the hook and WAM phytotherapies. Um, how these policies and procedures go above and beyond to safeguard our community's youth. First and foremost, dispensaries are highly regulated businesses. Uh, they are required by law and have stringent IG checks in place. This isn't just a cursory glance at a driver's license. The hook uh, ID policy is meticulously examined under a black light, scanned for front and spacing conformity, uh, holographs, embossing, and laser cutting, uh, and the barcode is verified. This multi-step process ensures only valid IDs are accepted. A recent study published by the Journal of Safety Research supports the effectiveness of this measure. It's found that licensed dispensaries in California where recre recreational cannabis is legal are 100% effective in, uh, in preventing underage access. The research concludes that strong legal incentives and rigorous ID checks make it highly unlikely for minors to obtain cannabis from these establishments. Beyond the legal requirements, dispensaries have a vested interest in maintaining a safe and responsible environment. They employ well-trained and adept staff members uh, for spotting fake IDs and suspicious behavior. In fact, there is zero documented instances in a minor being served at a dispensary in our county. Furthermore, security measures at dispensaries, such as exterior cameras and surveillance systems, deter illicit activities like shoulder tapping. Um, all transactions are logged and recorded and occur under camera surveillance, creating a secure environment for both customers and staff. In closing, the data and real world experience demonstrate that dispensaries are not a source of cannabis for minors. The stringent ID policies and well-trained staff and robust security measures effectively, present, uh, effectively prevent underage access. Uh, this establishes priorities compliance. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Kyle Giacchino. Today I'd like to shift the focus from compliance to the broader impacts that the hook and wham have on our community. Our commitment extends far beyond legal requirements. We are dedicated to boosting the local economy and fostering positive change. As a 100% locally owned and operated business, our success directly benefits Santa Cruz. We invest in our community through living wages, comprehensive benefits, and professional development of our employees. This improves the quality of life for our staff and contributes to a thriving workforce. We're not just a business, we're a community partner. Since our inception, we have collaborated with dozens of local artists, artisans, and nonprofit organizations. Through events, fundraising initiatives like our Rounded Up for Justice program and other partnerships, we have raised tens of thousands of dollars to support vital causes right here in Santa Cruz County. We understand the challenges faced by the legal cannabis industry, yet we have persevered, grown, and expanded our presence throughout the county. Our commitment to ethical practices, sustainable operations, and community engagement has earned us the trust and loyalty of our community, as re recently evidenced by our taking home of top honors at Treehouse for the Good Times and Sentinel Voters' Choice Awards. By approving the hook and wham phytotherapies, you are not just approving a dispensary. You are investing in a local business that is deeply rooted in its community. You're supporting an organization that prioritizes its employees, collaborates with local partners, and gives back in meaningful ways. We urge you to recognize the positive economic and social contributions the Hook and Wham bring to Santa Cruz. We are more than just a dispensary. We are a catalyst for positive change in our community. We have invested significant time and resources to make this additional location a reality, ensuring that those who rely on medical cannabis have convenient access this is a partnership that benefits the entire community, providing essential medicine while generating economic activity and support of local jobs. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Hi. For your time. Uh, my name is Thomas Fry. I'm a U.S. Marine combat vet. Um, when I got out of the Marines, I was using a lot of alcohol to, uh, to kind of deal with my PTSD. Um, I was drinking so much, they told me I wouldn't make it to my 50s. I'm now 55, or going to be 55. <laughs> um, I actually use cannabis to quit drinking and to stay off alcohol. Um, more importantly, um, I have a I have a 15-year-old son. I've been using cannabis for about 15 years now. He's been with me the whole time. I've talked to him about it. 
inside and out. Um, I ask him if he wants to use cannabis. He says no. He doesn't, there's no need. Um, after being here, I've been listening. Um, I had to talk because what, what needs to happen is the parents need to do their jobs at home and talk to their kids. We, cannabis saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Hi, I'm Thomas Sage Patterson. I know some of you. Um, I'm, I'm here standing with the hook. Now, I'm not, you guys have already heard all the data and all the fun stuff, and I just wanted to share kind of like a little glimpse of my story, you know. And um, I was raised in Hollister, and the, uh, the marijuana laws there were like, um, marijuana is treated like the same thing as the meth, right? So um, I smoked as a, as a youth. I was the, you know, um, smoked a lot, and I don't, I don't, I, know, I don't recommend it for the youth, you know what I mean? I, th I think everyone can agree with that. I don't think there's, like, people are kind of doing this, like, wham versus the youth thing. I don't think that exists. I think, um, really, we just need to look at the facts of the matter. And, you know, we've all been a youth. Teenagers, like, scared the, you know, out of me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I teach uh, music. And, but they also impress me. They're also very intelligent, very smart people. And I think if they want to find cannabis, <laughs> they can find cannabis in Santa Cruz without a dispensary, you know? Um, and like a, regarding like a building, you know, I get where the parents are at, you know? I mean, if you can do anything to prevent your kid from being exposed to cannabis, I mean, I would be probably a pretty protective parent. I am not a parent, but I probably would be pretty protective. And, you know, I, I can see the argument you know, but I also see that we need to like give the kids trust and build trust with kids. You know, and I think that's what they, that's what this other side is doing, and I think we just need to support them more and having more conversations. They're doing the work already. We, they just need more support. It seems so. I don't think it has anything to do with the dispensary. You know, hap, you know, um, I think it has more to do with building trust and building relationships with these students. Thank you for being here. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mark Timorous, a uh, <clears throat> longtime Santa Cruz resident. Uh, I'm not that close to this issue, but I would like to make a couple of uh, opinionated uh, uh, comments about my opinion, which is that this debate is about location, it seems to me, not about the merits of WHAM or the uh, merits of cannabis as a method for treating people with various ailments. Uh, I think it's about location. And I support that there should be some third way, if you can find one, uh, rather than putting or talking ourselves into putting a dispensary so close to a school. I don't see the children much represented here. Uh, I've heard the rhetoric this evening. Uh, but I support the earlier comment regarding finding a third way. I can see the good work that WAM does, and, uh, and I commend that. I see the good uh, benefits that people here are speaking to, and I support that. But we're talking ourselves into putting a dispensary near a school. That's the issue, not about whether marijuana is good for you or whether or not uh, uh, WAM does good work. WAM does good work. Uh, marijuana is not right for everyone, as you're about to hear. But I think it's about location, and I think finding a third way, uh, perhaps to make the WAM organization whole with public funds might be an option. I don't know. But this location is very near schools, and I stand against it. And I thank you for your time. Thank you for being here, sir. Good evening. Welcome. Hi, uh, Pat Malo. Uh, I grew up here. I have the pleasure of uh, serving on the board of WAM. And I've had the pleasure of working with almost all of you on this issue at this point. Um, and I also, you know, thank you for hearing this, um, and thank you, I think, for voting for WAM tonight. I think that this is the way it's going to go, and I think that because, you know, not just me, but Valerie and Bryce have worked on not just canopy piss policy with you, but with, um, you know, youth prevention, with community prevention partners. They've gotten, I think, a couple of awards each from uh, CPP. Um, in the past, I know that I've been to several meetings at Treehouse upstairs about keeping kids away from cannabis. And the conclusions of not cannabis industry data, but educational data at the time was where 
children were getting their cannabis from was at home, from their parents. And so we put together a campaign, the Talk It Up, Lock It Up campaign, put out tons of boxes, and you know who our partner was for that campaign? Was all the dispensaries. So it's like from 10 years ago, we had this figured out that the answer to illicit cannabis and cannabis coming from sources like the home was sources like the dispensaries where safeguards far beyond alcohol and tobacco are in place. In CPP, we had several campaigns. One of them was cannabis. The others were alcohol, tobacco, and we didn't have the same sort of alcohol vendors showing up and saying, how can we help? We didn't have tobacco salespeople showing up and saying, how can we help? And so, you know, the last thing I'll close on is the other, th you know, thing that happened with legalization is youth access went down, but the other folks who lost access were all the poor patients. The people on the back of this whole thing was started. And then, you know, people like me lost our jobs, but who cares about that? Like real people lost their medicine. And you're talking a bunch of people who have jobs with health insurance talking about taking away other people's last line of defense. So thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Palmer. I am uh, one of the co-owners of Canna Cruz uh, Dispensary here in Santa Cruz. Been operating for about ten years now, and um, just wanted to offer another perspective. And, and I think a lot of people in the room don't realize is you know our biggest competitor, whether it be us, uh, the Hook, or the school board, is the illicit market. Um, that is where the kids are getting their cannabis from, not from licensed dispensaries. And so I think we should keep that in mind. I don't think anyone doubts that we don't want the youth um, smoking cannabis. That's not what we're talking about here today. And we're, we're not talking about, you know, it is Wham and The Hook a legitimate business and, and good operators. We all know that at this point. We're here about an appeal. And we're talking about proximity to schools and the health and safety, which are kind of related for me. Um, and, and the question I think you guys have tonight is, is this dispensary opening up near the high school, but within the ordinance, um, going to affect our children? And as someone who was born and raised in this county, I went to Santa Cruz County Schools. Previous to dispensaries being open, cannabis was readily available. Um, and, and, you know, I really don't see how adding a regulated business in the neighborhood is going to um, affect that any any more than it, it's already out there. Um, so I, I just hope you guys consider the facts of this and appreciates the staff work um, pointing out how they do comply with the ordinance. And, and, and I don't see today how, you know, allowing them to operate is going to change that. I think we need to educate our kids at home and make them aware so they can make the appropriate decisions because, you know, when they're older, real life happens, they need to be able to decide what's good or bad for them independently. And, and that happens at home. So I, I hope our schools can help educate them and, and not just keep it in the shadows out of fear. Evening. Welcome. Hi, my name is Suzanne. Um, I, I started two startups in Santa Cruz. I was the CEO of two startups. I raised two boys here. Uh, I, was all, I am also on the board of WAM for many years. And um, I just want to say that to repeat, Suzanne, I have two sons who grew up around cannabis, but what they saw are sick people, you know, using cannabis and people with cancer, and they don't want to have anything to do with that. <laughs> and um, one just passed the bar, and the other has a thriving business here in Santa Cruz. Um, I think that what I feel like here is we're all praising this amazing woman. And it made me proud of Santa Cruz, made me proud of where we are. And I understand the parents. I was a parent, too. But let's flip this. Let's, do, let's have Val talk to the students. You know, why don't we, I mean, it's, why aren't the students here listening to this? Why are we keeping all this hush-hush? And, and I agree with that person who said it's a building. CVS is a building. Safeway is a building. And those buildings invite the students 
to buy soda and candy, and they go in there without parents. But in those same buildings, all day long, pharmacists are giving out fentanyl and morphine and Oxycontin, and nobody thinks it's a problem. That's how we should think. We should be the forerunners of you know, counties that show that this is, this is the way it could be. We should be proud, not scared. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. I really appreciate it a lot. My name is Mark Paul Goodman. I'm a 27-year resident of Santa Cruz. I love Santa Cruz. I love our community. <laughs> It's incredibly precious to me. I do a lot of service work here in the community. I've done a lot of service work all my life. I'd like to share with you that I was married, had the incredible blessing and benefit of being married to an extraordinary woman. Her name was Marguerite Wingrove Goodman. We were married for 13 years. Nine years into our marriage, she was unexpectedly diagnosed with stage four terminal breast cancer. The cancer spread through her body very rapidly. We tried rounds of chemotherapy and radiation. She was nauseous and throwing up all the time. She was in terrible pain. It got to the point where the chemo, where the oxycontin and the uh, morphine that she was taking could no longer control the pain unless she was sleeping all the time. And she didn't want to be sleeping all the time. She wanted to experience what life she had with her, with me and with her loved ones and her friends. And so she put up with the pain, the excruciating pain, every moment of every day during those years. It spread through her body, to her pelvis, to her back, her spinal column, and eventually to her brain. And at the end, she couldn't speak. Two, uh, two uh, nights before, she died. We sang Amazing Grace to her. She sang it back to us. I held her in my arms the night she died, and we shared a kiss before she passed on. Please approve this. There are so many people out there, and who will be out there, who will have the same need that Marguerite had and couldn't have access to the world. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, council members. My name is Krista Berryessa, so you can guess which side I'm on. But uh, the reality is I am on the side of the youth. And um, I'm, every time a speaker has said that it should be up to the parents to talk about this, I'm hearing a lot of laughter. And I'm, I wanted to share two stories with you quickly. Um, I take my kids to Little League and back now, and the first time that I had drove pa back home from Harvey West, I'm just following my maps, and I make that first right turn right next to the family shelter. And I hear my, my son in the back go, wow, Mom, look at that torch. And I look over, and there's someone smoking heroin straight from foil right there in the middle of the day. Next day, I'm thinking, okay, well, this is an opportunity. Bryce and I know how to talk to our kids about cannabis, but uh, <laughs> this is something else, right? Next time, we go to a Little League, and um, on the way back, my next son is like, oh my gosh, mom, that guy's getting a blood draw. That's all my son knows about syringe use, is getting a blood draw. So I'm not here to say we should shut down Reb Rebelly's work with the family shelter and make a big stink about that, because I know that I can just go a little bit further and take that next right turn. <laughs> and you've seen the evidence that there's not a ton of foot traffic. We have that evidence from the cameras. Um, you know, but there is an inconsistency. I know you all heard that there is a cannabis company that's flying a banner at the high school. So I just, I don't know, there's inconsistencies around. <sighs> Thank you all for all the time that you spent listening with an open mind here. And I um, look forward to your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hi, my name is Anna Paganelli. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a neighbor of Emily's Santa Cruz Heights, Santa Cruz Residential Recovery, and the Sober Living Apartments on Week Street. Um, as a neighbor, just that, I was disappointed that we didn't get asked about any of this. We didn't get asked about the changes in citing rules. That was frustrating. We haven't seen anything about impacts to the neighborhood. But 
as a person and as a therapist, I'm in favor of dispensaries. I use them and encourage can clients to use cannabis to buy their products from our local dispensaries. The issue here is not about dispensaries or cannabis. It is about the placement near multiple sensitive communities and the impact on those. As a psychotherapist, I worked for decades with kids at basically all the schools, especially high schools and middle schools. And as anybody who's a therapist can tell you, the stress on kids over the last bunch of years has shot through the roof. Uh, it's everything from the school shooting threat of a couple years ago at Santa Cruz High and the damage that did. It's climate change, it's the pandemic, the fears about their future, everything has contributed so much to the mental health problems that kids are dealing with and the stressors that they're dealing with. Uh, and like adults, kids tend to turn to self-medication, which you can see if you're in classrooms at Santa Cruz High, or which you can see if you're a neighbor here watching kids get high before school. It's not that dispensaries near schools are the biggest of risk factors, but they pile on top of an already stressed population of our kids. They get short-term relief for cannabis and self-medicating. The unfortunate aspect is that it tends to keep going and it continues to hurt kids. They, the grades go down uh, and we know that proximity matters. We wouldn't have liquor stores right next to schools for a reason. We're just talking about tipping the scales a little bit in one direction and putting a dispensary right there makes it more accessible for kids to do what Sage said. They, they buy from other people who just bought it. They, they put in orders, they get it from people who've already bought it at the dispensaries. We don't need more of that in the schools. We need to help our kids. We can't keep doing this. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Casey O'Brien. I'm Student Services Director in Santa Cruz City Schools, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, it's clearly reiterating it. It's an issue of location. It's not anything against medical marijuana um, or cannabis or um, uh, recreational cannabis. And I know that's been repeated, but um, it's all good. You know, those things are fine, and, we, and any educator I know does not have an issue with that. It's really about proximity. Um, so here's a few things that I know uh, with dealing with educators every day right here in Santa Cruz City Schools. First, the sign at the high school um, was uh, sold by the former high, uh, high school football coach and didn't have any idea that the name that he sold it to had anything to do with uh, cannabis. Once it was learned, the sign was taken down, policy has been changed. So um, that was unbeknownst to other folks in the district. Um, other things that I know, a California Healthy Kids Survey, uh, students at self-report in the state. This was already shared, but I want to reiterate that. 11% of our 11th graders self-report uh, using cannabis, and in Santa Cruz City Schools, that's 16% in 2021. 2023, those increased by 1% by the, for the state, but by 7% uh, for Santa Cruz City Schools, so 5% more than the state um, growth over those two years. Other data is our students that um, were under the influence or in possession of cannabis products tripled between 2021 and 2020, 2021 22 school year and 23 24. So, one year apart, uh, the numbers of students that were under the influence um, of, of cannabis tripled. Um, and that therefore re, uh, tripled our referrals for substance use education and harm reduction. Um, as folks have stated, the mental health challenges are off the charts since COVID. Uh, the CDC claimed that a national emergency are mental health issues for our kids and cannabis is exacerbating that. Um, at our elementary and middle schools, we're seeing colorful gummies and vapes that are marketed for kids literally be, being given out by like candy. Our emergency responders are sharing already? Dang. It's about Good location evening. and normalization. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. I want to thank all of you. Uh, my name is Deborah Feldstein. I'm here um, to advocate for the appellant and ask that you deny the permit uh, for the hook. Uh, we all support WAM. We have a debt of gratitude to Vale for the pathway that she created for legalization and for medical access and responsible adult legal recreational use. This is not the issue here. This isn't the conversation we should be having, despite the fact that the majority of the people who have spoken tonight are speaking about WHAM. This is about our children. It is about their safety. We've heard a lot of comments about parents and our responsibility. I'm not here because I'm worried about my own kids, and I'm not worried about some of their friends, but I'm worried about many of them. 
and it is not the job of our school teachers and their administrators to do drug intervention. It is part of what they do, but we have kids who need to learn English. We have kids who need to learn to read and write. We have kids with learning challenges and mental health challenges that are already getting in the way of their ability to learn. Why would we make a decision that, as Anna said, tips the scales, that puts even one child at increased risk. It is your responsibility as leaders we have elected to protect our youth. There is a lens, a mandate that you have been given through which all decisions are to be made regarding the welfare, health, and safety of our children. And putting a cannabis dispensary, which is for recreational purposes and is a commercial enterprise, blocks from our school at a corner frequented by our youth from three schools, a middle school, an elementary school, and a high school, doesn't make any sense. So I ask you to listen to our experts, to our teachers, to our administrators, to our mental health professionals, and to the medical community. Those are the people with the scientific studies. And so I ask that you listen to them and make your decision on that basis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bradley Hopper. I've worked in the cannabis industry for close to eight years now. I've known Bryce and his team for a very long time. And he is one of the reasons that I was able to properly and responsib responsibly bring a cannabis distribution and manufacturing facility into our area through his guidance and his team and his efforts we have strived to keep regulations to the maximum that we can do um touching on a couple of points kids nowadays i disagree unfortunately with the previous speaker it is my responsibility to inform my child is my responsibility to make sure that my child is not on Snapchat or wearing weed from some dude around the corner. I do that through apps, monitoring, information, and education. What we used to call that as a drug dealer. I call a guy on the phone and he brings me some stuff. That's a drug dealer. Um, I, in this industry, have never seen any miners been able to purchase anything through any dispensary. Um, what we used to do was we used to, I born and raised in Santa Cruz, we walk from West Cliff, we go down to Hippie Corner in Santa Cruz, and when Hippie Corner moved, we go to the next corner and the next corner and the next corner. Nowadays, the hemp-derived THC that anybody with a Visa gift card can get online and order by checking IM18 off of Facebook is a completely different product. It's a completely different item that should not be compared to the regulated cannabis. With that being said, I think it's very important for the parents to take responsibility in their actions and to not deny somebody after they've gone through so much. In my industry, I've thrown away tens of thousands of dollars worth of packaging. Because it's fair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the council meeting. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I want to talk about hypocrisy. We have a museum downtown with a bar feet away from the museum that we encourage our children to go to. We have children walking by McDonald's and Burger King and on their way to school. And we have those foods in our school. I think that the children in our community are smarter than we give them credit for. They're more sensitive to hypocrisy that our uh, society um, juggles. And I think that's more of a concern than students walking by a nondescript building with a green uh, cross at, uh, for, for health care at the top of it. And I think that the hypocrisy will shout to our students and the the... the motivations for scapegoating uh, organizations like WAM and other dis uh, dispensaries that are doing their best to adhere to the rules and regulations set down is conspicuous to our 15-year-olds and 14-year-olds and 12-year-olds. I think that we need to give our, our children in our society more credit and expose them to the compassion ideas that are related to compassion and ideas related to people who are 
uh, entering their golden years facing cancers and all the different issues that we face as we uh, get to that point in life. And I think that our 14 year olds are smart enough to discern between the two. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm short. Hi, my name is Sherry Sachs Hospidor, and I'm a cannabis nurse. And I cannot tell you how many classes I've taken to call myself a cannabis nurse. I hear about Santa Cruz in every single class I take, I, I've taken. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. I also hear about you, and I want to thank you. And you're why I do what I do. I believe in education. I believe that children should be knowledgeable about what's happening to them and that they should be able to um, learn appropriately from adults around them, whether it's their parents, whether it's their school district. I'm also a hemp breeder. Or a ramp, uh, I was a rare hemp seed breeder. I'm no longer a rare hemp seed breeder because Santa Cruz County changed the rules so many times on me, we couldn't keep our license up. And so I really just want to say, please don't change the rules for somebody. When they were playing by your rules, you told them what to do, you met all the criteria, and now the game, cha the game has changed. And it's just not fair. We're doing a lot of help out there for people. We need to protect our patients as well as our children, and there's a way to do that. We can normalize things, as people are telling us. But normalizing is talking about it. It's making it seem normal. It's making it part of their culture so that it's a medicine and it's not something that's a drug because it doesn't have to be. So thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Shana Egling here. Um, I worked in the juvenile <laughs> hall, had foster I was head of foster home for three years, adopted children, and taught. <laughs> um, I have to say, unfortunately, I really do think a lot of it, just like sex education, alcohol, drugs, whatever, it's got to start at the home. And then the home and the school can work together. But so many kids... They get the stress, but where do they get the stress? Sometimes in the womb before they're born. When I was growing up, I didn't like it, but my mom walked me to a party, came in, and tested the punch to see if there was alcohol in it. <laughs> my dad drove me to a party, and when he saw teenage boys hanging out I never went to that party again. <laughs> My parents took responsibility. They worked. When my dad worked, my mom was at home. When my mom worked, my dad was at home. I don't see a lot of excuses nowadays for not educating your kid and what's got to be done. And it's very difficult to have compassion when the parent is stressed out. But as long as we believe in counselors, we believe in church, maybe not religion, but spirituality, we've got plenty of mother nature to lay on the ground, soak in the ocean, relieve stress. We don't have to take it on our kids, and our kids do not have to self-medicate for help. Thank you. Much for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Paul Howard. Good evening. Nope. Good evening. I don't use cannabis. I'm a caregiver for those who do. I've been to meetings with WAM, and I can see what the good people that have health issues are up against. It's tough, you know, dealing with all the things in their life. And then this, in addition, you know, a cannabis uh, place has been... Uh, Authorized. I think this is the last one that's authorized, the fifth one out of the five. But all of a sudden now the goal line's being moved. Oh, wait a minute. Too close to schools. Well, I thought 600 feet was the line that they said it had to be away in it. I think it's 875 or something. Okay. So the good people, I, I'm on everybody's side here. I'm on the good people's side who are 
appealing this, but I'm I'm going to ask, you know, does cannabis come to the students through dispensaries? I just heard a gentleman say on Facebook you can use it you can use a credit card and say you're you know checkbox you're 18 years old and you can get it shipped to your house. Wow. So it sounds to me like the distance, the proximity isn't really an issue and I would ask that you would uh, you know throw out this appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. As the gentleman is as the gentleman is approaching, can I get a show of hands of those who still wish to speak? One. Okay. Why don't you tee up right over here? We'll be right with you. Good evening, sir. Thanks for your time. Um, it's been a long night for everybody. Thank you for sitting. <laughs> Surprised. No one wanted to get up. Um, as a manufacturer of cannabis, and for about 15 to 16 years, and I think about six to eight of it is for uh, WAM patients. Um, I find it interesting that our community has not been able to come together to support the people in need, um, and I find it very interesting and shocking that we are so concerned with the safety of children when, in reality, we have a very safe place for them. Um, I've lived here for quite some time, and the biggest issue that we have is definitely opioids and the issues around coral and lime kiln. Um, it has nothing to do with cannabis or any, any building related to cannabis uh, at all. It's, again, shocking that parents are here to complain about a plant that is very regulated, <clears throat> both medicinally and recreationally, um, and it's, it's shocking. So I hope that we do what we need to do and do what's right. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Uh, I don't want to talk about uh, opposition or being for anything. I do want to bring up, uh, we, we had a family discussion at my home. I have a 17-year-old son. Me and my wife spoke with him. Uh, we received an email from the Santa Cruz City School District asking to sign the petition opposing the dispensary going in. Uh, my son took out his phone, and the school district also sent it to the students, uh, to their student emails asking them to sign the emails as well. The little bit of research that I've done is in the state of California, you have to be a legal registered voter to be a legal signer on a petition. So if there is a thousand signatures on their petition, I would ask the city council and you, Mr. Mayor, to go through those signatures and see if any of them came from student emails. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else online? Last call if you would like to provide testimony on this item. Last call. Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the body. Ms. Brown? I'd like to make a motion to adopt a resolution denying the appeal, recognizing the environmental determination, and upholding the Planning Commission's decision to approve the administrative use permit to establish a cannabis retail facility at 1129 Mission Street. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. You may open on your motion, Ms. Brown. Well, I, um, lots of people had many things to say, and I, a lot, it resonated with me. I understand the, the anxieties that folks who work in the school district um, are, who are dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis have. I hear it here at City Hall as well from our, um, our sample of one <laughs> on the council. I know, and, and when I spoke with uh, folks at the schools and the superintendent, I, it, was, it was really, really, um, it was hard for me to hear how stressed out they are, the, the concerns they have, um, and you know, I want to be supportive. And I, and so I think there's a, a bigger conversation to be had here um, about where s students are getting uh, their cannabis, where they're getting drugs, et cetera. Um, but I can say, um, and, and I love WHAM and all the things that we've talked about, but I want to speak specifically to the, uh, the contents of the appeal, the arguments made in the appeal, 
and um, and what I see as you know a, a bit of a, some analytical leaps between the research that uh, was provided about the harm that cannabis does on uh, youth brains, all of those things I see as really important and uh, things that we need to be working on, and. Um, in my uh, many, I didn't have a whole lot of time, but I, I used to do a lot of lit reviews as an ac and I do still do that as an academic um, researcher, and I could not find any study suggesting that uh, proximity to a dispensary increased uh, cannabis use for youth. Not a one. Um, I'll just quote from one very, very briefly. Um, the availability of medical marijuana, medical marijuana dispensary and adolescent marijuana use. This is the, in the case specifically of medical marijuana. Um, marijuana dispensary around school and adolescent marijuana use examined. Dispensary availability is not associated with use. Um, that's just one of the key findings. And I have many other uh, you know, studies that I've, I've now looked at and tried to, you know, and I think their methodologies are sound based on the methodology, uh, um, you know, training that I received. And so that makes me feel that it, I couldn't adopt the finding saying that there is a detrimental, uh, a detriment to, to youth. Um, I think with the, with the question of whether or not we need to be considering people under 18 as a, a general plan, uh, part of our general plan, um, yes, we do. But that doesn't mean that we have to keep everything away from anybody under 18 that might harm them. That's not happening, and I, I don't see that happening anytime um, in, in the future. What we need to be doing is figuring out wh where <laughs> students are getting these really, really hyper powerful um, substances. You know, the 600 milligram gummy, or the you know the the one that I'm hearing about. These things I'm learning about, and and that's not what's happening in dispensaries. And um, this is an incredibly responsible um, business with an incredible partner. It's not about Wham, but it is about Wham as well. And um, so I want to thank you for um, being responsible and being willing to work with the city. Um, and, and I hope that my colleagues uh, will think about the, the kind of the lack of, of evidence and data to suggest that a, a dispensary in this place is going to do harm. Um, cannabis availability on this scale, yes. For, but that's not the dispensary. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Further debate or discussion? The vice mayor's recognition. So um, I did still have some questions just after hearing all about WAM. My understanding is WAM is not on this application. And when I spoke with Valerie, you'd already partnered with Bryce, but no one could explain to me why they were even brought into consideration. And so I just don't understand, other than the logical conclusion that you're selling the license that you got for free from the city. And so is that, that's what's happening? Is that the investment of the money? I don't know if someone can answer that or if it's appropriate. I don't know. Ms. Corral, would you like to? Yeah. Yes. Very good, Thank please. Thank you for the, the question. <laughs> Yes, what we are doing is selling the license because we have massive debt. Um, we are partnering with The Hook, who has agreed to take on the responsibility, which is pretty massive. There's a, there's a financial um, equation in running the business and doing the administrative pieces. While we offer free cannabis, it costs money to provide it. And so, for instance, if we give away $100 worth of cannabis, which we do very often, it costs about $140 for us to do that. So it's not, it, raising funds to be able to continue this has to occur within the context of a business partner. So we are partnering and I am stepping out of my role as an administrator, which you probably, let me just put it this way, you'd rather have me by your deathbed than doing your, your books. So, um, and I, you know, I'm fine with that. I'm, you know, I actually take great pride in it. I feel that 
I know that this is the only way for us to move okay. forward and to continue to do our work. Okay. So Thank I won't you. belabor this. Thank you. Okay, so I think I, I, I hear that WAM's a wonderful organization. We spoke at length on the phone. I felt like we had similar values in terms of not wanting access to youth. Um, what you said struck a chord with me when you said kids aren't running amok through Safeway being crazed with alcohol until I had a realization that actually, that's actually where the kids steal the alcohol. I picked up my drunk 15-year-old. The cops picked her up. They called me. They said, come down to the beach. Your daughter's here. She's face down in the sand. She's incoherent. Where'd you get the alcohol the next day? They stole the Santa Cruz Junior Guards, <laughs> the captains, went to Safeway, stole the vodka, infinite wisdom of our state, our no chase policy. The kids walked right out, helped themselves. And, um, you know, I do think that I grew up in Santa Cruz. So you certainly can get whatever you want from wherever you want. Um, you can get it at school, you can get it um, at people's homes. There's cool parents. I'm not one of those that offered up. It's, there was one of the speakers, I think uh, her name was, um, where was she down here, that, that spoke that, Phoenix, that said it's the responsibility of the parents. And that also resonated with me. I agree, it is the responsibility of the parents. Unfortunately, I've been working in schools for 24 years. There's a lot of not responsible parents and parents that want to be their kid's friend, and that's just not the reality. And so this falls back on schools, just one more thing that falls on schools. Nothing's happening in terms of enforcement. I also want to say, as somebody that grew up here, went to Santa Cruz High, would go get a muffin on a 10-minute break, I also was able to go off campus, get stoned to go back to class. I haven't smoked pot since high school, but I can confidently say that the, others, the, the stoner kids from Santa Cruz High, some of them have grown up to have successful careers, but 100% of the homeless people that I see around Santa Cruz that were in my Santa Cruz High class of the 90s were the stoner kids. So some kids, whatever, you know, made the choices, made their choice. And, um, and so that's my personal experience. And so I, I looked at this, the data online while we were sitting in the meeting, and some of the, the California Healthy Kids survey data showed that um, for kids that have used uh, marijuana, it said it, it, for the 21 to 23 year, it was 38% um, of kids down in PVUSD that were 11th graders, 48% in SLV and Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, it's in SCHS, so I don't know if it's just that or if it's Harbor also, but at 55%, and then the alternative ed was at 66%. And that was a lot higher than other averages around the state. I have have thought for decades that our counterculture and our acceptance of drug culture has contributed to um, the downfall of some people's lives. I am not saying that everything that happens um, that alcohol is not bad or that there's other types of drug abuse that I don't want to sound like Nancy Reagan. But I do feel that spending my whole career working with youth, I, I, when someone said tipping the scales, I cannot take even one step if it's t tipping the scales at all. And so I, I understand that it might be a blow to wham. And I do see that you can still operate. Mr. Berryessa still has two operations in the county. I also saw the letter from some of my esteemed political colleagues and all of those people, none of them is raising young adults or high school students. I didn't see a lot of people up here with, I saw maybe half a dozen with kids my age. My son has a scannable fake ID. He's 20. I know it scans. I've seen it happen. And I'm saying that you... Excuse there's, me, Madam yeah, Vice. Yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. You do that one more time, and you're going to be thrown out of this meeting. I started this meeting by saying we would respect you. You respect us. You do that one more time, you're not here. You understand that or not? Do you understand that? Do you understand that? All right. I'm not... I, the vice chair has the floor. So for me, this is about um, the ease of access when you can get a 
fake ID scannable. You can get a two pack from a plug or a kid or from China that completely works everywhere. I know for a fact, one of the dispensary owners, I've known kids that have gone in there, not been carded. I've seen it on friends' fake statements from kids that are under 21. I've seen kids go to the ER completely um, throwing up um, with having to get IVs over and over and over again because of the level of potency. And yes, it is on the parents, but not all kids have parents that are there to um, educate them and teach them. And that is, unfortunately, the responsibility of the schools. And I think that's why the schools felt so passionately about this. And I, I didn't really think about the, the um, access and um, the, the increased risk of use until actually I was on council and Shepard Calendari Johnson convinced me that this was a, a, a concern in, in terms of alcohol and tobacco and cannabis. And so she has changed my mind in terms of access. But now, I mean, I have to, to stand with kids that do not have parents that can make good decisions for them. And I'm, I can't support this. I'm going to have to, just a second, uh, I'm going to, I, I need uh, the, uh, whoever was speaking on behalf of the appellant, who's, who's speaking on behalf of the appellant? You have five minutes. Let's go. And then we'll continue the debate and discussion on the motion. Ned Olson again. Um, the vast majority of support today, and that from Senator Laird and Gail Pellerin and others, is in support of WAM. And as incredible as WAM and Valerie Corral are, this application is not for a WAM dispensary. WAM's name will not be on the monument sign. WAM is not an applicant on uh, the application. There is no evidence in the planning file about WAM's role in this operation other than three small paragraphs in a 95-page operation plan. In the face of the school districts and appeal opposition, these three paragraphs have grown under uh, a professional public relation campaign to the point where now the perception is that this is a WAM dispensary, not what it is, a hook retail cannabis store with an incidental use as a place to distribute WAM's products. Um, Valerie Corral and WAM deserve our respect and support. Let's come together as a community to find a solution that doesn't come at the cost of our children. We've heard multiple speakers question whether proximity matters. This is not in dispute, really. It's well known that proximity matters. Uh, that's true for liquor stores, tobacco, and cannabis. And if you don't believe the research, use common sense, advertising works. The $250 billion advertising industry is based on proximity. Um, what we are asking you today is to set aside the distractions and the political pressure and make a decision that is based on facts. Consider the following as you are making your decision. Cannabis harms children physically, mentally, and emotionally. Our children are in a crisis. We need to leverage all the tools we have to help them, including smart land use decisions. The cannabis ordinance was specifically written to protect children and schools from cannabis uses. It explicitly says that cannabis and schools are incompatible uses. Proximity matters, and that concept is codified in the cannabis ordinance. If you find that the cannabis use is within proximity or in the surrounding area of the school, the findings require you to deny the application. This is about the well-being of generations of Santa Cruz youth. We ask you to trust the science and trust our school leaders, our doctors, and our addiction counselors who have no interest, who have no interest in this other than the well-being of our youth. They are telling you that this location is too close to our school. 
prioritize the health and well-being of our youth over a single recreational cannabis retailer and deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Matter is back before the body. Council members. Mayor Keeley. Um, sir. If, if I could address, uh, Vice, Vice Golders had a question about the relationship between WAM and ourselves, and Val didn't actually clarify it. Would I get the opportunity to further clarify the that? Vice Mayor is satisfied with the answer she received. Understood. Thank you. Sir? He's entitled to uh, a rebuttal as well. Okay. The appellant uh, okay. had an opportunity to speak, right. and the applicant is also afforded that. Thank you. Uh, uh, I got to say that is not. I thought that's what you announced at the outset not of the meeting. In our process, that is not part of our process. You're going to need to tell me, show me where it is. Then, um, I stand corrected. You're corrected. All right, matters back before the body. Excuse me. Matters back before the body. Uh, I'll be glad to make some comments. Um, let me start with. Uh, where did I first become familiar with this? I first became familiar when a letter arrived in my office as mayor from the school district. And the letter enumerated all kinds of bad things that happened to youth who use marijuana, who use cannabis. Um, I will tell you I felt that the letter was patronizing in that Maybe it assumed that at 73 years old, I had never heard that. Um, I've heard it for decades. I understand it, and I believe it. Uh, that became the basis of the opposition, and I spoke with the school superintendent on two occasions. We uh, met uh, on two occasions on this because beyond the question of what it does to youth, which I'm willing to stipulate, I was interested in understanding where the evidence is that this is a problem. And in my two meetings with the superintendent, she couldn't provide any. We then had a meeting last week in which Mr. O'Brien, who is here tonight, was asked directly if he had any evidence that tied middle school and high school use of cannabis to dispensaries, and he said he didn't have any. He had another opportunity tonight to provide that, and he doesn't have any. So those who say, I want you to make your decision based on evidence, and I want you to listen to the experts, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to believe that in the absence of any evidence, to the contrary, not people's assertions, not their anecdotal belief, because I believe that the plural of anecdote is not evidence. I believe that evidence is evidence. And there's not been one study or one report submitted to us that says that dispensaries in the state of California regulated the way they are, and in our city, with our distance and our regulations, that there is evidence in the city of Santa Cruz that the access to marijuana or cannabis is through dispensaries in any significant number. Now, I have not been shown that. And both sides have asked all along for months now to base the decision on evidence. So I will say on that point, I have seen none. As to the issue of distance, We've, we've spent a lot of time on that issue in the last couple of months. Where did the 600 feet come from? 600 feet came from state law. You can either go up or down from that if you wish to, if you want to adopt a local ordinance, but the default position is 600 feet. So in the city of Santa Cruz, the decision was made to have an ordinance that says 600 feet. That may be a question we want to revisit someday. I don't know. Uh, we've got a subcommittee that's examining taxes, licenses, uh, distances, safety issues. We, we had a full report on this in this morning's agenda. We're going to continue to work on, on those four topics because they are of interest and make some sense. But as to what is presented today, 
it, it, I don't believe that there's a compelling case uh, that can be made that this application is going to be causally related to increased use by middle schoolers and high schoolers. If I thought for a second that was going to be the case, I'd be making a very different speech here than the one I'm making. But I think in the absence of it, we are compelled to grant this license, to grant this uh, 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 administrative permit, uh, and, to, and to deny uh, the, uh, the appeal as I see it. Now, I know there are others who wish to speak. Ms. Contar Johnson, I know you, you wish to speak. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I do want to speak to some of the points you brought up. But first, I just want to thank everybody who's here tonight and who wrote letters. I know this is a very heated topic. And I feel a little bit of deja vu from C4 days. I think Val and Pat and Bryce can remember that. Um, and, and what that shows me is that our community, whatever side you're on, really cares. And we have a shared value of community well-being, um, whether it's for people who are ill and need the support of medical cannabis, or it's for the young people in our community. Um, I have been in the field of youth prevention for decades here in this community. I've dedicated my professional career to youth well-being. I've worked with many of you in this room. Um, I don't think that we are here to argue the merits of medical cannabis. There's a lot of research that shows that. We're not here to argue um, the impacts on the developing youth brain. There's a lot of research that shows that. Um, and to the point that the mayor was making around evidence and proximity, um, so we've heard a lot of evidence tonight, and they contradict each other. Do you guys notice that? Um, again, deja vu. And, and that's not because one side is trying to misuse evidence. That's because there's contradictory evidence out there. So I will respond and say there is evidence that shows that density and proximity impacts um, perception of harm of substances. I'm talking about substances across the board. It impacts uh, availability. It impacts accessibility and ultimately use. There is a lot of research reputable research in the public health field that points to that. Um, we don't have local evidence. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely right. And I will say that's, that's our flaw as well. I asked earlier um, during the presentation if we do decoy and sting operations. We do not. So we need to work on that. Um, California Healthy Kids Survey doesn't ask that question. The survey that was given to us by CPP is you know, eight years old. Mm -hmm. So we need to collect better data on where young people are accessing. Um, so that's an aside, and I think that uh, I have some thoughts on, on some direction for that. Um, I do want to say I've worked closely with Val. I do consider you a mentor. Again, I think this whole entire room can unanimously say, unanimously say that you are a local hero, and we are fortunate to have you here. Um, I have worked with Mr. Berryessa and um, know you to be an individual with integrity and um, who also cares about youth. Um, having said all of that, yeah, you're going to hear me ping-ponging a little bit here. Having said all of that, this location, I, I, it's not the right location. We have rules and regulations that say 600 feet. I think our rules and regulations are flawed. The public health field says the best practice is 1,000 feet. Um, so like, I, I feel that as, as a, a parent, a uh, prevention advocate, um, as a, I think, an ally and a friend to the cannabis industry, it's not the right location. Now, having said that, the rules on the books are the rules on the books. And, and I do firmly hear what folks are saying, that it's um, unfair to change the goalposts, so to speak. Um, bear with me here. I'm, I'm ping-ponging, I realize. Uh, you can see what's been going on in my brain over the last couple months as well. Um, what did I want to say? So I think this, this, 
this whole experience gives us an opportunity to look at our framework. I will be proposing a longer and larger um, distance requirement as we look at our ordinance. Um, and I will be asking that we look at why we fall short on some of the youth um, safeguards when we're scored by the public health field. Um, and I'm, I'm, I will be proposing some of those safeguards. What else did I want to say? Um, Oh, there's been a lot of conversation about responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. Every single one of us. Parents, educators, government leaders, industry. And Mr. Mallow said this, uh, industry has shown up with the Children's Fund, mm -hmm. um, you know, with putting in the Lock It Up, um, Talk It Up campaign. It's every single one of our responsibility. So let's not point fingers and, and say the parents should do it, you should parent better, uh, the teachers should do it. They're doing a hell of a good job, our teachers and our educators. So it's every single one of our responsibilities. Um, I guess I'll just finish with, you know, I have a 14 year old and a, and a 16 year old and they go to the two schools. <laughs> so I have kids at both of these schools and I ask them their opinion and they're like, well, yeah, maybe kids don't get it at the dispensary that's not where our friends get it, but that's a really crappy location, excuse my language. So again, like just trying to reconcile all of this, right? What the research says, um, where I stand as a prevention advocate and a mother, um, what I know about sort of the judicial process and the laws. Um, so if we move forward with this, there are some addition, uh, additional conditions that um, council member Watkins and I have worked on. Um, I see Councilmember Newsom nodding. You, know, you have some additional conditions. Um, so if we move forward with this, I, I, I would very reluctantly support it with these additional conditions. Let me see if what you are prepared to do at this time is offer any of those. Are you, are no, you go going to be making amendments or you wish to do that at a later stage this evening? What is your preference? Sure. I'll jump in. Please go. Okay. Um, we, and I can send this to you. Oh, you, okay. Okay, there we go. I gotta put my glasses on. Actually, I'll just look at my screen. Um, so, you know, we, we heard about fake IDs. Um, again, just because we don't have them in place doesn't, just because we don't have the data doesn't mean it's not happening. So um, one of the conditions is the requirement to submit fake ID reports quarterly. The I'm gonna read these. The establishment must submit reports detailing any instances of fake identification usage on a quarterly basis to the appropriate authorities. And what we discovered when we did this deep dive um, as we were looking at the larger framework is that that's not in place right now. The the uh, dispensaries can. Uh, no, no, let's do this. Do you want me to just read make, it? Make okay. your motion, then you can make your argument. Thank you. Make your right. motion first. Thank you. Um, the second is no sales to individuals under 21 during school hours and no sale to individuals under 19 as previ previously approved and I believe um, um, uh, agreed upon by uh, the applicant. Um, so sales of restricted products are prohibited to individuals under the age of 21 during designated school hours, including for the hour immediately before school opens and for the hour immediately after school ends. The third piece is collaboration with schools and mitigation of impact. So any outlet situated within a thousand feet from a school must actively collaborate with the local school district to mitigate the impact of its operation on the surrounding area and to address any challenges that may arise. This collaboration aims to ensure the safety and well-being of students and the community as a whole. Marketing materials, including outside murals and advertisement, must not target youth or encourage underage consumption. This shall be done in collaboration with the school district and city staff. The fourth is provisional approval with conditional terms. So the approval granted is contingent upon the establishment um, of maintaining compliance with all regulations and requirements. Any violation could result in the revocation of the license. 
Um, and the fifth condition is um, annual review of the permit. So review of this permit shall be conducted one, one year from the date that the establishment is granted occupancy or opens for business if no building permits are requested prior to opening to ensure the use is operating in conformance with the conditions of approval and should include documentation of free or reduced cost cannabis provided to low-income medical cannabis users. This review will be conducted by the staff, reviewed by the Planning Commission, and presented findings to the City Council. Let me see if that is, we'll start with the easiest possible way to do this. Is this acceptable to the maker of the motion? I have a few questions. Certainly, go ahead. M most of it is, but I find some of these to seem a little um, onerous. And so I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, um, quarterly reports? I, that probably isn't a big deal, but um, quarterly report seems awfully often considering we, but it's fine if if everybody feels fine with it. I just think it, you know, it's, it's again one of those um, adding additional, um, adding additional requirements coming from this place of assuming they're going to do things they're not going to be good actors, and I find that disrespectful, but if this is what it takes to get us there, I'm willing to accept that. Um, the only thing that I want to, if you could scroll, okay, so on the th collaboration with the schools and mitigation of impact, I guess I'm just wondering how, what, what kinds of mitigations are you expecting the business to do, and, and what would the impacts be that you're expecting them to mitigate? I just, I'd like to understand yeah. that. If I could actually just say that, um, this isn't a targeting of this um, this establishment. This is a, ho a framework that I am hoping that we will propose as a larger framework as the, as the work of the subcommittee. So I just I want to name that. So okay, but that, so, so you want to write it into their conditions of approval, Correct. but the intention is that this would be required for all businesses. Okay, I mean, right. I, it. Yeah, I, I see that our city it's attorney agreeable to the. To, uh, these are all agreeable. Well, I want to. I, I would like to get an answer to the. You know, what are the impacts that you're expecting, and what kinds of mitigations would you be expecting? Uh, the maker of maker the friendly of the amendment, who's been working on this committee and thinking about this. Sure. Um, actually, Mr. Barrios has spoke to some of the um, some of the prevention plan, uh, efforts that his business has participated in, in the past. So one is, for example, the talk it up, lock it up campaign, uh, working directly with prevention partners, working directly with the school districts to ensure that, for example, a talk it up, lock it up campaign is implemented. So those details could be determined in those conversations between um, uh, the applicant and school districts. And I don't know if um, Councilmember Watkins wants to add to that piece. If I may. Is, what I'm trying to do here is make sure we manage the motion. We have a main motion. We have a friendly amendment so far. Uh, I want to make sure that what we're doing procedurally is we are managing towards getting a motion on the floor here. So, Ms. Brown, are there elements of this? Are, are you accepting or not accepting this as a friendly amendment? If not, that's okay. We can move through uh, as motions to amend. So I guess the way you want to do I, it. Yeah, I apologize for kind of not being clear about that, but I, I'm willing to accept them, assuming I get what I think is a, a, at least for me, acceptable answer to some of the questions because I'm not clear about what they're asking so for. Are you in a colloquy with my with our colleague? Is that I'm in what you're agreement. To do? I'm in a. I, I will accept the friendly amendment. But not the provisional approval with conditional terms until I hear more about that. Okay. So well, items, I want to make sure I know what you said. Then item one, two, three, and five. If these are, um, they don't seem onerous to me, and I think we ought to be doing them anyway. And now that I've heard this is for our thinking about our entire policy, fine. If we're not adding an additional condition to this one business, this is something we want to achieve for the, the city, fine. Um, so yes, so one, two, three. And five. And five. Okay. I'd like to understand why this business would receive a conditional approval or provisional approval um, and why that needs to be called out because my understanding is that 
if you don't follow the rules, you lose your <laughs> you lose your license anyway. Let so me, why are we calling let it me out? See if we can get the city attorney to clarify on this point. That's right. This is an administrative use permit. It allows the city council to adopt conditions. One of the conditions is that the business or that the applicant not conduct its business in a manner that constitutes a nuisance, a, a pattern of sales to underage uh, customers would constitute a nuisance and would be grounds for the initiation of revocation proceedings. Um, I read this condition as not altering our process, which would require notice and a hearing and due process in order to revoke a permit. But a violation, depending on the nature of it and its severity, could constitute grounds for revocation, which would be through a public process similar to the permit process in the first instance. In that case, I'd like to strike number four. I will accept the friendly amendment with striking number four since it's already covered in okay. our Fair enough. policy. So items one, two, three, and five are agreed to uh, by friendly amendment. Uh, let me ask Ms. Kalantari Johnson, uh, number four is not being accepted that way. Uh, do you wish to make a motion to amend to include item four? If what I'm understanding right from the city attorney that we have this process in place, okay, then that's fine. Very good. Um, Can I ask for clarification on item three? Yes, sir. It reads to me like a policy which it sounds like council member Kalantari Johnson is interested in bringing back to the city council an amendment to our distance requirements at a future meeting, which would be an ordinance change, which is perfectly fine. For purposes of tonight's action, what I would suggest is that the condition state that the applicant shall actively collaborate and the rest of the condition as it's written. That would work for me. It works for Council Members Brown and Newsom. I sure Ms. Bush understands that amendment. Sorry, Bonnie, delete any out let situated less than 1,000 feet from a school must and replace it with the applicant shall. Agreeable? Agreeable. Agreeable is second. I, Good enough. Mayor, I have um, additional direction that's not a condition. Can I propose that now? Please. Okay, and I've sent that to you, Bonnie. And the additional direction is to direct Santa Cruz Police Department to work with prevention partners to develop a cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco prevention plan, including prioritizing regular decoy sting operations to ensure businesses are operating legally and utilizing best practices for safeguarding access to youth. Okay. Ms. Brown. Just procedurally wondering, because this is, this is an appeal and it's not a ag regular agenda item, can we separate those? It, or, it seems like it would be more appropriate to separate those. I'm, I'm happy to consider both, but additional direction around an appeal of a specific project that is to our departments to do a citywide initiative feels like it should just be separate. Uh, any question which can be divided will be divided based on a request by a member. So if you request are requesting, to divide. that will be a separate motion that we can take uh, separate and apart from the motion on the appeal. So, excuse me, hold your thought. And we'll get there after we do the appeal vote. Further questions come? Council Member Newsom is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, I first uh, uh, same want to um, just thank everyone who came out and spoke tonight and, and for the uh, discussion that we had. Uh, you know, uh, Similar to, as been stated, uh, you know, I, I've seen no data or evidence that supports the claim that cannabis dispensaries in our community and or the hook outlet sells to underage customers. And we've received letters from the Capitola PD stating that Mr. Barry F. says operated within the rules of Capitola and their application meets all standards for operating this type of business in our community. And a uh, majority of the points of contact that I've received from emails and letters and the public um, Comment have been in support of this application almost to a over two to one um, in favor. So I support uh, Mr. Barry S. and Ms. Corral's uh, application. Uh, we have heard, um, as we said, concerns about the possibility that dispensaries make it easier for uh, youth in our community to uh, purchase cannabis. And I want to thank uh, Councilmember McCullough and Tari Johnson for the uh, 
or added um, conditions that she uh, um, offered. Um, and I also want to say that there are safeguards in place that if these concerns do materialize, that that will eventually lead to a, uh, their license being revoked. Um, I also, as well, wanted to give uh, direction. I'm not sure if you want to separate it or not, but it is my understanding that we have a shoulder tap ordinance in relation to alcohol sales, which outlaws the practice of an adult um, you know, purchasing alcohol for someone who is underage. Uh, and I'd like to give direction to staff to create a similar or ordinance for cannabis and then bring that to the council at a future meeting. Would that be? So we'll do this. All of these that are not related to the appeal, we will take up separately. Okay. Okay. Further on, further on the appeal. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I've been ignoring Ms. Watkins. She sits right next to me. Please excuse me. And then Ms. Bruner. Ms. Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. No problem. Um, I think Councilmember Kalantari Johnson really shared a lot of how I've been feeling about this item. Um, and I appreciate her work and, and time to come up with some of the conditions that feel good for us to move forward in this direction. I think um, what I heard today, and I think it really reinforces what Councilmember Kalantari just Johnson said, is there's a lot of things that can be true at the same time. And there are struggles with our educators mm. dealing with substances in our classrooms and in our schools. That is for sure. I know it, I worked in education for years. I had intakes with kids and families that were experiencing things that no parent should ever have to go through. No. That is totally true. And this has been a healing plant for people who we heard their testimony today. So there is truth in all ways that's really hard sometimes to hold at the same time. But that's what I heard tonight. I. Similarly agree with Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. I don't love the location. And I was part of the original council that voted on how to move forward with some of these policies. They've changed over the years. I voted to increase the tax rate. A lot of the cannabis partners didn't particularly love me at that moment. But we all shared, including the district, including Valerie and others from the industry, a commitment to have a portion of those revenue dollars going to our kids in prevention. And that's been an outcome of that. Mm -hmm. We have since changed that. The voters have since codified that policy. That's a value of our community. That is, that is something we all can agree on. And I think we share a lot of those same values, regardless where we stand on this specific item. Um, you know, in terms of the, the points that were made, I, I don't need to repeat what I believe was heard. I think it's really, it's just a challenge, it's a challenge. And I don't think we really were prepared for what was to come with the legalization of cannabis and the concentration of the products that are landing in the hands of our kids. Um, and I think we want to support our local providers. One of the things that I advocated against was allowing for transferring of licenses. I thought the city would want to maintain control over that. I didn't win on that one, and the council voted to change that. And and <laughs> I'm not doing it. I told you so. But um, but that's just the reality because you're trying to weigh all of the things right in terms of how you're moving forward with this policy. And we have not gotten it right. Mm -hmm. And we continue to need to revisit it so that we are iterative and we're looking for continuous improvement. I feel comfortable given the um, conditions that have been accepted, and I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the work to get there and, and our input from the city attorney to help us design these. Um, and, I, and I look forward to continuing to work with the entire community. As was said, this is all of our responsibility. The health and the well-being of our kids is our responsibility. Um, health in all policies is about designing healthy communities. That's not about density of alcohol outlets. That's not about density of cannabis outlets or access to tobacco. And that is true. And we know that that has impacts. It's about designing communities that are healthy, that have active opportunities for our children and safeguards for them as well. Um, and we can do better. And I'm committed to doing better as we move forward in this direction. So I. Um, I want to thank everybody who spoke. I know it has been hard, and um, and I look forward to moving together in hopefully a way that keeps everybody safe and uh, thriving. Thank, thank you, you. Mayor. Council Member Bruno. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you uh, for everyone's testimony and speaking, and even those who shared their uh, thoughts online with us. And um, you know, this has been several months of a deep dive that we've all taken and studied and learned so much. And um, as my colleagues have stated, there is a both and. And that has been made clear. Um, but what is clear to me is that this is about an administrative use permit and an appeal to that administrative use permit. Separately, there is this topic of substance use in our community, which is very prevalent um, and affecting our youth. And um, I see it as a separate thing from this uh, administrative use permit that follows um, all current uh, uh, policies in place. Um, I appreciate the intention that uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson is bringing um, to this motion. However, I think that um, from our earlier item, number 21, this is um, the work of the cannabis subcommittee that was recently formed. And those suggestions should be explored and part of that subcommittee work that's in process um, and moving forward to explore taxation and distance and license transfers and all of the topics that were brought up. That having that as a condition for an administrative use permit and applying it across the board for the other four cannabis licenses without having the review of the committee and exploration of what that all affects and how how that is I think is a premature but good and I understand your intentions um, so I think you know just a, a week or so ago, I saw some of you, there was a um, fentanyl high uh, documentary screening, one night screening at the Rio Theater. Um, there will be another screening May 15th, apparently, in Watsonville. But I went to the screening because it was um, filmed by a Los Gatos High School junior at the time, and there was a great panel afterwards of various health professionals as well as the student that filmed this uh, movie from a youth perspective and um, really tried to get at the reason why youth are turning to substances in the first place. And um, what I found really hopeful and um, promising were, was the speakers, the panel afterwards, and the work that some of these health professionals are really doing um, regarding uh, providing programs and access to activities, um, classes on what a healthy relationship looks like. Um, classes on identifying and articulating and naming your feelings and healthy coping strategies. Um, and all of that exists and it's work to be done. But again, that's separate and I, from this administrative use permit. Um, I really hope that um, our newly formed Children's Fund, you know, I think it will be coming up on the first recommendation from the oversight committee of that new fund on how those funds should be um, used in our community. I think right now we have a whole room of people that could work together and really um, find ways that support our youth. Um, I am in support of denying this appeal. Um, I'm not necessarily in support of these friendly amendments. Um, I just don't feel like it's been explored um, and it should be part of the ongoing work of the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you. On the motion with regard to the appeal, Ms. Brown. I just wanted to make one quick comment to say, I, I, I just responding uh, to Councilmember Bruner, I, I hear you. I also see these amendments as a bit premature, and it's not 
totally orthodox to, to do something like this where we don't have a policy that's fully baked and we're asking uh, a, a business to accept those. Um, given that they're relatively, they don't seem entirely onerous. I'm looking though at, um, uh, I'm, I, I think if I could, I would like to hear, we do this all the time, ask staff, what do you think? I would like to hear, I, they seem not too onerous to me and that's why I accepted them. Um, if there's a problem with going this route, I would like to hear. Could you bring them back up please? I think a core concern in this process is that, you know, we had this direction from staff that we had met and abided by all these rules. And what we found out in that process is there was a provision that was largely subjective. And number three is largely subjective. And I would really ask the city council that there's a definitive, clear, and well written out conditions of approval such as we have for every other dispensary and that anything that gets added is not subjective because we cannot deal with that stress. It is not fair for us to continue to ask us to invest to get this across the finish line when there is not a concrete set of rules that we have to play by. I, I beg you to not do that to me and my partner and to our community. It's just, it's too much. Furthermore, I think that there is a cannabis subcommittee that's addressing these things. We've just asked to be treated the same as everyone else. If you choose to not do that tonight, at least give us a concrete set of rules that our hands are not in collaboration with a party that is hostile and that is clearly stated on public record that there's nothing that we could do to convince them that that location is good. Even with best intentions in the conversations tonight, that doesn't give us security or safety that we have a future in Santa Cruz, even if you have vote to approve us this evening. So, um, you know, we have proven that we work with the community. We are content. We're in conversations with uh, the superintendent on uh, working on our, our safe cannabis net. We have an active campaign going on right now that we'll do annually. This is the, our core provisions anyway. We don't mind doing these things because we've done them for years, but please, for the love of God, do not make this subjective. I will have a mental breakdown, just to be perfectly honest with you. It's not fair to me at this point. We've, we've done everything we can to be a good partner and abide by the rules. Please make the rules clear. The last thing I would say is in regards to four, the conditions of approval have to be met by every dispensary. If we don't meet them, you have every legal entitlement to revoke our license. We, you don't need to add anything further to that. Every incentive on us is to abide by the rules and regulations because you guys have the, all the power to take it away from us. So thank you. Yeah. So, if I may, um, with that, I, I, I do want to revisit number three because I, I do. F let's and, do this, Ms. Brown. Let's do uh, yeah. this. Let's put the entire motion. Yeah, please, that let's is please it put it up. Exists. We're going to put that up and then you have the floor as soon as Thank that you. happens. Of course. I mean, I'm doing this to get the support, but <laughs> if it's really problematic for um, uh, the, the operator, I want to. I want to make sure it's clarified. So I think what I, if I could, what I would like to ask uh, Council Member Calendari Johnson to think about is, um, can we revise that number three um, to to indicate that the, the condition will be to follow the policy set forth by the council following the um, coming recommendations from the subcommittee, rather than being very specific about who they are to engage with and under what conditions. Can we, can we because this is, I, I think you said you're, you're, you've set this up for everybody. It's showing up here. Is there a way that we can, um, include some kind of alternative language that would suggest, you know, engagement with affected stakeholders, what, however we're going to sort of, that will play out because it, it won't necessarily be the school district in every case, right? So can we generalize that um, and say that it would be following the policy set forth by council um, and then get rid of the specifics on collaborating with the school district? I, um, 
I'm confused as to why this is onerous when I've heard Mr. Berryessa say that there is more than a willingness to collaborate with the school district. So I'm, I'm confused as to why this language is problematic. Okay, what we're not going to do is go back and forth. Yeah, with so. Those who have done, it doesn't I, matter before the body. I heard it is, and what I heard Mr. Berryessa say was. It is traumatic for him to think about being forced into a negotiation with the school district over his ability to operate because they have already said nothing they do is going to satisfy them and they still oppose. So he, he and I, I take that seriously. Um, and, and so I guess I'm just asking if we could think about generalizing that so that it's not a you know, specific set of instructions to do something that the applicant has said he's, it makes him afraid. Might I suggest a course of action here sure. unless you want to respond? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I think that, uh, let's, let's make sure I can see the whole motion here. As I understand it, the first is to, there we go, there we go. We're adopting the resolution to deny the appeal. It seems like number one, if I understand it correctly, is neither objectionable to the applicant. There's been no testimony that indicates that that's a problem. Number two, the applicant has not indicated that's an issue. Number three, I think, starts moving into something beyond this particular application. I wonder uh, you've done great work on the on the ad hoc committee. I wonder if this is an item number three that can be removed from this motion and we can work on that at the ad hoc committee level. Would that work for you? I'm not comfortable with it being completely removed. Okay. What language um, do you want to try to work on then? Council Member Watkins might have a suggestion. Council Member Watkins is recognized. <laughs> I do have a suggestion. Sure. <laughs> I um, appreciate the flexibility because we worked on this together. I, I do hear um, sort of the nuances around the ambiguity of this. And I think what could be underneath the intention is the mitigation of impact and specifically the marketing materials, including the outside murals and advertisements um, that are not targeted towards youth and underage consumption is a very specific element that I think uniquely applies to this application and this location that for me feels appropriate to have as a condition of approval. And certainly that should be looked at holistically in terms of policy, but I think that's an appropriate condition of approval. I, um, I hear you and um, I can see the face. I can see your face, and my question is probably something that might be on your minds. Um, does this mean that the school district can monitor and veto, or I mean, like, how, how does that play you can even out? Take, I mean, it just who, really whoa, 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 whoa. Who, who, one at a time. Ms. Brown has the floor. How, how would that play out? And if it, it I, I just worry that it's going to be set up to say, if the school district objects, they have to you know, stop doing what they're doing. And I, I, I that, it, that is a concern. I mean, that is not something that we want to be even, I mean, I'm not going to touch that. So I hear you don't want to remove it entirely and have that be a, con a generalized conversation about our cannabis policy um, that you want it in here. Um, but I'm hearing that it's it's too much, and so <laughs> at some point we're going to have to make a decision. Is there a way to generalize it that you know they'll follow the policies that we bring forward in the future? If you if that is possible, I'll keep, let's keep, I'll keep it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to back back up and say I'd no, like I understand. to. Yeah, I understand. So, Ms. Contar Johnson. I'd like to find um, a middle ground that works for the applicants and for us as a council, um, follow the f policy set forth by council. I mean, that seems also really vague, so maybe the language is changed to um, collaborate with stakeholders um, to address challenges. That doesn't get as specific as the school district. Um, I see Mr. Butler maybe has a suggestion. 
Thank you, Council Member and Mayor. Um, just a, a proposal that you, you may consider um, could be something along the following lines. Host a minimum of two public meetings during the first year of operation to understand real or perceived impacts of the business on the surrounding area. Document the recommendations from those constituents and provide responses to those as to whether or not they would or would not address them. That seems even more onerous. <laughs> it's, it's specific in terms of how it can be met. Okay. If, that, um, if the lack of specificity is the concern, then that gives some specificity. It is not requiring that they would um, take any specific action. It's just requiring, as I drafted it here, um, that they um, provide responses. Um, some of that information could also be forwarded to the cannabis subcommittee, as I would expect that um, some of the feedback that we receive from constituents is um, brought more broadly applicable. So um, I just want to be clear that the council, so that the council understands what this would and would not do. You want, I can email it to you. Um, I just typed it a second. I'll, I'll email it to you. We're going to take a pause. That is on its way to you. We'll take a pause. Ms. Contar, John, I'm assuming you're going to want to read that, mm -hmm. see if that's acceptable to you. Ms. Brown will want you to pay attention to that one as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ms. Contar Johnson has the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure this gets to what we want to get to. Um, I think it adds an obligatory community meeting that will be this all over again. And frankly, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in actual partnership um, with impacted stakeholders. Um, so. I don't know, I'm gonna to look to my colleague who I worked on this with, if that's okay with you, Mayor. Um, I, just, I just think this, isn't, this doesn't get to what we're trying to get to. I, I would like to see some deep collaboration. Maybe we don't spell out school district, maybe it's a, worded differently. It, uh, it occurs to me that maybe a way to move through this. It seems that we're at a bit of an impasse on this. I, unless there's an objection, what I would like to do is take up the motion on whether or not to grant the appeal, that emotion, that motion is on the floor. There are two issues attached to that which are not objectionable to anyone, as I understand it. Is that correct? Okay. With that objection, what I would like to do is take those items up, and then if we need to take up additional direction to the subcommittee, or you want to make additional motions on this, all of that would be fine. I think we've reached a point of diminishing returns in terms of the debate and discussion. Ms. Watkins, for what purpose? Uh, if, I, if I may, Mayor, um, for, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're, you're suggesting we'll vote on the motion and the friendly amendments included that have been accepted, correct? That's correct. The motion to deny uh, and the uh, two items that are attached to that, items one and two. There we go. Motion to deny one, two, and five, essentially. 
four was removed because it's already written into our policy, correct? And five is allegedly, <laughs> but it never gets done, apparently. So having it in there makes sense, I think. One, two, and five. That is the motion that I would like to call the question on. No other items. Items one, two, five, and the main motion to reject or uh, reject the appeal. Could, could I? Um, of course you can. I think for me, I would like to see um, some of this work through before voting on the final uh, outcome or the final motion. And one thought would be to um, have the applicant actively collaborate with the local school district and community stakeholders. And this could aim to ensure the safety and well-being of students and community as a whole. It's just being an active collaborating partner who has heard from our schools and a number of parents that this is going to be impactful. I, I don't know if that's a lot to ask. Personally, I think that's something that should be doable. No. <laughs> so, uh, Unless somebody asks you a question, that's how we do this. Are you well, finished? I am finished. Further debate or discussion? I mean, was that... I, mean, it's kind of I, I guess I'm, um, I'm, I'm st I, I'd like, I actually am at a point where I, I might want to just strip the friendly amendments and say, let's just hear it and just vote on um, what we've got because I am starting to feel like negotiating towards something that you, that some council members think is really critical um, is going to hold us up when we know that that kind of stuff, that happens. They, Bryce already engages with the community. Valerie has been the heart, uh, one of the beating hearts of this community. And so, again, when I said disrespectful, I, it just feels like there's this um, weight being put on them based on assumptions that others have made. If you share those assumptions, then push for them. But I want to just start fresh and say my motion, the staff recommendation stands and we can figure out the rest later yeah, and see if we sure have I the votes. I said. was hoping to get some consensus here. I, make I sure don't I think we're there. I want to make sure I understand what you just did. Uh, you are withdrawing your support in terms of accepting uh, all of the items except the reject the, the, uh, the appeal. S that is your motion. Everything else is now not acceptable okay. to you. So that'll be the motion. Anybody who wants to make, we can vote uh, on this. Le Let me stay with this. Okay, we can vote on this. Then any additional motions people want to make, they can make. Well, we're going to, now we have a motion to reject the appeal. Ms. Kalantar Johnson. Then I'd like it to be an amendment. State your amendment. My amendment would be, um, if we could put those conditions back up, please. Um, strike number four, please. Strike it, you said? Yes. Okay, and then um, for number three, um, we can simplify it to say the applicant shall collaborate with local school district and or community stakeholders. This collaboration aims to ensure the safety and well-being of students and the community as a whole. So simplify it to say that. I'll second the amendment. And we strike the marketing material, that language starting at marketing materials, is that correct? Strike all that. Strike all that, okay. Strike what part? Uh, <laughs> further down, the line that begins community as a whole, strike marketing materials and everything after that on number four, three. Thank you very much. Any other? Yeah, that's it. That's it? Okay, there's a motion and a second to add that to the motion to reject the appeal. Under discussion, Ms. Gondar Johnson, you have the floor. I, I think I've made my comments. I don't have anything else to add. Any member wish to make comments for the questions or comments? 
Clerk will call the roll. <clears throat> Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brenner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Goldberg? Adding the language. Yep. Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Are there additional motions on this item that members wish to make? Are there for, for the motions you wish to make? Mr. Newsom? Yes, I would. Uh, so I brought up, I would like to just add additional direction for staff to work on a uh, shoulder tap ordinance for uh, cannabis to outlaw the practice of adults uh, purchasing uh, cannabis for underage owners, same as we have for alcohol. I believe we had talked about that being separated. I didn't know if we had to vote on that or just give a direction. Slow down, slow down. I want to hear your motion. Do you, is it written down someplace? State your motion. Just, just your motion. Yes. So my motion is for staff to work, uh, or to work on creating a shoulder tap ordinance for cannabis, similar to the shoulder tap ordinance we have for um, alcohol sales, and to bring that back to council for council consideration at a future meeting. Is there a second? Second. The motion is second. Could I ask you, yes. would, would you be willing to refer the matter to the ad hoc committee because we're taking an entire package of issues and then we can bring that along with others? Yes. Is that agreeable to you? Yes. Is that agreeable? Yes. Okay. Understood? Instead so instead of, of bringing it back to council, it'll go to the, the committee. the matter to the ad hoc committee. Okay. okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Is there debate or discussion on this item? Ms. Oh, no, sorry, I have an additional direction, but I'll wait till we vote on, on this. We didn't vote on the motion, we voted on adding the language. Mm -hmm. So are we going to vote on the motion? I'm sorry. I, I, I just lost <coughs> track of what you're saying. We voted on adding the language, the friendly amendment. We didn't add a vote on the motion. We have to vote on the amended motion. You, you have to. The, the roll call. No, the, the motion was to amend the main motion, so now the main motion has been amended, and the council, uh, has to vote on it. the main motion is on the floor as amended, so right. it has to be voted upon. Yeah. Right. So I, was just to that first. I see where yeah. you're going. I see where you're going. On the motion in chief, which would reject and add the items, that's the motion we're voting on now. Clerk will call the roll. Can I just... So we haven't gotten to the additional direction. That is correct. Okay. Not there. Council members Newsom. Aye. Watkins. Thank you. Aye. Oh, Brown, sorry. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Um, Brunner. Aye. Helen Tari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Gore. No. Mayor Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Now there is a motion uh, by Mr. Newsom to direct uh, the ad hoc committee to take under consideration effectively a shoulder tapping ordinance similar to that which applies to alcohol as applied to uh, retail dispensaries and, and outlets, correct? Yes. Okay, that is the motion and the second. Is there debate or discussion on that item? Seeing, hearing none, the clerk. Who is the second on that? Um, Mike Mayor Golder. Golder. Okay, thank you. Motion second. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and sorted. Additional motions or directions? Ms. Colantari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Direction for um, Santa Cruz PD to work with prevention partners to develop a cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco prevention plan including prioritizing regular decoy sting operations to ensure businesses are operating legally and utilizing best practices for safeguarding access to youth. And if it makes more sense that this be part of our subcommittee work. Would you refer that? Yeah. Let's, so, let's do that. Let's start the motion for the subcommittee to consider. Good. And then the rest of what I said, do you, you, I think you have it. <laughs> oh, I, I emailed it to um, Motion for cannabis ad hoc subcommittee to consider um, directing SCPD to work with prevention partners to develop a cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco prevention plan, including 
prioritizing regular decoisting operations to ensure businesses are operating legally and utilizing best practices for safeguarding access to youth. I'll second that. There's a second. Can I add, if I Please. may, for a friendly amendment, potentially to also have the subcommittee, sorry, Bonnie, <laughs> I mean, I, I apologize, um, explore marketing, including uh, how we're targeting youth, um, encouraging underage c consumption in advertisements. <laughs> Targeting, encouraging. No, to oh. encourage it. Okay, how to the subcommittee to look at the marketing um, tactics within this motion and how they may encourage underage consumption or target target youth and encourage underage consumption. There's a motion. Second. We already have a second on that. We have a second. It was my motion with her friendly Your amendment, which is accepted. Favorite. Okay. For the debate or discussion on that item. Seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watson? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Miller? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Are there further motions on this item? Seeing hearing none, is there further business to come before the body? There is not. Is there further business to come before the body? A motion to adjourn would be in order, non-debatable. The vice mayor moves that we adjourn. <laughs> Mr. Newsom reluctantly seconds. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion aye. carries in so order. We stand adjourned. Very Thank you.